Sergeants, please start all the recordings. Good afternoon, once again, welcome to New York City Council Chambers. If you're here for the Committee on Education, jointly with Oversight and Investigations, you're in the right place. If you wanna testify, you can see the Sergeant at Arms, they're rolling around to pick up your slips now. Make sure that if you have any electronic devices, once again, please turn those off. If you have any questions, just get the attention of one of the Sergeant at Arms, and we'll answer your question to the best of our ability. Anybody that's on Zoom that would like to testify or send us testimony, you can do so at testimony. Dot, excuse me, testimony at council.nyc.gov. Again, that is testimony at council.nyc.gov. Madam Chair, we're ready to begin. Good afternoon and welcome to today's joint oversight hearing of the Education and Oversight and Investigation Committees on 2022-2023 Department of Education School Budget. I'm Rita Joseph, Chair of the Education Committee. Today we're having a hybrid hearing with council members and some witnesses in person while others will be testifying remotely via Zoom. We ask for your patience as we navigate this new environment. Before I turn to my opening statement, I would like to acknowledge Speaker Adams that's joining us today for the important hearing. I will turn to the speaker for her opening remarks. Thank you very much, Chair Joseph. And before I give my uh, remarks, I would just like to say, as I uh, just said at our press conference, in noting the news of the morning uh, and restating my statement a bit, that it is infuriating that the Supreme Court, made up of a majority of men, has made the outrageous decision to disregard decades of established law and our right to self-determination. This Supreme Court believes that guns have more rights than women to determine what is best for us and best for our bodies. This decision has an impact that will impact generations to come, and we promise to fight back using every lever of power within our control. And with that, I bid you all a good morning, good afternoon. Thank you, Chairs Joseph and Brewer, for holding this critically important hearing on the 2022 to 2023 Department of Education, or DOE, school budgets. The changes to school budgets being proposed for the next school year are varied and have raised concerns for this council, our constituents, parents, teachers, students, and entire school communities. There is an important distinction that is being blurred, and this distinction must be cleared up. The issue at hand is one of DOE decisions on school budgets, not one of the overall city budget. That distinction is critical because the fiscal year 2023 city budget actually invested over $700 million more in city funds for DOE than the previous budget, bringing total city funds spent on DOE to the highest level that our city's history has ever seen. Yet, some of our individual and local schools are facing budgets that are drastically different for the next school year. And let me be perfectly clear, that is a DOE determined decision. This hearing will seek to uncover why school budgets determined by DOE have changed in the particular way they have, where the federal funding used by the DOE is being spent, and the many questions that our stakeholders in our schools still have about the DOE's decisions. I want to thank the department for being here today to answer our questions, questions from these committees. I also welcome, I don't see our controller, but he may be coming in today. I welcome also our IBO and the countless parents, students, advocates, and other community leaders who are here today to speak on this topic and offer their insights and perspectives in person and virtually. Every person here today is likely aware of how the pandemic widened pre-existing opportunity and achievement gaps, hitting historically disadvantaged students hardest. A research report from last summer on the lingering effects of what it called quote unquote unfinished learning found that at the end of the 2020 to 2021 school year, Quote, students in majority black schools ended the year with six months of unfinished learning and students in low-income schools ended the year with seven months 
based on math proficiency. High school students became more likely to drop out of school, and high school seniors, especially those from low-income families, were less likely to go on to post-secondary education." Unquote. This does not even account for multilingual learners, students in temporary housing, and students with disabilities. Our focus must be on equity, ensuring schools and students who have historically been underserved are prioritized. Now, I do not deny the Herculean effort the New York City DOE undertook when COVID-19 first confronted us. In fact, I do applaud this work, from having to immediately pivot to an all-remote learning environment to making more than 900,000 devices available to students and providing meals to anyone who needed them, one through grab-and-go, prioritizing social-emotional supports to students, and so much more. The DOE tried, and in many aspects, did right by our students. Mistakes were, of course, made during an unprecedented situation, but more importantly, lessons were learned and courses corrected. We came together as a city to ensure our public school students would have what they needed to succeed academically in these trying times. Our schools and our students still need our support because we know that the situation facing many of our schools, even before the pandemic, was not adequate or ideal. Yet for our schools to now have the proverbial rug pulled out from under them by DOE decisions to change school budgets as we seek to emerge from this pandemic into a new normal would be the wrong approach. The drastic nature of these DOE decisions for the approaching school year endangers the success of our schools and students how can we address learning loss and the academic needs of students resulting from the pandemic if teachers and other school-based staff they've come to rely on and trust are no longer there? How can we tell students, parents, and local school staff with a straight face that things will be okay? School leaders need more time to plan and recover, and students should not bear the brunt of decisions by DOE that are too hasty and wed to inadequate policies of past administrations. We're under no illusion that enrollment is down and has been trending downward for some time. We're also aware that the massive infusion of federal stimulus funding for DOE was not a permanent funding stream. It's declining, and we will eventually no longer and it will eventually no longer be available for our city's education system. We face that fact. This federal stimulus has allowed DOE to hold school budgets harmless despite enrollment declines. We cannot afford to ignore these realities. We also need to better understand how federal stimulus funds are being spent. It's important for this information to be provided not only to the city council and other city government officials, but also to the broader public. The central issues at hand are the decisions and formulas that DOE are using to determine school budgets. Major questions were raised about the DOE's funding formula, even before the forthcoming school year's budgets were an issue. For several years, the council and other stakeholders have been contributors to efforts with the department aimed at resolving gaps in its school budget formula, but the DOE has failed to fulfill commitments and take action. This administration is unnecessarily continuing with and shouldering the inaction of its predecessors on this issue, leaving policies in place that leave students underserved. Now that federal funding is diminishing, there is an opportunity to address the issues it leaves behind in both the short and long term. The Council remains committed. We remain committed to these efforts and to partnering with our schools and communities to address these issues with the Department. We must provide transparency about every federal dollar received by this city and enroll our communities in helping us solve the challenges for our schools and students. We need Mayor Adams' administration and the Department of Education to come earnestly to the table so our city's leaders are all working together to fulfill our promise to the students and families that rely on our school system. We will not stop advocating for solutions and collaboration to achieve it. We all need to be forthcoming and clear-eyed about the challenges so we can unite and commit towards closing gaps for our students who are relying on our leadership. 
We will not stop using the full weight of this legislative body to fight for solutions, stand up for our schools and students, and compel collaborative action towards solutions. This is what our city needs and what our children deserve. I would like to thank everyone, everyone, for their efforts in organizing this hearing today, and I will now turn things back into the hands of Chair Joseph. Thank you, Madam Speaker. We're here today to examine the impact of DOE's 2022 to 2023 school budget. We're also here to call on Chancellor Banks and Mayor Adams to address the DOE's decision on its school budgets for the upcoming school year. That will impact many schools when they reopen in September. It's important to note here that the fiscal 2023 budget and council adopted includes over $700 million more in city funds for schools compared to the current fiscal year. New York City is also receiving an increase in state foundation aid for the schools in 2023. Despite these increases, the DOE school budgets are still reducing fundings to schools in the new school year. For the past two years, New York City public school students have suffered tremendous harm as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic. Remote instruction led to serious learning loss for students in New York City, as well as across the country, especially among vulnerable student populations. In fact, the pandemic has exacerbated inequities and widened already existing achievement gaps, hitting disadvantaged students hardest, including low-income students of color, English language learners, students in temporary housing, and students with disabilities. Beyond the academic impact, the pandemic has also taken a huge toll on students' mental health due to the loss of family members to COVID-19, or loss of jobs, and economic insecurity. The pandemic also negatively, negatively affected students' social-emotional development through long months of isolation from friends and classmates. From the outset of, pandemic, of the pandemic, New York City had a large rate of COVID, tra COVID transmission and was considered the epicenter of the pandemic. It should not be surprising that, that many families left New York City at the height of the pandemic or enrolled their children in charter schools, private schools, or homeschooling, and consequently, enrollment in New York City public schools have declined. However, Enrollments declines are not distributed evenly across the system, with some schools experiencing large decreases while others lost only a small number. And some schools actually gain students. The federal government allocated stimulus funds to states and school districts across the country to address pandemic-related issues such as learning loss, mental health, and social-emotional impacts on students and education budget shortfalls. Last year, the DOE used some of the federal stimulus funds to hold schools' budget harmless for enrollment decline, declines. However, this year, the administration is deciding to return to school budget formula that's now less federal stimulus funding available. Federal stimulus funds will completely dry up in two years, and much of it seems to be allocated towards core DOE programs. But we need to prioritize our schools and better understand the use of federal dollars with public transparency. This is not the time for DOE to change school budget in a way that drastically impacts our schools, especially when students are still suffering from serious learning loss and mental health impacts from the pandemic and need all of our supports they can get to help with the recovery. Reducing the negative, impact, negative impacts on students should be our priority. If previous administration failed to use this federal stimulus funding to protect our students, we all need to understand the reality and find solutions to help our schools. Schools with the largest enrollment declines would see school budget reductions in hundreds and thousands or millions of dollars, despite the city devoting more city funds towards education than ever before. This could result in the loss of many teachers as well as vital supports and programs. Allowing reduction in school budget this year will invest in a result harmful impacts for our students. We have begun to learn about the devastating impact of the DOE's decision on individual schools. In my school district alone, as 15 to 23 schools are facing lower school budgets, losing an average of $578,000 each, or 14% of their budget. We expect to hear much more about the impact of these DOE decisions from the educators, parents, advocates joining us today. We believe the lower school budget at the time, especially for schools serving historically underserved students, are unacceptable. By working together, we can completely avoid unnecessary DOE initiative 
school budget reduction, especially when the chancellor has acknowledged that the fair, fair student funding formula needs to change and has vowed to do so. The DOE formula is the problem, not the overall education budget. Why not amend the, the FSF formula and avoid this problematic outcome for our students to reduce the harmful impact on our schools? This administration has indicated it wants to prioritize students' success, particularly students of color, while creating true partnerships with families. We can only achieve this if DOE decides to abandon this formula and poorly served our school before the pandemic. There's no reason to take a big step backward based on a formula of previous administration. We urge the mayor and the chancellor to listen to students, parents, educators, and advocates, and hold off of any budget reduction for the upcoming school year. At today's hearing, the committee hopes to learn more from the DOE about the expected impact and its changes to school budgets. We seek to understand this administration's effort to provide schools with resources needed to maintain support and services for students, which its formula-driven school budget creates. We'd also like to hear details about how this administration is planning on using remaining federal stimulus funds for schools. We also expect to hear about the impact of proposed cuts on schools from educators, parents, advocates, and other stakeholders. I wanna thank everyone who's testifying today and I wanna thank the city council staff for all they put into today's hearing. Malcolm Butehorn, Masi Sarkin, Jan Atwell, Frank Perez. I also thank my staff, Sam Weinberg and Connor Irving. I'd like to remind everyone who wished to testify in person today that you fill out a witness slip which is located at the desk of the sergeant arm near the entrance of the room to allow as many people as possible to testify. Testimony will be limited to two minutes per person, whether you're testifying on Zoom or in person. I'm also going to ask my colleagues to leave their questions and comments to five minutes. I would like to now turn to my colleagues, Gail Brewer, Chairperson of Oversight and Investigation Committee, for her opening remark. I would like to acknowledge my colleagues who have joined us, joined us this afternoon. Thank you very much. I am Gail Brewer, Chair of the Committee on Oversight and Investigations, and I certainly, certainly thank Council Member Rita Joseph, Chair of our Education Committee, for all of her hard work in putting together this really important hearing, and I want to thank our speaker, Adrienne Adams, for her strong leadership today. Today, the, these two committees will be reviewing the Department of Education's adopted budget for fiscal year 2023, and how DOE is determining school budgets. I've been a public servant for a very long time, and I have fought to ensure that New York City's public schools have the resources they need to serve our students effectively. We've advocated for more school social workers, we fought for healthy food options in our school cafeterias, and I've tried to always make the needs of students a top priority. I look forward to continuing those efforts today but we need to work to ensure that critical gaps in education funding are addressed before school opens in September. Our public schools each have individual budgets that are funded by DOE through a combination of city, state, federal, and other sources. As Chair Joseph already noted, in FY23, the amount of city funds allocated to DOE, thanks to the speaker and my colleagues, was $700 million greater than the amount allocated in the previous fiscal year. Nevertheless, the Department of Education has indicated that due to federal funding losses, declines in enrollment, and we don't really have the numbers on declines, to be honest with you, from DOE, and DOE determined formulas, school budgets are facing drastic changes and a net reduction of roughly 215 million for fiscal year 2023 as compared to the previous school year. Some schools are receiving more money in their budgets while some have received significant declines from DOE. And I just wanna say this morning I was at a graduation, we're all at graduations. I did three this morning. And the principal says she has a 27% cut, and the information says zero. There's something wrong with that. We do not have the data from DOE. Like so many others, I am deeply concerned about how this will impact individual schools in our city. As we all know, now is not the time to be cutting back on support for our schools. I've heard from many, many, many parents, students, 
teachers, and principals across the city, not just from my district, about the difficulties our students have faced over the past two years and about the increased needs they face in light of the pandemic. Today, the committees will work to understand the specific impacts of DOE's decisions on budgets for individual schools in the upcoming year. More importantly, we will examine how resources can be redeployed to help fill the devastating gaps in school budgets before the school year begins. Trust me, we are not going to leave any stone unturned. The committees will be examining how the $7.7 billion, as Randy Weingarten pointed out earlier at the press conference, in federal stimulus funding allocated to the Department of Education is spent, and how these funds or others may be reallocated to help address the most urgent needs of individual schools. We will be examining how state funding including funds provided in connection with the Campaign for Fiscal Equity lawsuit, thank you, Robert Jackson, <laughs> will impact DOE's need for federal and other funds going forward. We'll be looking to Chancellor Banks and Mayor Adams to help us identify opportunities for DOE to shift money from beloaded areas of its central operation, 52 Chamber Street, and to clarify how much needed changes to the fair student funding formula can be achieved on the time scale that is necessary to support our students. I just want to say one principle. I don't dare give any names or any schools, but generally, lots of principals have the same situation. Four teachers, she's told, might be more to be, re, to be moved. She have to make, she'd have to make classes larger. She's supposed to balance her budget before the end of the school year, yet the Department of Edu Education did not tell her how many teachers she needs per class. She did, however, have to name the teachers she would have to excess. And parents, of course, are calling all of us as a result. Her teachers in this particular school have been around 9 to 11 years, and she has had to excess some of them. It is also unclear to her, and this principal is a very intelligent person, if, if the base of fair student funding is lower. She doesn't know. Her enrollment is up from October 21. So this is terrible, and it encourages New Yorkers to send their children to other schools or to move, and this particular principal as this wonderful Chair Joseph has indicated, doesn't understand if central funds pay excess teachers, why in the world can it pay at her school? So with that, I'd like to thank members of the central staff who helped prepare this meeting, Jen Atwell, Michael Buttonhorn, Macy's Sarkissian, Frank Perez, C.J. Murray, and from the office, from the investigations and oversight, Aaron Mendelson and Juanita John, and I certainly want to thank Leo Bolero and Schuler Puder from my staff. You can see we're pretty angry. I now turn it over to the great Chair Joseph. Thank you, Council Member Brewer. I'd like now to acknowledge the Council Members that are here. Council Member Hanif, Council Member Ressler, Council Member De La Rosa, Council Member Gutierrez, of course, Speaker Adams, Council Member Brewer, Dinowitz, Council Member Lewis, Council Member Powers, Brooke, Council Member Ung, Council Member Aviles, Council Member Hanks, Council Member Velasquez, Council Member Shulman, Council Member Menon, Council Member Dinowitz, Council Member Juan, Council Member Lee, Council Member Krishna, Council Member Williams, Hudson, Ayala, and Majority, Majority Leader Keith Powers. Oh, and also um, Council Member Abreu, Sanchez, and Caban. I'd like to call on the first two witnesses from the admin, Dan Weisberg and Lindsay Oates. Yes. Um, I'll now be, uh, my name is Jan Atwell, I'm policy analyst with the committee and I will now administer the oath. I will call on each of you individually for a response and please raise your right hands. Do you affirm to tell the truth, 
the whole truth and nothing but the truth before these committees and to respond honestly to council member questions. Deputy Chancellor Weisberg. I do. Lindsay Oates. I do. Thank you. Thank you. You may start. You may begin. Thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, Speaker Adams, Chair Joseph, Chair Brewer, all the members of the Education Oversight and Investigations Committee here today. My name is Dan Weisberg. I'm the first Deputy Chancellor at the New York City Department of Education. I'm also the proud product of the New York City Public Schools, the son of a mom and dad who came through the New York City Public Schools, and the proud father of two sons who came through the New York City Public Schools. I'm joined by our outstanding Chief Financial Officer, Lindsay Oates, and I really do thank you, uh, Chair Joseph, and everybody for the opportunity to discuss this important issue of school budgets for the New York City Public Schools. The budget the City Council approved last week continues last year's historic achievement of providing every school in our system with 100% fair student funding for the first time in the history of the New York City Public Schools. For this school year, that means an increased investment of over $600 million, as several of you have already noted, directly to, excuse me, to the schools. City fund and spending on schools in, F in fiscal year 2023 adopted budget will be the highest it's ever been at $20.2 billion, compared to $18.9 billion in the current year. As you know, New York State is in year two of a three-year payment plan to comply with the campaign for fiscal equity decision. We are grateful for the increased foundation aid from Albany, and each increase we have received thus far has gone directly to school budgets to fund every school at 100% of the FSF fair student funding formula. The state's foundation aid formula, the city's FSS, FSF formula, and federal Title I funding are all based on student enrollment. The state allocates foundation aid to us based on our total enrollment, and in turn, we allocate funding to schools based on their enrollment. As the chancellor has made clear repeatedly from day one, 120,000 families have fled the system over the past five years. So it is not good, but it's also not surprising that many schools, though certainly not all, have seen a drop in enrollment. For the last two years, the previous administration used temporary federal stimulus funding to hold schools harmless for enrollment decreases. As everybody here today knows, that funding is going away over the next two years, and it'll be completely gone by fiscal year 2025. As a result, we are using $160 million in temporary stimulus funding to hold schools partially harmless for enrollment declines so they don't see steep budget declines all in one year. Of course, schools that have seen precipitous enrollment declines are facing some really tough decisions, as schools in that situation always have, including pre-pandemic. So these are the facts. Federal stimulus funding has provided our schools and our city as a whole with much needed resources during a tumultuous time, but we cannot rely on that funding source forever. That funding source is rapidly going, diminishing and going away. The DOE has used and plans to use stimulus funding for a variety of important school and student purposes, including the aforementioned cushion of $160 million for school enrollment drops, but also expanded and extensive summer rising program starting in less than a couple of weeks, increasing early childhood programming, and our planned community schools expansion, among many other critical investments. We are expected to spend over $3 billion in stimulus funding by the end of this fiscal year, which is rapidly approaching. Well over $2 billion of this funding has already been spent this year, including $800 million in the last three months alone. We, expend, we expect spending of the stimulus funds to continue apace this coming year, including significant payments for goods and services that were received in fiscal year 2022, but not invoiced or paid until fiscal year 2023. Those include goods and services that are part of the programs I mentioned, and my colleague Lindsay Oates will go over this in much more detail shortly, and we wanna get you whatever information you need uh, so we are completely transparent. It's never easy to manage decreases in school funding. This is not a good thing. Nobody here is gonna claim that decreases in school funding for enrollment are a positive thing. But the mayor and the chancellor have taken a hard look at our financial picture 
for the coming years and chart a path that avoids major disruption for schools, students, and families to the greatest extent possible. That plan was reflected in the mayor's preliminary and executive budgets, and after negotiations with the city council was adopted by the council last week. Now that the budget has been adopted, any discussion about targeting more resources towards school budgets would mean pulling those resources from elsewhere in the approved DOE budget. It's important to remember that schools across the city right now are making plans based on their budgets for the coming year. As I mentioned, we know we are talking to them every day that some schools are making tough decisions. We also have some schools that have seen enrollment increases. They're looking now to hire teachers and other staff to meet that elevated need. Because of stimulus funding, we also have schools that are preparing for their summer rising programming, others that are planning for their transition to become a community school, and new early childhood uh, programming that is coming online. In addition, stimulus funding is playing, paying for nurses, for social workers, and other support staff whose schools have made part of their communities, as well as new PSAL teams that schools are planning for the next year. Any decision to change the way we are using or planning to use stimulus funding will impact at least some of those investments, some of that critical programming that is filling critical needs that are already allocated. So let me be clear. Every dollar of stimulus funding has been allocated to critical programs. Using additional stimulus funding to hold schools harmless completely for enrollment dec declines is a bad idea for two reasons. I understand it, but it's a bad idea. First, it would mean cutting funding at the last minute from programs like Summer Rising and community schools. Second, it would mean that schools would face a much bigger funding drop next year, leaving them in a much, much worse position. This administration is committed to transforming students' experiences and putting, them, putting each of them on a path to long-term economic security as part of Chancellor Banks and Mayor Adams' vision. Many of the initiatives you voted for in this budget are essential to that new vision. Those include reimagining how we teach kids so they all become strong readers, increasing support to families that speak different languages other than English, deepening investments in the mental health of our young people, and expanding student pathways and bilingual programs, all critical needs. Exciting our students and families about the learning experience through those kinds of investments is how we will reverse past enrollment losses. I thank you for your time and now turn it over to Lindsay Oates who will provide you with an overview of DO's budget, DOE's budget and school budgeting process. We'll then be happy to answer any questions that you have. Thank you, you may begin. Thank you, Chair. And if I may, on a personal note, Speaker Adams, thank you for your statement about the news this morning. Um, okay, hopefully everyone can see the presentation on, uh, or has a copy in front of them. I wanted to take this, we wanted to take this opportunity to talk through some basics about our budget and our school budgeting process. So as um, the chair and speaker, the chairs and speaker have pointed out, um, the Department of Education's budget for fiscal year 23, which starts in July 1st, is 37.6 billion. And you can see how that breaks out here between city, state, and federal funding predominantly funding from city, but a growing share from state and federal funds. In the fiscal year 23 budget, approximately 1.8 billion um, of the 3.9 billion in federal revenue is stimulus funding. Next slide, please. The DOE's $37.6 billion budget goes to the following places. And I like this table, it helps to, I think, illustrate how the Department of Education's budget um, is broken up by sort of general topics. And again, this is all funding. So you can see that the orange portion of this pie chart shows our school budgets. 46% um, or $17.3 billion goes directly to school budgets for principals and their school leadership teams and communities to make decisions about how best to serve their communities. And then going clockwise around, you see that a significant portion, this green um, triangle, is fringe pension and debt service. That goes to support our staff, our teachers, as well as um, their health insurance and their pensions, as well as debt service on our school buildings. You can see that the smallest portion of our budget, 2%, $600 million represents our central and what we call central administrative budgets. 
I want to flag that the central and administrative budgets include our field offices, our superintendents, and positions like CSEs. So this is including people like our uh, budget directors who are in the field, many of our unsung heroes who are doing the work right now with our school principals making decisions about their budgets. Um, charter schools, three billion. Non-public schools and other types of contract schools, two billion. School support, which includes things like um, other important things we need to run our school system, transportation, food, facilities, safety, and utilities. Can't run a school system without that is 4.3 billion. Next slide. Thank you. This year, as uh, you and others have pointed out, additional city and state funding is offset by a decreasing federal support. I think this is important to remember that the federal funding, as we've all discussed, is temporary and is phasing out of our budget. This was strategically front-loaded for a variety of reasons, and you can see that along with city funds growing, so is state funding, and we are grateful for that investment from the state. Next slide, please. As a result of these increases in federal funding, state funding, and city funding, our per pupil spending, this is total spending on our pupils, has increased by more than 20% since pre-pandemic levels. We are now around 31,000 per student, compared to 25,000 per student in fiscal year 19. Next slide, thank you. There's been a much discussion about DOE stimulus budget, and I really want to take a minute to discuss this issue. Um, you can see that in the $1.8 billion that is currently in the FY23 budget, that it is planned to be spent on these important activities. 3K expansion. This is expanding programs in our communities, within our school buildings, and with our community-based organizers, our community-based organizations, excuse me, to provide seats for all three-year-olds across our system. Summer rising. Free summer programming for our students this summer, 110,000 um, K-8 to students. Um, I'm a parent, I think many of you are, you know the value of free <laughs> summer programming. Um, other school supports, academic recovery services, um, special ed recovery services, mental health programming, social workers, guidance counselors. Other mayor and chancellor priorities, which I will go into in more detail on the next slide. Devices for our students and other IT supports to make sure that we can continue to support a modern learning environment in our schools. Academic services, including our Mosaic curriculum program, special ed pre-K contract enhancements, our arts programming, computer science for all, and continuing to invest in the learning to work program. School reopening costs. This is the cost to maintain a safe environment for our students. This is the cost of PPE, updates in ventilation, and continuing investments in things like air purifiers and the filters we need to be replaced. These are investments, by the way, that schools do not have to pay for. We are paying for them, and we have always paid for them centrally to not have to burden schools with those types of decisions. In addition, we've invested funding in expanding our public school athletic league to ensure that more students than ever have access to athletic programming after school and on the weekends. Next slide, please. So more on the important announcement that were made in the executive budget uh, that Mayor Adams and Chancellor Banks announced their priorities for our stimulus funding. And again, these are all investments that are in the FY23 budget this coming year. So in addition to the summer rising program that we've talked about, $49 million will be invested to continue to ensure that all schools have a nurse. Um, $33 million to expand career pathways programming. This is funding that will go to schools to ensure um, access to CTE programs, apprenticeship programs, really important, exciting work that the Chancellor has made a North Star of his administration. $11 million to expand bilingual education classrooms and supports. $11 million to continue to expand parent engagement to make sure that we can um, hire people from underserved communities and engage with those communities as well. Continuing to invest in translation and interpretation services. $10 million to support things like the announcement made yesterday for virtual schools. $10 million, or excuse me, $9 million for um, CBO provided violence interruption programming at high need schools. $7 million for literacy and dyslexia programming and $2 million for our gifted and talented program. 
So I want to take a minute to pivot now to talk about the school budgeting process. So this really starts long before the school year begins. Um, in January, um, and in January through March, we really start the enrollment process. Our Office of Student Enrollment begins sharing initial enrollment projections with schools. This is a collaborative process, and it has been as long as I've been at the department. Principals and our central and field offices work together to look at those enrollment projections, and principals have an opportunity and a right to review and appeal those decisions during these months. And ultimately, a final projection is determined, usually in April, and it is those numbers that is used by my team to build out the fair student funding formula um, and the upcoming budgets for the, the school year. In late spring, and this year a little bit later than we would have liked, on June 5th, we released budgets to schools. Um, this includes the fair student funding formula allocation, but it is not limited to the fair student funding allocation. There were something like 44 other allocations that were made to schools a few weeks ago. What is happening right now in the month of June is that principals are working with their school leadership teams and their communities to make decisions about how to use those funds to support their schools in the fall. Throughout the summer, additional funding will be allocated to schools that have a demonstrated financial need. Final budgets are adjusted in the fall based on actual enrollment, and the process with individual school budgets um, changing annually with enrollment shifts has been followed for many years. I really want to emphasize the point that what we rolled out a few weeks ago is an initial budget allocation. Budgets will increase from here. There are additional allocations that will go out. Principals have a right to ask for additional funding. We will review those requests, and that will be a process that will kick off in the next few weeks. Next slide, please. Thank you. The Fair Student Funding Formula is the primary funding source for most community district schools. Each Fair Student Funding allocation is calculated based on the number of students enrolled at each school and the specific needs of those students. And again, I want to emphasize, as First Deputy Chancellor um, Weisberg mentioned, that many of our funding sources at the faith, state and federal level also are based on the number of students we have. This budgeting method is called a weighted per pupil funding model. Um, pupil needs are weighted based on the cost of meeting the educational need. Weights include special ed, English language learner, academic intervention services, and so on. School budgets, therefore, have changed and will continue to change based on the number of students enrolled and their needs under the formula. This goes both ways. Schools receive both increases and decreases depending on their needs, and in FY23, approximately 400 schools are receiving additional fair student funding due to enrollment increases. In the last two school years, we have been able to use stimulus funding to hold schools harmless for enrollment declines at an 100% level. But as we've all discussed today and will continue to discuss, unfortunately, the federal funding is not permanent. And we need to be strategic about um, and financially responsible around phasing out the use of the federal stimulus funding. And that's what this budget includes. So stimulus funding will support a hold harmless that is phasing out of the commitment of the last two years. Next slide, please. I like this slide. I want to emphasize that fair student funding pays for the K-12 classroom staff. That includes school leadership, principals, APs, deans, you can read the list. I want to make sure I emphasize the point that fair student funding, while it represents around two-thirds of an average school budget, it is not the only money that goes to schools. There is a lot of other funding that goes for specific purposes, um, and some of those are listed here mandated IEP-related services, IEP paraprofessionals, speech teachers, OTs, one-to-one -one paraprofessionals. Those are all funded based on the mandated needs of students in that building every year, and those are in addition to the fair student funding formula budgets. Pre-K and 3K programs are funded separately, and there are other programs that are allocated separately. And charter schools and District 75 schools do not receive the fair student funding formula. Title I is another example of funding that's in addition to the fair student funding allocation. Last slide. As we've discussed and as the Chancellor and the Mayor have mentioned, the Department of Education and the city is committed to improving the fair student funding formula in the future. Data shows that FSF budget allocations direct additional funding to schools with concentrations of underserved students. However, we know that FSF can be improved. With all schools now finally at 100% FSF, 
DOE, and again, thank you, Senator Jackson, DOE has committed to convening a working group of parents and advocates to examine the fair student funding formula and recommend improvements and steps to organize this working group have begun. Thank you for your patience through this presentation. We are happy to take any questions. Thank you so much. I'm going to pass it on to the speaker for her questions. Thank you very much, Chair Joseph, and thank you once again for your testimony this morning. I, I just have a couple of questions because there are a lot of colleagues here today, um, along with uh, both of our co-chairs uh, this morning, that do want to indulge. Uh, my first question is, uh, was the DOE intimately aware of the impact that would be done to our schools as a result of these budget cuts? Well, you know, those are conversations. Thank you, thank you very much, Madam Speaker. And, and again, thank you for inviting us here today. Um, those are conversations, as Lindsay says, are happening right now. So uh, I want to say a couple of things. So yes, you know, our budget people, our superintendents, our, and our folks at Central, including me, are talking to principals, talking to parents <clears throat> and uh, CBOs about school budgets right now. So as I said in my testimony, I know, I know these are difficult decisions. Uh, so yes, we are definitely aware of what, what is happening out in the field. Uh, we visit schools, although last day of school is, is uh, of course, Monday, but we visit schools all the time. Uh, I make sure my staff is visiting schools all the time. So, so we're aware. I, wanna, I do want to emphasize one point that Lindsay made. Um, the, the dust has not totally settled yet. So uh, where there are really urgent needs, uh, for example, um, it, you know, it turns out that there are more students who have mandated services and that can't be paid for out of the budget. This is something that Lindsay and her office will work on to, to make sure that the school has those resources. There may be other changes that, that occur over the course of the summer that are occurring right now. This is a normal process. So I would just say, yes, we're aware that a lot of schools are going through difficult decision-making processes, but I would also just predict that some of those issues are going to be resolved in the normal process. I appreciate the answer, um, First Deputy Chancellor. I think I was trying to get to um, the question was, were you aware prior to the situation happening? It sounds like you're learning as you're going. As far as the teachers are concerned, as far as your immediate situation, to me, your, your response sounds like you're learning along with the rest of us, along with the teachers, um, of what the situation is instead of proactively looking to engage them prior to them getting the information and now having to deal with this at their front door. So there's a, there's a very distinct di a difference there, and, and, and I was looking for, uh, yes, we were aware, this is what we were done to kind of um, prohibit this from happening. So, and, and, and the answer explains that the, the pre-work, it doesn't sound like the pre-work was there because now it sounds like in a lot of cases, my district included, that these are total surprises to my educators and my principals. Uh, in the schools. So uh, as you said, we, we still have ongoing work to do with this, but as of right now, how many teachers will need to be accessed in the upcoming school year? Do you have that number? I don't have that specific number. Uh, I will say that we watch that number very carefully. It's still under what it was two years ago. So we are not seeing unusual amounts of accessing of teachers and those letters as per the UFT contract notifying teachers of uh, accessing situations had to go out June 15th. So uh, at this point, citywide, we are not seeing unusual numbers of, of excess teachers. And if I could just say, uh, uh, Madam Speaker, I didn't mean to say that we were you know, caught unawares. We didn't know, we, we certainly knew that with the step down amounts of hold harmless, that schools were gonna be in difficult situations. And so we, we are prepared uh, and we do have staff and resources prepared to try to mitigate the impacts as much as possible. I would just say every year, school budget, there are issues with individual school budgets. There are more issues this year. Certainly I would say that because of the enrollment declines, because of the, the stimulus being dissipated. But this is a back and forth that goes on every year. And it goes on, I will say, into the fall because none of us has a complete crystal ball to say what is, what is enrollment actually going to be in September and even going into October. So we continue to adjust budgets. And look, uh, one thing we could probably all agree on, uh, if the enrollment is much better 
than expected right now and projected right now, uh, OMB has committed that they will provide the funding for those additional students. Let's hope that that happens. Let's continue to work together to make sure that happens. And if I, may, may, yes. I, may I add, thank you. Absolutely. Um, um, I think as we all know, this was uh, action that was announced in February in the mayor's preliminary budget. I believe days after uh, this was announced, uh, I believe Deputy Chancellor Weisberg actually sent a communication to principals indicating that this was an action that the mayor had announced. In addition, um, Deputy Chancellor Blackburn and I uh, gave a presentation to over a thousand principals on the Friday before Memorial Day, reiterating that the hold harmlesses that had been in place for the last two years were going to start to be phased out. Um, and so I want to just iterate that we had been um, speaking to principals. It was important to us to let them know in February that this was something that was coming. The, and to reiterate that again um, before school budgets were released. Okay, thank you very much. I'm going to go back just like I did for the first question. The, the, the question was how many teachers would need to be accessed in the upcoming school year. So um, I, I'm going to let you know that my colleagues are going to give you numbers of their of teachers um, that they have gotten the numbers that they have gotten so far from principals that have actively been engaging us um, over the past couple of weeks they're going to give you numbers so um, if, if you don't know how many teachers will need to be accessed my, I guarantee you that my colleagues are going to have some numbers for you today um, I, I also want to get into before I hand it over uh, back to the chair we have a very very large uh, vulnerable population of students who are in shelter right now, um, temporary housing right now. What was the pre-work that was done to protect those children knowing what was coming down the pipeline with these decisions? Uh, thank you, Speaker, for that question. So the FY23 adopted budget does not make any changes to the additional supports that we provide to students in temporary housing. We spend over $100 million um, on students in temporary housing. Um, and we plan to spend more in fiscal year 23 as a result of additional grants that we're receiving from the federal and state government. I believe as well, um, Speaker, that you and, your, you and your colleagues included additional funding in the adopted budget to expand the STH Community Coordinator Program. We are grateful for that. And that program will continue to be expanded with um, the funding that you included in the adopted budget. So thank you for that, as well as the investments that the team has already made. Okay, that's good to hear. I'll ask one more I'll, along the same lines. As far as our student populations are concerned, our uh, population of immigrant students or in English language learners, uh, and how will this budget address those students' needs? How were they accounted for? So English language learners are, um, we are expanding, as I think I mentioned in my slideshow presentation, we're expanding bilingual programs for English language learners, and we are investing um, additional funding also to um, continue to build out our translation and interpretation teams for parents and families. Um, and we are excited under Deputy Chancellor Quintana's leadership team to really look at further opportunities for those um, students. Okay. I was remiss. I said that was going to be the last question for me, but I'm going to ask the one burning question that's been asked of us over the past week or so. What is preventing the DOE of restoring those cuts today? The, um, uh, you know, I think, you know, if we, it, if we went back to the slides, uh, what would be required to put additional money into the hold harmless would be to take money away from those stimulus funded um, programming that we that Lindsay talked about whether it's summer rising whether it's nurses in schools whether it's social workers uh, that's that's what's in our budget and so we would need to divert that money and um, that's that's not something that I think would ultimately be in the best interest of schools and, and families okay thank you very much and uh, I'm going to turn it back over to uh, chair Joseph and my colleagues for further questions thank you Thank you, Speaker. Um, one of the questions I had for you was, what programs or categories of funding are exempt from being cut? What, are you, what is exempt from being cut in this? So um, thank you, Chair Joseph. I, I think that in general, um, you know, as we, 
Often in my time as the CFO, we've had to make hard choices about our budget, um, particularly during the pandemic. I think we all know the fiscal crises that we faced. Um, it is absolutely critical that we maintain legally mandated services for our students, for special ed students, for English language learners. It's important that we continue to invest in students in temporary housing and other specialized populations. Those are not optional. Um, and we continue to maintain uh, investments in those legally mandated services. Um, we always prioritize looking at our central budgets. Um, the FY23 adopted budget includes a 15% reduction to central administrative budgets at DOE, including the elimination of 280 positions. Um, we know that, for example, the, the council funded a lot of the student co um, STH coordinators. Um, I know in the federal stimulus, there was funds designated just to support the student in um, temporary housing. How is that being used? Can you please break it down? Yeah, so we are continuing to invest in expanding the community coordinator program. There were two pots of funding. I think there was a $30 million grant and then another $20 million, I believe. Don't quote me on those numbers. The $30 million, I think, is going to mostly invest in expanding our community coordinator community coordinator STH program, um, and other investments in um, our, our students in temporary housing. We've been talking about FSF. That's one of the reasons why this budget cut is happening. What are you doing as the administration to make sure that the enrollment doesn't decline any further? Yeah, I mean, th this uh, starts with one of the pillars in Chancellor Banks' Uh, vision, which is around engaging our families uh, very intensively and authentically. So, um, you know, happy to talk more about our plans, but, you know, what we, to put it simply, Chair Joseph, what we need to do is get very good at listening to families and their needs and students and their needs and make sure we're providing programming in schools that meet those at every level birth to all the way through 12th grade. And so what you will see over the coming year and years um, is programming that is opening up, uh, programming that is expanded uh, under Chancellor Bank's scale sustain and restore pillar uh, that is directly based on what we are hearing on the ground from students, from parents, from families, from community organizations and community leaders. If we do that, and we have begun to do that with some of the program we, programming we uh, have put out there, for example, around uh, uh, serving our, our dyslexic students, uh, gifted and talented expansion, then I think we are gonna win back uh, the trust and ultimately we're gonna win back the students. But the families are screaming and yelling right now. Are you listening to them? We, we are listening to them, including till very, very late last night. And uh, you know, again, what I would say, Chair, um, um, uh, what, what I would say is that uh, you know, we, we're, we're not claiming that this is a good thing. That's that some schools are seeing their their enrollment decline and their budgets decline. We're not saying that's a good thing. We're just dealing with the reality and how do we take um, the the funds that we have and use them in the best possible way to serve as many kids focusing on chronically underserved kids as, as we can. So uh, we hear them, we are talking to them. Uh, we will be able to, again, mitigate and cushion some of what they're seeing right now, but we just don't have the ability to uh, avoid reality. Thank you for saying that. Um, some of the, how does this administration, they, we, we talk about um, we want to make sure this is the pu best public school system in the, in the country, and this is the largest, and I've taught in it for 22 years. But I'm, we're, st we're still having the same conversations when I was an educator, class size. Um, funding inequitable for the school systems. How do you change that to make sure parents want to come back? You have to offer the best, a world-class public education, despite where the school is, where they're located, and who's coming into that building to make sure that they wanna come back. So we're not, I'm not seeing ch other schools, they promote themselves. I don't see the NY, and I don't see DOE doing that in order to bring students back and 120,000 students that left because they're not getting what they want. What is your, what, when, what do you plan on doing to bring these parents back? Well, I'm gonna do a poor job chair right now trying to channel Chancellor Banks who is uh, you know, much more compelling in talking about this, but 
as, as you know, as a, a veteran who I respect very, very much of, of, the, of the classroom, as uh, many of you, we have other veterans of, of classrooms here on, on uh, the committee. Um, there are great things going on every day. There are incredible pr programs everywhere you look in every neighborhood, not just in some neighborhoods. And that's one of the reasons why we are out there in the schools all the time in every borough. We do a terrible job. I'll go even further. You were being diplomatic. We do a terrible job. I said that before. Yeah. I did say you were doing a terrible Thank job you. in promoting public schools. Yes, yes. You, you were being 100% accurate in my view, Chair Joseph. So one of the things we're committed to do, this is real. This is not just um, a one and done. We have to. This is not a nice to have. We have to, for a number of reasons, uh, lift up and elevate uh, those great things, those great programs that, that are going on. And that does a couple of things. As you say, Chair, it helps to, for, for those parents, and we've got a lot of those parents out there who are deciding, where do I send my four-year-old next year and my three-year-old next year? Do I trust my child, my most precious thing in my life, to the New York City public schools? They need to hear that there are great educators, great things going on. The educators themselves also need to hear that we value them. We uh, so appreciate the work they're doing every day. And so stay tuned. We're going to be saying a lot more of that uh, uh, in, in lots of different ways to make sure we're communicating that uh, every day. Thank you. I look forward to seeing what you will deliver on that front. Um, as you know, right now, many teachers are being accessed in upcoming school year. Um, do you think accessing teachers right now is the best interest is in the best interest of our students and the future of our city? In a word, no. We, we, we don't want to see teachers accessed. The, 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 this is an issue of limited funds. And so this happens every year. It's not again, it's not it's not a good thing. We would like every teacher and beyond that guidance counselor, social worker, et cetera, school aid to be able to continue to work both where they've developed the relationships and also where they want to work. I mean, sometimes they want to change schools, which is great. They ought to be able to do that. Um, we simply don't have the funds to say to every single staff person, stay where um, there isn't the need uh, instead of going to somewhere where the, there is the need. And so we have schools that are hiring. We're going to end up hiring thousands. I don't know how many because we still you know, have to let the dust settle. We're going to end up hiring thousands of teachers. And a lot of those teachers are going to come from other schools. If, if, we, could, if we could have our ideal, we would allow every teacher to stay where they are if they want to stay where they are. We're not in the ideal. We, we, cannot, we cannot fund. We don't have the new funds to allow every teacher who right now looks like they're going to be excess to stay where they are. I just will say one potential somewhat silver lining. Every year this happens, it will happen this year. Some excess teachers end up staying in their school because somebody retires, because a budget adjustment is made by, by Lindsay's office. So some of the, the, the teachers who, look, I wish they weren't dealing with this, but they got a letter saying they're excess, will end up in September being back in their, their same school. Previous administration's ATRs, which is absent teacher reserve, were allowed to stay in their building and was not on the school budget, but was paid through Central. Why isn't that applying today? Um, thank you, uh, Chair, for this question. So um, in the, the prior administration, we actually eliminated the central budget associated with the absent teacher reserve. Um, it was $100 million in reductions that were taken um, in, the, in the baseline budget continuing savings um, over the last several years. I'm going to allow um, my council member Brewer to ask some questions, and I'll come back. Thank you very much. Um, something where it says in your page six, it says when you list the stimulus plan investing in key programs, it says all other 21 million, what's that for? Thank you for asking that question, council member. Um, that I don't like units of appropriation that are too big. This is too big. Yes, ma'am. It is uh, restorative justice, our restorative justice programming. Um, it is other investments that we have made across our our, our budgets. Um, like what? Because I want to find 200. I bet if I spent some time on this 1.7, I could find $215 million in here. 
So in addition to the restorative justice expansion, um, which I believe is something like $9 million, maybe $12 million, um, we have things like uh, MOUs, Memorandums of Understanding with CUNY to provide college access programming, as well as investments in accessibility improvements in our school buildings. Okay, so can you break that down for us in the yes. future? Because what, what's interesting to me, it says you got it duplicated because I looked at the mayor and chancellor priorities and it's 132 here, which makes sense. And my math isn't great, but I can add. So if it adds up in the next page seven, it adds up to about 132 million, but it's also listed there as um, violence interrupter, et cetera. It seems to me that's a duplication of 9 million and you just said that it's also included in the 21 million. The 132 million that is listed one, two, three, four lines down as part mm -hmm. of the yeah. 1.7 billion. On the second slide, we're just outlining. Right, no, I, I added it up. It did add up. Yes. Okay. Thank you. No, I see, Chair, the, I'm sorry to, to, to cut in, Lindsay, but I see your confusion, and we, we probably should have been more specific. The nine million that's on uh, page seven for CBO provided oh. violence interruption activities, that's actually different programming from okay. restorative yeah. justice, which is more about I training know, for restorative I know what justice. they both are. I'm quite familiar with both programs. Thank Thank Sometimes you. there could be overlap. We need to find $215 million, okay? That's what we need in order to uh, solve at least some of our problems. And I can't believe that in this budget, as somebody said, it's a rounding error out of 30 billion. You've got to find 215. Now, secondly, the 160 million that you mentioned, nobody seems to know where, which schools are gonna get that money. Do you know? The schools that are um, losing enrollment are receiving the federal stimulus funding as a hold harmless against approximately. So every school that's losing enrollment is going to get some of that money. You have enough to go around. Every single, so all of because every one of my schools is losing enrollment. Yes. So they're all going to get money. Yes. And so how are you going to determine that before September? Because this is what my understanding is. The schools are being told whatever you say after talking to like ten principals, they are all panicked. I've been around a long time. I haven't heard this kind of panic before. I know you say this has happened before, before. It hasn't. And the other problem is that when you fight, I know there's a term for this, to keep the school, to keep the this teacher, you don't actually know, and there are teachers here who know better than I do, until September whether or not that teacher is actually going to be in the classroom. So as we speak, we've got pandemic fright everywhere, right? Parents, families, we know that. So if you keep saying, um, don't worry, your teacher will be there, which nobody believes, don't worry, we won't have to come by in your classrooms, which is everybody's being told now it's gonna happen. I don't know what's going on in Albany, but, and if you are also told, well, I'm sorry, we can't do the social worker. I know every school's supposed to have a social worker. Mark Traeger and I worked on that for years. They don't all have social workers because they have other priorities. It's a mess. And it has not been like this in the past. So what I'm saying is you've got to find $250 million. We'd be glad to go line by line. There are some brilliant people here who could go line by line and find that. Now, in this report, somebody got a hold of this report, as you probably know. And it says, this is a DOE report. The DOE has more than $1.1 billion of unused prior year accruals currently open, and basically, Please cancel, this is from DOE to the principals, any encumbrances and pre-encumbrances you no longer need. These are real dollars that could be used for other purposes. What, where is this, why do, do we not have 1.1 billion? So the document that you're referencing is uh, an internal training document that we used earlier this week. Um, the 1.1 billion in accruals is not unspent funding. It represents planned for but not yet liquidated, so not yet paid um, funding for services and goods. Accrual accounting is how the city um, budgets, as you well know. I know. Um, and we have to set up accruals um, per um, controller directive. That is the city's best practice. Payments are accrued when invoices have not yet been received from a vendor which require an issue of payment. So essentially this is a technical budgeting activity um, that we do pursuant to the city's controller directive to make sure that we use, for example, fiscal year 22 funding to 
pay for fiscal year 22 goods and services, things are still getting delivered, services are still being received, and we'll get those invoices from vendors over the next couple of months in order to make sure that we use the right year's funding to pay for those bills. And examples of these things are early childhood payments for our community-based organizations, community schools, school maintenance and repair, Carter cases, devices, so on. We make sure that we strategically set up this funding as an accrual um, to make sure that we can pay those bills when the invoices are coming in. Okay, but um, it, it's still very strange to have it worded like this and going out. And of course, you can say all of that, and I appreciate that, and I know you're a professional, but I still can't believe that some of that couldn't be pared down so that we could find the magic number that I'm trying very hard to find. The other question I have is, and this is somewhat relevant, I don't know if it's exactly a budget issue, but how many teachers, picking up on what the um, speaker asked, are unvaccinated, and so therefore we're not able to return to schools? The principals have no idea, I know principals who have such teachers, the teachers are on their budgets, but they don't, nobody has told them, are they coming back? Are they not coming back? Are they going off my budget? Are they staying on my budget? What, what's, how many teachers are in that situation? I don't have that, that number right here, Chair, but I will absolutely, we have it. I will get, I will get that to you. It, I, I believe it's several hundred, and, and I also have talked to principals in that situation, and, and uh, we, we know it's an issue. This is something that was um, agreed to. There were agreements around how unvaccinated teachers would uh, be treated during the last administration, and uh, I know that's still a question mark at school. So we'll, we'll get you that exactly. Do you number. know when the principals might know what they're supposed to do with that situation? Like I, next year, two years from now, three years from now? I do not. I think there is still, um, I believe there's still a negotiating that has to happen about um, uh, the terms and conditions of, uh, of, of the, that particular group, but I would be happy to get you the, both the number and uh, the status. Okay, and then the other thing is I do want to thank the UFT because they did give us the listing of the schools and the percentages of cuts. Do you have such a listing that you could provide to the city council? Because we have it for every single school. Thank you, UFT, but nothing from the Department of Education. You know, the district, the code, the name of the school, um, the obviously fair student funding, the difference, and the budget cut, if there is one. How do you have such a, why are you not sharing that with the city council or the public? It's publicly available on our website. We're happy to be able oh, to. We, I looked on your website. It's, it's not quite in this more specific information on a spreadsheet, just like the UFT has done. It's not as easily understood. Understood. I also just would um, flag that the UFT analysis doesn't include the hold harmlesses that were allocated to mitigate those reductions. So those numbers are not what we would consider the correct reductions. All right, so you're going to get us a correct and a spreadsheet in a similar fashion? We can certainly provide you with additional information. Okay. Um, those are all my questions for now, but I'd love to come back later if possible. Thank you very much. Thank you, Chair. Quick question. Um, with all this reduction, we talked about class size. How about class size ballooning up with all these reductions, less teachers um, in the buildings? How will that? Um, yeah, thank you for the question, Chair. And look, you know, we, we want to do everything we can to uh, keep class size as low as possible. You know, the, the, the good news, just as context is, uh, class sizes have been coming down quite a bit by about 6.5% last year. Uh, the, the simple math is we have about 120,000 fewer students over the last five years. We actually have slightly more teachers uh, this past year. So that's a good thing. Uh, we want to try to maintain that as much as possible. As I sit here today, I can't tell you exactly what uh, will happen with class sizes um, this, this next year, but it's, it's obviously something that, um, that we're always going to focus on uh, to try to do what we can to keep the classes as small as possible, particularly with respect to underserved kids. But it is, I will tell you, compared to when, when I went to school, class sizes are much, much lower than, than they used to be. Now, if you have a child in a classroom that, that uh, is, is oversized, that's no, that's no comfort. Uh, we want to continue to both in a capital program and a human capital program to keep the class size as low as possible, but we can only do that within the, the, the budget that we have. Thank you, we'll come back with that. Um, I'd like to invite Council Member Caban for your question, please.
Thank you. Um, thank you, chairs. Um, I appreciate holding this hearing today. Uh, and I'm, I'm sorry, you said question in my, do we have a, a, a three or five minute time? Just trying to get a sense of what kind of time I have. Yes, council member, uh, council member questions are five minutes. Okay, great, thank you. Um, so I, I just wanna start with a, a, a couple of numbers questions. Um, what is the current ratio of social workers to students in New York City public schools? I, do, I don't have that here, but we will certainly get that for you. Okay, what's, what's the, the ratio of guidance counselors to students in New York City public schools? We'll get that for you as well. Don't, I don't okay. have that number right here. Do you have an, I, I mean, do you have a, a for, even though you can't give an accurate assessment, a rough guess, a, a, rough, a, a rough estimate? We don't, I think we'll come back to you with additional information about the exact ratios. We don't want to share incorrect information. I will say that the FY23 adopted budget um, that you all approved does maintain the investments and the expansions that the prior council made in expanding at uh, former council member Traeger's leadership, the growth in um, mental health providers in our school communities. Well, I look forward to hearing the exact numbers on what those, those ratios are. Um, last year, the DOE received 12 million for restorative justice for, for FY22 is my understanding, and then 14.8 million for FY23. What's been done to expand restorative justice in, in the schools, and how is DOE gonna continue to prioritize supporting schools with creative, uh, creating positive school climates in, in the midst of such uh, steep budget cuts? The, <laughs> the FY23 adopted budget continues the um, investments made in the restorative justice program to expand universal access to uh, restorative justice programming across school communities. Some of this funding is directly allocated to schools to support this activity that will continue, I believe, this upcoming school year. In addition, at the Chancellor's leadership, we are investing, um, I believe, $9 million in the violence interruption services provided by community-based organizations. And the, the funding for school police is, is a, a pass through from the DOE's budget to the NYPD. And so in short, any money spent on school policing takes funds directly from the DOE's budget and gives it to policing. So how do you justify filling vacant school cop positions while cutting funding for pedagogical staff? And just anecdotally, for example, um, you know, I have had, and I, I'm sure every member has, has these stories as well, but have heard directly from school principals uh, and teachers who have been accessed that uh, special ed staff has been lost, arts teachers, gym teachers, music teachers, uh, in addition to, to additional programming being, being lost. Thank you for that question, council member. The Department of Education has no control over the school safety agent staffing, hiring decisions, or budget. Those are made by the New York City Police Department. Thank you. And again, I would really love follow up on just the basic numbers of current ratios of supportive um, staff in our, our schools per student. Thank you, council member. We'll, we'll get you that right away. It's done. Thank you, council member. Um, next, mm -hmm. council member Sanchez. I have paperwork. This is not reported tomorrow. Time will begin. So, uh, Chair Joseph, this is Malcolm. It looks like uh, Councilmember Sanchez, we lost her audio. So let's go to the next council member and then we will circle back to yeah. Councilmember Sanchez. Councilmember Ressler. Thank you, uh, Madam Chairs and to the speaker. I am red hot mad about these cuts. This is a return to the Bloomberg era when we are flush with resources and yet you are all insisting on cuts that are absolutely unnecessary. There were record investments in the city budget and the state budget to support the Department of Education and yet you were insisting on cuts where we can least afford them. This budget passed with the implicit understanding that we would continue working together to address this issue, to rectify these cuts to our local schools. But as we look closer at the DOE budget and what you all are imposing as dracon the draconian cuts that you are imposing on our schools, it is far worse than I had anticipated. I raised these issues through the budget hearings, I raised these issues in meetings with the Chancellor, and I am absolutely livid at the extent of the cuts that we are experiencing. Do you know how many schools in New York City are experiencing cuts in the upcoming 
school year? So, how many schools? Just a so, Council Member, I would respectfully disagree with you about the return to a Bloomberg era. I think, as you know, um, in the Bloomberg era, we were not at 100% funding levels. I really appreciate it, Lindsay. Levels. You were a great we public now, servant. We are now, which is a great victory a that this question. Council How many has schools actually are continued to cuts? invest in, and we appreciate the Council's leadership in continuing to maintain It's 1,182. 1,182 schools I'm across the city the are experiencing loss. cuts. And those cuts are dramatic. If you want to go up to Councilmember of the Oasis District in Sunset Park, $22 million. Councilmember Brandon's District in Bay Ridge, $21 million. Councilmember Salamanca's District in the South Bronx, $20 million. Councilmember Stevens District, $19 million. Councilmember Felice's District, $18 million. Across just those five districts, that's $100 million lost to our schools. These are some of the poorest communities in New York City, and we are starving them of resources when we can least afford it. You all said that, and you all said that this was vacant, these were vacant positions that were not going to be replaced. That was disingenuous. Talk to the families at PS34 who are losing art teachers, who are seeing larger class sizes, who are absolutely struggling. Talk to the families at PS54 that are losing their bilingual program. Talk to the families at PS261, one of the most sought after public schools in all of Brooklyn that's experiencing a 16% cut. These cuts are not flesh wounds. These are cutting to the bone at schools where we can least afford it. These are our most vital public institutions, and these cuts are having dramatic impacts right now. Making adjustments in November has no bearing. It makes no difference to these schools. They will have already accessed all of these teachers. They will have already implemented these significant draconian cuts. Lastly, I, I want to ask you about the cuts in per pupil spending, which you all insisted uh, even again in this presentation, that we are continuing to increase. But I read about in the New York Post that we are now experiencing a decline in per-pupil spending. Is that accurate? So, Council Member, the New York Post article um, is referring to a publicly posted document on our website that describes uh, the implementation of the fair student funding formula as it is currently designed. So um, without any reduction in federal funding, putting that all aside, you all are reducing the per pupil spending that's going out to each of our schools anyway, which is contrary to what has been stated at hearing after hearing throughout this budget process and throughout the public statements by the DOE, correct? Uh, no, I would respectfully disagree. Um, we are uh, making an adjustment based on the decline in the year-over-year -year average teacher salary. This is how the Fair Student Funding Formula was designed 15 years ago. It is how we have implemented, it is how the department has implemented the Fair Student Funding Formula for the last 15 okay. years. And it is something that the upcoming Fair Student Funding Working Group is welcome to discuss and make recommendations. We look forward to changes. working with you on that. I just, I have to say, when you add up these cuts across these 1,182 schools, just at the schools that are losing money. We're talking about in the range of $440, $450 million in cuts, significantly more than what the DOE and the mayor have been trying to say. These are dramatic, draconian, shameful, disgraceful cuts, and it's time for the Department of Education to look at the $1.1 billion in underspending, the $1.5 billion in reserves, the $8 billion in rainy day fund, and across the significant bloat in the DOE budget to fix the darn problem. We need results now. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Ressler. Councilmember Hanif. Thank you. I'm just going to dive right in. So, New York City received $7.5 billion in federal aid from CRRSA and ARP. Um, and in the last administration, our former mayor suggested the aid be spent over several years. Of the $7.5 billion that we received, how much has been spent from FY 2020 to 21? So a little over $3 billion, or about a little over 40% of the total funds have been liquidated to date, liquidated spent to date. Um, obviously, we're continuing to spend this funding this fiscal year and will over the next two fiscal years. So $3 billion, then how much is remaining? So $3 billion out of the 7.7 .7 base, so a little over three billion, three and a half billion. Why is the DOE budget unchanged or growing, whereas schools are going to lose over a billion dollars? 
Can you repeat the question, Council I'm, so, Member? I'm sorry, Council Member. Yeah, I'm not sure I understand. Why is the DOE budget unchanged or growing? The Department, the Department of Education's budget um, is changing for a variety of reasons. Um, we are, of course, losing some of our federal stimulus funding year over year. We are increasing um, state aid, which we're investing in the fair student funding formula to ensure that everyone, all students can maintain the 100% fair student funding level. And the city tax levy increase is going to fund um, planned expenses in fiscal year 23 to match, to ensure that fiscal year 23's budget matches fiscal year 22's expenses across a variety of different areas. And then you mentioned that um, you're not seeing unusual numbers in terms of an increase of teachers being accessed. Um, how is the city going to save money by moving teachers from schools to the teacher reserves? That's a, that's a great question, Council Member. Thank you for asking it. The, these um, teachers who are being accessed will end up in funded vacancies elsewhere. So again, you know, I don't have the exact number, but we will end up with several thousand teacher vacancies. Uh, and so the teachers who are accessed will apply for jobs in the open market system. They will interview, they will get selected, uh, or uh, if necessary, they'll, they'll end up getting placed into, uh, into those funded vacancies. So they will not be on the central payroll. They will actually be on school payrolls um, at, in, in funded vacancies at the school level. So could you explain why you're unable to have teachers who are at risk of being accessed um, not remain in their current schools? Um, if I, if I, tell me if I'm, I'm getting your question correctly. I wanna I want make sure I'm, I'm responsive. Um, if if um, you have a school that has lost enrollment and so is now funded for fewer teachers and you were to keep the same number of teachers even though they're funded for fewer teachers, you would need to find additional funds for that uh, somewhere, and, and we don't have the, the, the funding for that. So that would have to come from How much somewhere. is that funding? For, for the excess teachers? Correct. I, um, we, well, first of all, we'd have to see how many excess teachers there end up being, but, um, and so I don't have an exact number for you, but that could be you know, somewhere in the neighborhood of, of $100 million. And at this time, is the DOE able to commit to ensuring that no teacher is accessed and sent to the ATR pool? The, um, we don't have an ATR pool, as Lindsay said. Uh, we don't have a funded, we don't have funding for any pool with, with ATRs in it as, as we did in the past. Uh, so they will have to go into funded vacancies. That's where they, they will go where, where they are needed, where the students need them for sure. And do you agree that teachers being accessed in this moment is absolutely unjustifiable? It's justifiable, council member, only in a world of scarce resources. So, so it's not desirable. I would totally agree that it's not desirable. It's unfortunately uh, how we have to manage the budget that we do have the, based on the adopted budget. And then could you share, um, yesterday I listened in on the um, PEP meeting and then also this, it was shared earlier that um, the task force or the group is getting onboarded around uh, studying the FSF formula. Um, could you share what the timeline of that work looks like and other information that you could provide to us? Absolutely. So we've begun talking to our panel for education policy members um, about the uh, working group. We have talk to, um, we have talked to um, uh, experts who can provide uh, financial analysis. What's and the timeline? We, we hope to have that working group, a plan for that working group in the next uh, two to three weeks. And is that public information? This is, no, it's developing right now. It's not public, but, but we will make it public. We wanna make this as transparent as possible from the meetings themselves until the, the recommendations. We want them to be released to the public as soon as they uh, exist. Thank you. Um, thank you so much, Council Member. Council Member Ayala, Deputy. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, thank you all. Um, my question is, I, I, have, I have a few questions, but I just want to understand. Um, I mean, obviously, we all knew that stimulus funding would only last us for so long. What level of preparation did the DOE put in place to prepare these schools for such cuts? And when did those conversations begin? 
Um, thank you for the question, and I just want to correct. I believe I shared the wrong number with you before. I apologize. So we have a, a, about four and a half billion in unspent stimulus funding at this point, and again, we are continuing to spend that funding. So apologies, I gave you the wrong number. I wanted to correct the record. Um, we are continuing. So in, in the start of the so. Uh, um, So we received the federal stimulus funding in three waves. There were three different federal packages that we received um, for stimulus funding. The two that we are talking about most commonly are what we refer to as SARSA and ARPA. Um, the CARES funding, which was the first package, is long since gone. Um, the SARSA and ARPA funding is meant to support supplemental activities in schools. It's meant to support learning loss. It's meant to support um, investments in mental health services, community school programs, et cetera. There are federal rules and regs around how we can spend that funding. Um, we worked, I worked very hard on scheduling and setting up the initial stimulus budget um, when that funding first came in. Um, and we were thrilled to receive that funding. I know many of you remember the deep fiscal cliff that we were all facing if that funding did not come in. We were hugely and are continuing to be incredibly grateful for that billions of dollars of investments made in our schools. Um, it has made it a tremendous difference, as you all know, in school communities, and it will continue to do so over the next couple of years. And and we would urge the federal government to continue to make these investments in public education across the country, and I'm sure you would all join us in that. One of the things that we did to be strategic about the use of stimulus funding is front load the money. We wanted to make sure that in fiscal year 22, this fiscal year that will end next week, that we were maximizing those resources. Schools were going to be back in person full time. There was no hybrid option. We wanted to make sure that school communities would that you know were coming back for the first time were going to benefit from that funding now. I'm sorry, I don't want to interrupt you, but yep, I, sorry, I'm going on. No, my time is very limited, and I just I want to know the I, I, the question is. We, we see, we know, right, that there's a student enrollment uh, issue. Enter a pandemic. We were already in trouble. We are holding schools harmless because we received the stimulus funding, which is temporary. At what point in the game does the DOE sit down with educators and say, we're going to be in trouble in two years. This is the plan. This is how we're going to work our way around it. Like, I don't, I don't, I'm not, I haven't heard yet. What level of engagement? I mean, I'm hearing that as of February, there was some conversations from February to adoption is not a long time. I don't feel that it's an appropriate enough amount of time to prepare schools for such a cut. Um, and I think that this is what's, what's led to so much, you know, uh, confusion and chaos and, you know, people are freaking out because they have no idea what's going on. And I, I'm, listen, I have a child in public school. I still have not received a letter. I, I know all of this because I've, by virtue of working in the city council. Most parents don't know what's going on. So when did, when did these conversations start? When did you start planning to fall off the cliff? Because you were going to fall off the cliff at some point. So when did that start happening? During the months of May and June, we have met with every single CEC in the city um, to discuss our stimulus budgets and to talk about um, what the budget will be next year and to, and to remind people that this is temporary funding that will end. Last year? This happened last year? No, it has happened this May and this, this May? June. Why did it take so long? We did five borough town halls last spring. This is a continuation of public engagement. Um, we did engagement last school year, and this was the engagement that we have done this school year. Okay. And you mentioned that there was a possibility that schools could submit an appeal. Can you tell us what the number of appeals is to date, and what, is, what, what does the appeal process actually look like? So as I said, um, school communities have the right to make a budget appeal. We haven't yet received any that I'm aware of from schools. Schools have until the end of this month to schedule their budgets, and then they will start to submit appeals. Um, and we will receive them throughout the month of July on a rolling basis and make decisions about allocating additional resources on a rolling basis during the month. And how will schools notify that they have an opportunity to appeal? This is an annual process, and the budget directors that work with schools on a daily basis are aware of this process and work with principals to submit those appeal requests. Okay. Um, now, this, does this, does, do these cuts impact District 75 schools at all? No. They don't? Okay. I, I, I represent two boroughs. I have East Harlem and the South Bronx, and in the South Bronx I have huge retention is issues. Um, does this impact your ability to retain teachers in communities like mine? You know, we 
We have been fortunate in that teacher retention has been quite high. So teacher attrition has been running at about 6%. In the, so, in the South Bronx? That, that I can't, I'd have to look in that particular district. So, so, so uh, you know, we, we certainly um, are watching that number very carefully. Okay, I would, I would love to know what that number is. And, and finally, um, in your opinion, does the current fair student uh, funding formula work? Does it still work? I mean, as the chancellor has said, no, it can be improved. And I, I believe that, I believe that as well. And I was around in 2007 when the original version was, um, was, was designed. One thing I do want, want to say, council member, is that as much as the formula, I'm sure, can be improved, and I think the working group will submit great recommendations that everybody will get to see and discuss, including the council. Um, the formula itself doesn't add or subtract dollars to the pie. So you can change, right, if you, all you do is change the formula, for example, to direct more funding to underserved students, you're going to be ending up with winners and losers. Some schools will be getting more, some schools will be getting less. What we really need to do in connection with fair student funding, in my opinion, since you asked for my, my opinion, is definitely improve the formula. At the same time, we are looking to the state and advocating with the state um, to support more dollars. So then we're not, we're not just robbing Peter to pay Paul, but we're actually better serving more kids who, who deserve it. Thank you. While you're on that question, um, there was a task force form prior, and the, and the report never came out. What are you going to do differently this time around when the commission? Who's going to be on it? Are they going to be expert? Will the council also have a voice in who we add in this task force? <clears throat> so, oh my gosh, where, where do I start, Chair Joseph? No, um, I can't speak to why that report was never released. Um, I'm just going to leave that to, to the side. Um, in this case, um, <laughs> Mr. Traeger may, may have something to say on that. Uh, the sergeant at arms may need to head over there, but, but, um, uh, but uh, certainly, we want this to be transparent. The council absolutely, including the chair of the Ed Committee, we want to have input into who serves on the committee. We want you to have um, insight into what's happening. And look, our view, and this, this is not, this is, we don't want this to be a, DOE-driven committee. This is a committee that should have parents. In my view, it should have students. It should have financial experts. It should, should have advocates. It should have elected officials. Um, and it really should be about, okay, let's look at different models uh, of what happens when we run different models. Let's get really good independent uh, views of, of how it would affect students and families. And then let's make real recommendations for how this can be changed right away before next school year. So just, I, I probably should have said this uh, in answer to a uh, previous question, the timing on this, these recommendations really have to be done by around November. So this is not, this is not something that, you know, uh, should take, can take a year or something like that. And the chancellor's been very clear with me and with us, we've got to get this thing going and we've got to, we, it's got to be focused on making real practical recommendations. So we'd love to follow up and, and get your views and the views of all of your colleagues about, about that working group. Absolutely. Um, earlier you spoke, I want to go back a question for a minute. Earlier you spoke about the appeals. Can you explain what the process is like? How long does it take? And when does the fund hit the schools? Sure. Um, thank you for the opportunity to explain this process. So as I mentioned, um, school budgets, we've asked principals to have their school budgets programmed by the end of this month. At any time um, between now and the end of July, we expect that schools will start to submit appeals. They come to us on a rolling basis, and they come to us through their field offices, um, through their budget directors, and we typically allocate funding to schools to support staffing needs first. We will certainly do that this summer. That would allow schools to um, perhaps rescind some of the accessing letters that have been made, um, and that will absolutely continue to be prioritized first. We allocate funding on a rolling basis, so that will happen starting in July. We try to make sure that the allocations to schools are done, or this, the additional allocations to school are done before open market closes, which is the end of sort of the hiring season, and that is I believe closing the first week of August, and at that point will be you know a month before the school year starts, um, so that schools can finalize their budgets and um, be ready for the first day of school. Thank you, um, Councilmember Sanchez. 
I'm just saying this one question because the principals tell me that in the past, maybe not now, the appeals process does not end until mid-September. Was that been true in the past and will it change if it has been? Because that doesn't help you plan for September opening. Yes, that timeline certainly doesn't. It has been my experience that the timeline is um, what I just mentioned, that we work hard to ensure that this is done well before the start of school. A school has the opportunity to continue to request funding if there are unexpected changes in their school once school opens. And in, if that is true, um, and that there are changes in September, we will continue to address and take appeals directly from schools no. if conditions happen in September. I'm telling you, I know you're working, to, I'm letting you know three principals told me today that in the past it's always been mid-September before the appeals were concluded so that that has not been my experience mm -hmm. but Thanks. I appreciate the feedback councilmember Sanchez. Sanchez Sanchez time will begin councilmember Sanchez you should have a request to, there we go oh. you're all set Thank you. Thank you so much uh, to the speaker and to, to the chairs, Rita Joseph uh, and Gail Brewer. Um, and thank you for, for accommodating me uh, in, in this hearing. Um, so th thank you, Deputy Chancellor, and, and thank you for, for the answers. But just to first piggyback on that last, very last question, wouldn't you agree that it's extremely destabilizing for schools not to know who they're going to be hiring or, or, or to have this? I spoke with principals today uh, who, who have told me that they always see a jump in enrollment numbers uh, come September. And so, you know, they have to scramble last minute and they will certainly have to scramble last minute this year, given, given the, the teachers that are being accessed uh, to, to make ends meet and to, to hire. Wouldn't you say that this is destabilizing for our students and for these schools? I mean, certainly, again, uh, thank you very much for the, for the, the question, Council Member. Uh, um, obviously, not ideal to have to scramble to hire somebody in September. We actually want our schools to be able to hire as, as soon as possible. One of the reasons we felt a ton of urgency, I would just say parenthetically, to get school budgets out uh, is because of that, is because we want the hiring process to take place as soon as possible so the best candidates can be recruited uh, and selected. Um, so, um, so we don't want that ideally to happen in September. One process point that I don't think has come up yet, Council Member Sanchez, just, just to, to say, the enrollment projections, we do the best we can. We have central folks who've done this for a long time. They crunch the data. They don't just throw that in the principal's lap. In the, in the spring, Lindsay probably knows better than I do when that happens, but early in the spring, Enrollment will work with the principal and say, look, here's what we see the trends are. Here's where we think your school is going to end up in September. And very often the principal says, hey, last couple of years, just as you said, council member, we've had an influx of students who registered early in September, sometimes even later than that. Um, so can you adjust it? And there's back and forth. Now, having said that, there's still going to be cases. And, in, you know, on one level, I hope there's a lot of these cases where there are students that we don't anticipate who do show up and enroll in September. If that, is, if that is the case, we will absolutely provide funding, OMB will provide funding to make sure that those students get the, the services that, that they need. Not ideal, I would rather that happen in June, but sometimes that is what happens, it happens in September. Thank, thank you, Deputy Chancellor. And, and just for the record, that, that is not, I mean, that sounds great, but that does not sound like what I'm hearing from my principals. It sounds like these numbers are handed down and they don't have a lot of say. And, uh, you know, there's cultural differences between communities. Uh, I know half of my community, well, maybe not half, but a significant proportion of folks in my community, you know, send their kids abroad, send their kids back to the home island for, for, the, for the summer, and they're not responsive. So in any case, just, just wanted to underscore that point and, and not ideal and I, I think we can do better and, and I, you know, council member so, sorry to interject just on that point I <laughs> want to offer something please let us oh sorry go ahead sorry go ahead yes, very limited amount of time and then yes, you can answer yes however long. um the, the chairs allow you to so I just I just want to close myself by by echoing what you've already heard from from so many colleagues it, our children just need more than more from our schools than ever Right. They've, they've just been through so much. I've, I've visited schools in the last few weeks where, you know, not only am I hearing about the challenges that our children are facing in terms of mental health and, and coping and, and the loss and, and, 
and just how difficult everything has been, but their parents, right? And the parents like spilling that into the schools. And, and so many of my principals and my teachers are counting on a budget that was not that was going to hold them harmless from these cuts so that they can hire you know more social emotional support have more enrichment programming have all of these things and instead they're being met with you know you need to access teachers you need to cut programs and i just want to join all all of my colleagues in in saying this this is not this is not acceptable this is not okay we we need to be there for our kids the we are in the middle of a really difficult recovery and we need DOE to, to be flexible to let our schools remain whole, right? Especially I represent one of the lowest income school districts, two of the lowest income school districts in the in the city districts nine and ten. And we just need more. So I you can finish uh, your your thoughts, but you know, I just also would love to understand, you know, previous administrations held schools harmless from enrollment declines. What why the change for, for this administration at this time? Uh, uh, thank you, Council Member. And just say very quickly, if, if you have particular schools, feel free to contact me that you think they are not being heard in that enrollment conversation. I'd be happy to, to make sure that we are talking to those principals and trying to resolve that. And then uh, second, just to very quickly answer your question, it's just availability of uh, diminishing availability of stimulus funds uh, that dictates that we can't hold harmless the way uh, uh, schools were held harmless the last couple of years. Thank you. Thank you, Chairs. Thank you, Deputy Chancellor. Thank you, Councilmember Sanchez. Um, next, Councilmember Gutierrez. Thank you, Chairs. Uh, Deputy Chancellor, I appreciate uh, your response to Chair Joseph earlier where you admitted that um, enrollment has been an issue and that the DOE has admittedly done a terrible job at solving for that. Um, I do need to highlight that in gentrifying districts, in districts where black and brown families have been driven out of their homes in droves, this has been an issue for two decades. District 14 in Williamsburg and Greenpoint, District 32 in Bushwick, and now the Queen side, the, the District 34 overlapping portion of School District 24, which I graduated from, overpopulated, but any of the schools that are in my district are now facing under enrollment because gentrification and displacement is a very real thing. And it's not just exclusive to North Brooklyn, it's, it's all over. But what, there was no plan then, this was 20 years ago. What, what is the plan now? What is the actual plan? I don't have to tell you that what happens in these school buildings when they are under-enrolled, the black and brown and immigrant families that stay continue to be disproportionately impacted because now they're not even counted. So what is the actual plan? Yeah, and this is, I mean, uh, I really appreciate the, the, the question and, and really agree 100% uh, with the sentiments. This is why Chancellor Banks has been ringing the alarm bell on uh, enrollment declines. It, it is because what the impact of those declines as you said, Councilmember Gutierrez is 100% correct, falls on the most underserved kids. Uh, that's what happened. When you have under-enrolled schools, they can't provide the full set of programming, services, AP classes, what have you, that tends to fall on the most underserved kids. So this is why we need, we need to, to win back families. Uh, now, some of this, I'm gonna be very honest, some of this, we at the, at the Department of Education, New York City Public Schools um, can't control. You know, we, we, we don't control things like housing costs and so forth, but there is part of it that we can control and there is a plan. And the plan, I would say, the heart of the plan is, um, you know, we have, uh, you know, Chancellor Banks asked each one of the 45 superintendents to reapply for their jobs. That is in part because it's a different job. And so the districts you mentioned, 14, 32, 24, 20, 24 um, the superintendents, whether they are you know, uh, continuing in, in the job or they're new, um, they're going to be charged with doing what I talked about with uh, Chair Joseph before. And that is, so the plan is for them to get very close to those neighborhoods, changing as they may be, and figure out what is the plan to provide the, the schools and the programs that are going to win back families. And, and to some extent, if housing patterns have changed, and what we have is under-enrolled schools and there, there aren't the families that are there to fill all of the schools, figure out how to best serve all the kids. That might mean merging schools. In, in some cases, that might mean opening a new school 
to replace schools that are under-enrolled, uh, but those superintendents are gonna be accountable for being very responsive to the need in those communities, and first and foremost, not last, but first and foremost, students of color, black and brown students, students who have been marginalized chronically, as you say, over the last more than two decades in our system. Thank you. Um, I just I need to push back a little bit because I have seen firsthand in my school district some of the solves that the principals and school communities have been scrambling to put together to do that um, was utilizing this funding to hire for the first time bilingual counselors, bilingual guidance counselors, instituting their own versions of community school initiatives without any of the community school funding. and. Although the council was able to restore some of those funds, and I see in the budget we're gonna be able to expand it, they were not baseline. We will do the same dance again next year. So I really need to hear buy-in from the DOE that if what you're proposing is the actual solution, which is sounds like it's a community school, that we are permanently investing in this model. It is, it is the only way for communities like mine. Um, I have a couple more questions, I'll be fast. Um, I wanted to ask about, um, if the DOE has the disaggregated data for the use of federal funds in supporting immigrant students, do you have, especially the newly arrived ones, we had a lot of uh, newly arrived immigrants in my district, School District 32 specifically, do you have that data of how that federal funding uh, was used per newly arrived students? We can provide that information. Okay. Um, my second question is, do you have a sense of how much of that uh, recovery funding was used to support Engli English language learners? I don't have the exact dollar value. You can certainly provide that offline, but we have um, prioritized English language learners um, and uh, invested in anything from um, libraries for schools and home languages, as well as um, expansions and outreach to communities. Thank you. And I, can I just have one more question, Chair? I think she's fine. Um, regarding summer learning, what percentage, and this is, I think every member here is probably going to get calls if they haven't already about how quickly these uh, seats filled up. Um, what we saw, actually you should be aware that a lot of families that left were coming back with the intention of enrolling their kids in summer learning and then permanently enrolling them back for the fall. So that's a problem. They have nowhere to put them. Um, can you share how many of those seats were uh, taken or are being filled, excuse me, by private school students, charter school students, uh, low income students, and temporary housing students, as well as English language learners? It's open to everybody, correct? Every single some, some are rising, yeah. council member? Mm -hmm. um, yes, yeah. so yes, it is certainly open open to everybody to enroll. I, I don't have that breakdown. The, you know, the final, final um, uh, totals are, are still being worked out, but we can, we can certainly give you whatever breakdown we have. Happy to, happy to provide that to you. Thank you. Uh, and my, my last statement, it's not so much a question, as I, I echo the sentiment of so many of my colleagues here and so many of the folks that are here in this room, it is, it's hard to continue to call yourself an advocate with the budget that we have here. It's it, impossible to do that. And I think the DOE has an immense, immense responsibility to make that right. A lot of us are taking a leap of faith with the DOE with no real reason to in telling our constituents that there is a solve for this. And what we are hearing today is that there isn't a solve for this that this was money that they never should have had, but imagine a world where schools had, for the first time in history, have every single dollar that they need. And that is what we are continuing to deny our students. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member. Um, Council Member Lee. Hi, thank you everyone, thank you chairs, um, and thank you so much Deputy Chancellor uh, for being here with us today and as a public school parent myself as well as having one of the most schools, uh, public schools in my district, um, you know, this is a very important issue and I recently had a meeting with the principals in my district, um, you know, we have these ongoing meetings um, and I, yes, everyone's upset about the changes in the funding for the next year, but um, I wanted, to, I had four questions that were focused um, on other issues where I think perhaps maybe we can find savings or find other ways. But 
Um, ultimately, I think the principles, at least that I've spoken to, are also focused on the quality of education and the educational experience. And uh, a few of them brought up the teacher salary, average teacher salary issue, um, because a lot of them have um, teachers that have been there for 10 plus years, and you know they feel that um, you know they're being unfairly punished because of the fact that you know, they want to retain teachers, they want to retain good teachers, and because they have um, higher average teacher salaries, they're already starting off at a, at a worse budget um, for their schools. And so I'm just trying to figure out, like we all agree that schools should be incentivized to retain experienced teachers, but that shouldn't come at the expense of the overall budget. And so I'm wondering if there's a way to help schools retain experienced teachers without impacting the rest of their budget, and are you open to reconsidering the formula perhaps by paying the differential out of the central budget rather than the schools. So that was the first, sorry. Again, you know, that would be, I mean, I think that is really, uh, Council Member Lee, I think that's wrapped up in the uh, fair student funding formula uh, working group question. That could well be one of the recommendations. Uh, that would take new funding. We'd have to figure out where that would come from in order, in order to, to kind of top up the budgets of schools that had tended to have more experienced teachers. But, you know, we, I, I totally understand that's an issue in, in some schools. Okay, and then I think some of my other colleagues hit up on this uh, point about the enrollment numbers because um, the the rollout of the admissions process for the upcoming school year, um, you know, it's been emphasized previously, the current budget allocation for DOE is based on projected enrollment. And we've been told that schools that see higher than expected enrollment in the fall can expect to see their budgets increase as well. However, the planning and budgeting process doesn't work that smoothly, um, and principals need to hire staff, assign classrooms, figure out if they need more ICT teachers. Um, and so we've heard that the list notices for DOE were provided to principals just this week, and the lists are shorter than usual with also longer wait lists regarding the school's actual capacity. Um, and adopting a rolling admission process, you know, interferes with the plans to hire and for the principals. And so, um, can you commit to providing final enrollment numbers for principals? When can you, sorry, commit to providing final enrollment numbers for principals so they know their actual budgets rather than projected? Because my understanding is that they're being asked to plan out the budget with the current enrollment numbers, um, not including the wait lists. And so. Um, can you allow principals to forecast enrollments based on their wait list using some of the extra stimulus funds as buffer? Um, so that in, rather than shortchanging schools over the summer, um, can we give principals a bit more leeway in the planning knowing that they'll return, um, you know, the for, leeway in planning for before the fall? That's a, it's a great question and that's one of the kind of, um, uh, steps that we took this year is to uh, extend the wait list uh, for you know students who were applying to particular schools into mid-September. That was something we heard again and again from families that they wanted the the wait list extended until the after the beginning of the school year. Let me take that back. Uh, that's a really good point, and and see how we're dealing with um, enrollment projections based on that extended wait list. That's that's a it's a very it's an excellent point. Okay. Um, and then this has already been asked, but just again for the record, um, instead of ping-ponging the teachers, is DOE, um, is, are you guys, um, uh, would you agree to maintain excess teachers within their schools until final enrollment and the budget allocations are made in November? Is that possible? Um, again, the, the, issue, the issue with that is that hiring is happening now, and so if we were to somehow lock in teachers uh, and not have them apply and get other jobs, then you know we're going to have problems in the schools that do need to hire, and we're going to have problems for those teachers if it turns out there isn't a spot for them. Now, as Lindsay said, some of those excess teachers will end up back in their schools for, for a variety of reasons, but if, um, it, it, it would be really infeasible to just lock them in at this point. Okay. And then my two final points, one of them I won't repeat because it was the same questions that um, Chair Brewer had asked about the vaccine policy because I think principals are just wondering what's going on if they can expect teachers to come back because there are, you know, they're still on the payroll. Um, and then just real quick about consultants um, for the DOE, because I know that, for example, DOE offered SIRS, the Special Education Recovery Services to children. Um, and. We have constituents telling me that you know schools were not given information or guidance on this and that there were no personnel to operate the program. Um, and so I'm just wondering, does DOE currently provide units of appropriation that detail spending on consultants and how does that impact the budget? 
consultants are um, a very small portion of the overall Department of Education's budget. Um, they're not singly isolated in one unit of appropriation. Okay. Perhaps I may restate. Spending on consultants exists across several units of appropriation. So schools spend funding on consultants out of school units of appropriation and then across other units of appropriation as well. Okay, and is there a way to separate that out or pull that out for consultants versus the actual DOE budget? Uh, yes, we okay. can provide you with additional information on that. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Council Member. Um, Council Member Krishna, give me one second. I want to acknowledge Council Member Felice, Council Member Yeager, Kami Yeager, Council Member Stevens, Council Member Williams, and Council Member Nassis. Go ahead, Council Member. Thank you so much, Speaker Adams, uh, Chair Joseph, and Chair Brewer, uh, for today's crucial hearing. Uh, let me ask you both. You would agree that this issue affecting our schools is an important issue, right? By this issue, you mean? The issue of the 215 million, the subject of our hearing today, you would agree this is an important issue affecting our schools, right? The subject of this hearing is definitely an important issue. Okay. And you would agree that this is an issue affecting many of our schools throughout the city, right? School budgets affect every school in our city. So this is an issue affecting, we can agree that this is an important issue, a crucial issue, I would say, affecting our schools. It's an issue affecting many schools throughout our city. My question to you is, where is the chancellor? Where is the chancellor? Where is the chancellor? Did he have a more important engagement for our schools in this matter right now? Where is the chancellor of the Department of Education? The chancellor testified at at least two budget hearings. Uh, I'm not, that's not my question. Body. Excuse my, my, me. Excuse no, no, no. Me. If I, I can be allowed to finish. I'm the one asking the questions. Yeah, and I'm my the one question, answering the question. My question to you is, where is the chancellor for today's hearing? Can I answer the question? I'm waiting for an answer. Well, maybe you'd allow me to answer that instead today's of talking hearing. over me. No, to that, I, I'm asking the question about today's hearing, not three months ago. Where is the chance of education for today's hearing? The chancellor testified twice to, to this body about the budget. The chancellor came in, in to a meeting Friday that was scheduled with about mm, 24 today. hours notice. Where is today? <clears throat> where is the chancellor today? That you were at, Councilman. That's Krishnan, right. I'm asking where, questions. Where is the chancellor today? The, this. These questions today about technical budget issues are better addressed by myself oh, and I see. C the CFO. Technical budget issues, that's, that's an interesting phrase for 215 million. And another phrase you used about scarce resources. Let's talk about the scarce resources of the Department of Education. $37.6 billion budget, right? For the Department of Education, is that correct? That is correct. Okay. What is the, city, what is the size of the city budget? $100 billion, give or take, right? I believe so, yes. Okay. So the Department of Education budget is a third of the entire New York City's budget, correct? Or give or take. I believe that math is correct, sir. Okay. And the city funding that's being increased for this Department of Education budget is about $700 million, give or take, right? That is correct. And the hole that we're talking about is $215 million, right? That is correct. Do you know what percentage $215 million is of the entire Department of Education budget? Not I'll tell you, it's less than 1% of the entire Department of Education budget. Less than 1% of the entire Department of Education budget is the amount that we're talking about today. And this agency is testifying that because of scarce resources in a $37.6 billion budget, you cannot find a way to fill less than 1% of this agency budget. Now, looking at this budget, I see that the Department of Education has adjusted its headcount at DOE Central based on actual numbers uh, over the course of the pandemic in terms of headcount. Isn't it a fact that there are other, other line items in this DOE budget where the Department of Education has underspent compared to last year? Uh, fiscal year 23 has not yet begun. Last year's budget compared to this year's budget. Is it not a fact that there are line items in the DOE budget where this agency has underspent? There are a variety of line items where there are ups and downs across the, the department. We are currently forecasting a slight deficit. Yes or no? Fiscal year 22. Are there line items in the agency budget that have been underspent? The question is misleading. It's not a misleading question. Yes, it is. It's very simple. There are, I'll answer the question. Yes, there okay. are line oh, yeah. items. That's the question. Thank you. Let that's, me finish. That's a good way to run. There, the are, there are line items where the agency is underspent. 
And so my question to you is, if you can right-size the DOE headcount coming out of this pandemic, then why weren't these other line items in the DOE, why can't those other line items in the agency budget be right-sized instead of right-sizing on the backs of our schools? You, you right-size where there is under, underspending in the DOE budget, move that extra money over to the schools. Why can't that be done in this year's budget? We are projecting an overall deficit. And so there's no capacity to move $215 million around in a $37.6 billion budget. That's, what, that's your testimony today. Where would you like to cut? That's a great question. Let me ask you this. Would you be willing to provide a budget, a line-by-line, line, not just for the stimulus money, but a line-by-line line budget of the Department of Education to this body? Because then I can tell you where to cut from, and so can Chair Brewer as well. I believe, Council Member, that was included in the adopted budget that you voted on. So a line by line, not an overall number, a line by, do I have permission to finish, Chair Joseph? A line by line budget and breakdown of the Department of Education. If that exists and you're willing to provide it, would you be willing to have a third party auditor come in and go line by line through that budget to see where there is underspending and where money could be moved? That process exists on an annual basis as required by state law. And you'd be willing to subject the Department of Education to that audit process to look at where we could move $215 million from within the agency in the current budget of $37.6 billion. Again, per state law, an outside auditor audits the Department of Education's budget on an annual basis. Mm -hmm. Would you be willing to do it now for the $215 million to see where we could find it? Again, that is happening annually as required by state law. Uh -huh. And have you posed a question to that auditor of where the $215 million could be moved from? I'm not in a position to tell auditors how to audit our budget. Thank you. I'd like to now go to the next question, which is about uh, the uh, excesses. Council so, Member, time is up. Yes. Uh, can I ask one more question, Chair no, Joseph? I have to hold on to it in my second round. Okay, second round. Yes. Thank you. Um, Council Member Stevens. Good afternoon, everyone. I just want to acknowledge that today is a heavy day. and. The reason everyone is super passionate because it's clear that we need to continue to be fighting for our young people because not enough people are. And so with, with the decision from the Supreme Court today and the decision from the Supreme Court yesterday, our children need to be our first priority. And, and this council believes in our children and fighting for our children, which is why I think we're all here and showing up. So I just wanted to make sure we acknowledge that and acknowledge the heaviness of these last couple of days. Um, so one of my questions and, and bigger question is around Enrollment has been declining in schools for the last couple of years. How have we been preparing for this? I know we keep talking about the budget, but the issue is that we've been losing young, young people to charter schools. They've been moving and all these things. And I think the DOE has taken for granted that parents have other options. So what have you been doing to really prepare for this and help, help schools with recruitment and retaining students? Because I think that's a key issue that no one is talking about. We have not been doing recruitment. We're not looking into to families and having them stay here. So what are you doing around preparing principals and educators around retention and recruiting students? Thank you, council member, and I appreciate you talking about the heaviness of the day and the need to advocate for our children. We, we agree with you 100%. Um, uh, you are absolutely correct that uh, this enrollment decline was exacerbated during the pandemic, but started well before uh, the pandemic. And you're, you're also, I can't speak to what happened before January, but um, you're also correct that the department has not done a good job of equipping our school leaders, our superintendents, our, our uh, school staff to do exactly what you're talking about, uh, which is to recruit families, to retain families. Ultimately, you know, that's less about marketing, of course, I say this in part as a parent and more about, you know, the proof in, in the pudding, which is making sure that you are committing in, in authentic ways to parents that you are going to provide a consistently great education and a consistently great environment for students. That's not something, I will say, council member, that is part of the curriculum at teacher prep uh, institutions. We have some folks on the council who have been through that, or even in principal prep. Uh, so we are going to, part of what we're planning over this summer is training for our superintendents and then starting with our principals about that. It starts, the heart of it is community engagement. The chancellor talks about this all the time. He was a principal for 11 years. 
the, the job is not just within the four years of uh, four walls of your building. The job is going out to get to know that bodega owner who may be spending more time with your kids than you are. The job is getting to know the, the, the police captain, et cetera. So that's where it starts, is c making sure that our school leaders are doing really good uh, community engagement. But then it's about what you're offering to families. But I also think that it's, it's a misstep and should have been part of this conversation long before because you said for years we've been declining in enrollment. And so yeah. it's really unfortunate that we're waiting until, like, um, Deputy Speaker said, we are falling off the cliff to say now let's think about enrollment. We have to get to a place where we're walking and chewing gum at the same time and not just saying, oh, well, that's something that's happening, but we'll just wait. So that's a real mis unfortunate step that you guys are taking yes, and needs to be rectified immediately. Another question I have is, what is the anticipated impact on CBOs that has historically supplemented school-based services when schools can't? So have you guys even thought about what that looks like on school um, CBOs that work in partnership with these schools? I mean, um, cer certainly, I mean, this is, this is one of the things, for example, with Summer Rising, uh, there's, a, there's a positive case where we're actually providing additional funding for CBOs to engage with our students over the summer, which, as many of you have said, is really, really important programming, particularly this summer as our kids are dealing with everything they're dealing with. Um, yeah, but Summer Rising is one program I'm thinking about. Are you guys thinking about how this is going to impact them as well because CBOs consistently step up and fill the gaps when you guys drop the ball. So what does that look like and have you been working with them and making sure that they're part of this plan moving forward? Yes, uh, we've been working with them at the DOE level, council member and the mayor in his office have been working with CBOs uh, on a number of levels uh, because, uh, and I say this as somebody who ran a nonprofit uh, before I, I came back to the Department of Education. Um, so CBRs are absolutely vital. When I talk about community engagement, part of that is through our community-based organizations. So we're working with them on operational issues, to be clear, because there are operational issues, making sure, I'm going to be very honest here, making sure they get paid when they're supposed to get paid. That's been a challenge, but that's something we work on. And then on the program, pro programmatic issues as well. We definitely are giving them a seat at the table. Thank you for that, but I just also want to highlight that some of the things that I'm hearing, even around Summer Rising, which you just brought up, that some of the schools are actually have more charter school students than public school students, right? So we need to really be thinking about that. Um, how are we making sure there's equitable, equi equity within our programs that we have and they're serving the students who are in these schools or who are in public school and not prioritizing charter school students? Because I'm hearing from a number of providers that that is happening and taking place this summer. So that is something else we need to be thinking about and rectifying as well. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member. Um, Council Member um, Majority Whip Brooks Powers. Thank you, Madam Chair. Chairs, um, I just want to get into the meat of this because I share the sentiments of my colleagues that spoke before. I'm having a hard time grappling with um, the loss of funding in such a time as this when we know that before the federal stimulus money came in, our schools were not whole. They were never 100%. In a community like the 31st Council District, where 21 of 32 of my schools received budget cuts, I'm curious to understand what, in addition to that formula, was factored into these cuts, considering that schools like PS 105 and Far Rockaway, the second deadliest zip code in COVID-19, could receive 19% cuts. When, when schools like PS52 and Springfield Gardens can receive 19% um, cuts and they receive a lot of students from our neighboring shelters. I'm having a hard time understanding that. Um, and let's talk about mandates, the IEPs. The IEP requires specific support. PS105 this week told me they are losing two special ed teachers. I am being told that there are schools that have to change IEPs because they are not in compliance to provide services to these students. That is problematic. Um, I want to understand how we find this money. And so a part of that is I, I would like a breakdown of the headcount of Tweed for every position that exists there. What percentage of the department's headcount does that constitute? What is the budget for staffing and operating for all non-classroom and non-school roles? 
Um, considering the loss of federal funding, has the DOE looked or begun to look at reducing the headcount at Tweed so that we can right-size DOE as being the agency that has one of the largest budgets? Um, can DOE describe how the pandemic's budgetary impacts prompted the department to create, furlough, or combine various positions? Um, I also want to understand how has stimulus funding affected these decisions? I understand also that 3K is fully funded by the stimulus money. Community schools are partially funded by stimulus money. What is the DOE's plan to ensure that we do not lose these critical services from the DOE? Um, how does the, the Department of Education plan to fund it beyond that? I'm also trying to understand and educate me. When you say that the, the, the teachers are being excess and they go into funded vacancies, how are we saving money if we're still paying for it? So if they're still getting paid, why, in fact, do they have to even move out of these schools? And that's an education piece for me that I'm interested in understanding better. Um, and as you see, I have a lot of questions, but I'm going to stop there because I want to get answers for them. Yes, Council Member, and I'll, I try to take notes, but please let me know if I, I, will if, gladly. I if, if, if I missed anything. I'll just I'll try the, the last one first. Um, the, if you have a school that has lost enrollment and uh, is funded for fewer positions and therefore they have to excess a teacher, you have another school that's gotten additional funding because they've added students, let's say, um, and the teacher moves from school A to school B, uh, that, uh, that doesn't cost us additional money because the funding is there. If that, if that teacher didn't move and stayed in a school that had lost enrollment uh, and was not funded for that position, we would have to come up with additional funding to keep that teacher in the school that had lost enrollment. I don't know if that, that helps, but we have a certain number of positions, teacher positions, that we fund they obviously don't stay static in, in individual schools. Those positions will you know, grow or diminish in particular schools, but we have funding that is in the budget. It is budgeted for FY23 for that number of teacher positions. And as long as a teacher is in one of those positions that is funded in our budget, then it's not gonna require additional funds. I don't know if, I don't know if that helps. No, that helps. If you could answer the remaining questions. Uh, community schools, 3K, I mean, I would just say, this, this is something that is a, is a major issue, and I want, uh, you know, I want to make sure we work, and I know the Chancellor wants to make sure we work with the Council on exactly the issue that you have pointed out, Council Member. It's really important. We have to figure out, and we're committed to figuring out a sustainable way to fund these critical programs, which are funded with temporary stimulus funds. So this is something we would love to continue to talk about. Chair, if you could grant permission for the remaining questions to be answered, I'd appreciate it. Permission granted. And I'll just say on, on uh, Lindsay should, should jump in in a, in a second, um, the, the head count at Tweed, or more than just Tweed, but in central offices, again, that's, that's about 2% of the budget. That is something that, believe me, the chancellor is looking at. What's all, the dollar amount? Uh, it's 600 it's about million. 600, it's about 600 million. Yeah, that's in the materials, but you know, we can give you more of a breakdown. We're happy to do that. We did cut almost 300 positions uh, earlier this year. Uh, from that central headcount, and uh, you know we're, we're we're always looking at where we can drive resources down to the school level. Again, as Lindsay said, you know this includes people who are working with principals on budget, pre pr uh, people who are working with principals on uh, special education and, and HR. So there's a limit. W once we start cutting too much into that, it, it is going to affect schools because there's school support. But having said that. We already cut hundreds of positions, and we're going to continue to look at efficiencies at, at, at Tweed. I'm and, sorry, and Deputy level. Chancellor. Has the auditor recommended any cuts to those Tweed positions that you mentioned that gets audited each year? So under the, the, the auditors have not recommended central headcount um, reductions specifically, um, but the Chancellor has. And the Chancellor's strong leadership on this topic has resulted in those hundreds of positions being reduced, um, in addition to other positions, hundreds that were reduced over the last couple of years. And my last question that wasn't answered was surrounding the IEPs. Okay. So that should not happen. IEPs should not be changed 
Um, and that kind of issue is exactly what we would be looking at as we look at the budget appeals process. We want to make sure that legal mandates are met. They should not be reducing services on an IEP to match their budget. In addition, IEP services that are outside of classroom instruction, like a one-to-one -one para or related services like speech PT and OT are funded outside of the fair student funding formula. So that means that they're funded in addition to and they're funded on the mandates that are existing um, with the students in their building annually. That's not what's happening in the schools. And of course, we're seeing loss of services as a result. So is there a commitment that if members reach out and give you specific schools that you will find the funding to make sure this service is actually being provided? So I would say I think on behalf of our special ed team, we'd be very interested in understanding which schools um, specifically you see that happening in so we can follow up directly. Can we have a commitment, please? Thank you. Councilmember Menon. Thank you so much. I first of all want to thank the chairs and the speaker for this important hearing. So we've spent a lot of time talking about the loss of federal stimulus funding, but what we haven't talked about is the money that New York City receives from the federal government. So I, that's non-stimulus. So I served as the city's 2020 census director. So I can say firsthand that not only did New York City grow by over 600,000 people in the last decade, but we as a city finished number one among all major cities across the country. And I'm mentioning that because that means that we receive a larger piece of the pie on federal funding for education. So from 2010 to 2020, we received over $700 million a year in Title I funds. We received per year $1.5 billion in total in federal education funds. Now, because of the 2020 census, we're going to receive even more than that over the next 10 years. So my fundamental question is, why isn't the administration allocating that pot of money when we know it's going to be more each and every year for the next 10 years to make up the $215 million shortfall? Um, thank you, Council Member, for the question. Title I funding is designed to be supplemental. It's required by federal law to provide supplemental services, and it cannot supplant funding. Um, and so it cannot be used in that way. I understand that, but since you know that you're going to be receiving a larger share proportion than DOE received in the past decade, you know that that's coming in. Why can't you make an adjustment in another part of the budget to allocate $215 million? You know you're having more federal funding for, because of the census, so that's you know, irrefutable that you're getting more money. So I'm not saying use the Title I funds. What I'm saying is since you are going to be getting a larger piece of the pie than we received in the last decade, why not find another line item to take the $215 million from? So again, any federal funding like Title I, Title II, Title III, Title IV is in our budget. It's allocated to schools. It's in addition to the fair student funding formula dollars in discussion. Yeah, I, I understand. That's not my question. My question is we're getting more federal funds, uh, so we should be then reallocating from another part of the budget. So again, the federal funds, including stimulus dollars, have to provide supplemental services. We have to make sure that we follow federal rules around avoiding supplantation. Okay, I'm, I'm, I'm going to move on because I asked my question. So I'm very concerned about the enrollment data. I want to push back on this idea that there is this dialogue with the principals. That's certainly not what I'm hearing on the ground. I spoke with one principal this morning who has a school that has 450 students currently. They received um, direction from DOE that their enrollment is going to drop to 300. They have spoken to every family in the school and they have shown that actually enrollment is 395. So that's one of many examples I could give. So my fundamental question is, how are you working with these principals? It just, how are you calculating the enrollment data? Are you doing regular surveys to families? Is it in multiple languages? Because it just seems there are wide discrepancies that I'm hearing from the principals. You know, the, the, this, first of all, please, uh, council member, feel free to, to get us information on the individual schools you're hearing from, because I don't all, uh, at all preclude the possibility that, um, you know, in some cases uh, uh, there should be adjustments and they haven't been made, so please let us know. But to your larger point, uh, they're, you know, the enrollment folks are looking at demographic trends. They're looking at things like applicate, number of applications in the case of high school and middle school and kindergarten. They're looking at uh, the census trends, actually. They're, they're not doing surveys to, to all families, but they are going back and forth with, with principals uh, about what, they, what principals are seeing. 
Now again, if, if, if uh, you have a principal who's taken the initiative, which I love, by the way, to poll every single family in his or her building, that's information we should be acting on. So I would love to, to dig more into that. Okay. Um, given the decreasing enrollment numbers, wouldn't this be an opportunity to revisit some of the restrictive zoning rules that are negatively impacting diversity? So my specific question is on high-performing schools, wouldn't this then be an opportunity to open up seats in some of these schools to more students? Uh, Yes, uh, th that's something absolutely. That when I when I talk about the uh, the plans that we're going to expect superintendents to have to meet the needs of families, we have lots and lots of high demand schools all over the city, all over the city in every district that don't have enough seats to to meet the demand. One of one of the components of the plan would be, how can you expand the the seats? How can you potentially uh, create? Uh, a paired school uh, that uh, you know provides the same level of, of quality the families want and basically uses the brand of that initial school so certainly zoning as, as you know council member is a very uh, rezoning is a very uh, heavily regulated process and so that you know th that's certainly on the table but that has to go through a, a legal process before the zone is changed okay thank you thank you council member council member de la rosa thank you chair um, first, I want to address a few things that I heard here today. Um, when talking about the cuts, the words, it's not a good thing, was acknowledged by the DOE. From where I'm sitting, it feels unnecessary. Not just like it's not a good thing, it feels completely unnecessary, given the fact that we have money in the reserves, we have money in the rainy day funds, and so I'm going to re-ask the question, why is this cut going to happen when we are touting historic investments in our reserves? And I uh, appreciate the question very much, Council Member. Um, you know, we, we at least as, at, at the Department of Education, we're dealing with the, the, the budget that was adopted, the budget we are given. I hear you about reserves and so forth. That's something we can take back to our colleagues at uh, both uh, City Hall and, and OMB. But, you know, we have to operate within the budget that, that we are. We are well, I will say that this is a poison pill in that budget that was adopted. And I will also say that uh, one of the things that was also mentioned is we cannot avoid reality. I want to talk to you about the reality that we cannot avoid in our districts. I represent District 6, School District 6, that has been historically underinvested for decades. And some of the realities that we cannot avoid is that we are having 32 out of 41 schools being cut in this budget, that our schools, I just got a notice from my daughter's school yesterday that there's a positive COVID uh, person in, in the school building. So we are continuing to get these notices about positive COVID in our schools, and this money is supposed to be cushioning continuous waves of COVID that are still here. So that cushion should remain in place until at the very least these notices stop coming to our emails. I also want to say that in my district, we have had an uh, enrollment issue for a very long time. The state happened to pass legislation, much fought for by people in this room, to adjust, finally, class sizes. In my district, in District 10, all of the, the temporary trailer structures in Manhattan are in District 10, all of them. How are we adjusting how are we preparing to adjust these school budgets when we have a capacity issue, when we have a historic uninvestment issue, and when, as we are preparing to receive this much needed state mandate, we are cutting these budgets by $215 million, which is a fraction of our city budget at this moment. Um, I will try, try to be responsive and let me know, Council Member mm -hmm. De La Rosa, if, 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 I'm, if I'm not um, not being responsive. Uh, certainly, I understand in District, you know, District Six, you've got schools that are over capacity. I know that there are still, um, you know, trailers, and while um, you know we work with our colleagues at School Construction Authority to get most of those trailers removed and permanent structures put, I know that there are still some. All of them in Manhattan yeah. are in Northern Manhattan. Understood. What are we saying to the kids in Northern Manhattan 
that they are still studying in trailers. Yes, uh, so, so I w would love to talk to you with our, our uh, friends at School Construction to talk about that issue. It's a very important issue and, and I, I'm, I'm aware of it and we're working on it and we wanna get those removed as, as soon as possible. Beyond that ab about class size, obviously, um, you know, assuming the law is, is enacted, um, you know, we will comply with the law, and we've got folks working on that, that planning now to, to uh, make sure we're ready to, to comply. Well, um, I will just say yeah. that given the planning that's happened here, there is little faith that this will go off in the way that is needed after years of a fight to make sure that class sizes are reduced. I'm gonna move on. I wanna ask about English language learners. Um, one of the things that I know that is happening in my district is that although mandated services are being covered, there are extra things that are needed, like literacy coaches, that those decisions are now at, on the table, on the chopping block for many schools in the district. So for you know populations that need the extra supports, what is the planning that the DOE at this moment is telling these principals, besides excess teachers, for these students to be able to thrive? And the reason that it's important is because this enrollment crisis that we're in is because of the divestment in allowing those schools to actually turn things around and have the resources to turn, turn things around in order to attract more students. It's a self-fulfilling prophecy. No one wants to go to these schools because they don't have the resources to turn things around and therefore people are not enrolling. So what, are, what, are the, what is the plan for that issue? Uh, first of all, happy to come back with our, our colleagues from Teaching and Learning to talk specifically about the programming for English language learners uh, uh, to, because I think we are doing some exciting work there and are doing everything we can, as Lindsay talked about, to continue investments there. So, uh, but, you know, I, I don't want to give uh, details uh, without having the, the, the folks who really know the, the, the work well. Uh, One final before. question. Yes. I was handed a, a chart from one of the advocates in my community, a parent. And she pointed out that the enrollment changes that she was able to get from the online information that's available on enrollment doesn't match the change in the cut. Can you account for uh, discrepancies between the um, enrollments of the last two uh, academic years and the, pers the corresponding cut? I uh, just want to make sure I understand. So there's a discrepancy uh, between the enrollment that yes. it shows online and the enrollment that is projected? The percentage okay. of, this, of this cut. So for example, I'll give you an example. So for example, in my district, PS 189, for the 2021-22 school year, had 489 um, enrolled students. For the 2022-2021 school year, 566, right? Um, the, the change is 13.6%, and this cut that is reflected here, which is about uh, $2 million, is a 21% cut. So what makes up those type of discrepancies? So I think we would be happy to take a look at that um, particular example, but one of the things that I think is important to remember looking at the year-over-year -year reductions, and there's a, there's a lot of advocates talking about this, is that the FY22 budget, the one that the school year that's ending um, on Monday, represents a full year budget. It also represents record high levels of federal stimulus funding being in schools, and so comparing that to initial budgets that were just released a few weeks ago is not really an accurate comparison. Um, in addition, there was over $100 million in one-time pandemic-related um, allocations to schools that were made in fiscal year 22, things to support um, social distancing, to support specific deals um, made, uh, made with our labor partners, vax mandates, all sorts of things that we do not plan to need in fiscal year 23. Um, in addition, the academic recovery supports, that was a $350 million school allocation in this school year. It is planned to be reduced to $125 million this year. So including those things um, which were we knew were either one-time allocations or we had planned to decline, I think is in what is calculated as a cut might be a little bit, bit misleading. Thank you real quick, um, speak, Madam Speaker. 
I'm sorry, I'm just going to interject because this, the, the, the questions are repetitive from what we've been hearing for the past three hours now, and it seems like we're kind of going in, in circles. I believe uh, Councilmember Brewer asked a question that was similar um, in the data just not matching. And um, if we can get a little bit more granular as to why we're finding that in more than one arena, uh, more, more than one document, more than one space, why this, why this data is so different in different places, why information is so different in different spaces, and where and when will we get, get accurate information when it comes to these cuts in our schools. We're looking at explanations of equity in districts. Councilmember Shulman's district is 29 minus 28. There is no equity. Um, in, 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 in the way that uh, these cuts were delivered. So we're, we're looking for accurate data. We want to know where we find it and why we are finding so much disparity in, in the data and in the information that's being given to us and given to teachers. I, the advocates' reports that I've seen all use different methodologies to calculate the differences in, in the reductions between year over year. And so I can't speak to all of those methodologies, but there's a lot of different ways to calculate it, whether you're looking at the entire budget from fiscal year 22 compared to preliminary numbers, or you're just looking at the fair student funding allocations like the UFT did. We are happy to provide you with additional information to make sure that we clarify this issue. So is the explanation because the data is coming from different places? and not in one general location. I can't speak to the advocates' reports. Okay. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Um, Council Member Shulman. Thank you very much. Um, I want to thank the chairs, uh, Rita Joseph and Gail Brewer, and um, the leadership of our speaker, Adrian Adams. Our kids only get one chance at a good education, and the cuts by the Department of Education uh, are cutting that away. Um, I will tell you, I have 18 schools in my district. We're losing $11 million. Three schools are losing over $1 million. And I'm being told, I met with the principals yesterday. I'm very angry about this. I met with the principals yesterday, and they pretty much told me that they have to do away with anything that's, that is a program other than the basics of math and reading. Um, one school said they had to get rid of their restorative justice program. Um, and arts programs and music programs. And so that is very unacceptable. I have a question related to the enrollment piece with a little bit of different context. So I want to know how the uh, enrollment is determined, and I'll tell you why I'm asking that, because I was told in this meeting I had with, our principal, with my principals yesterday that the enrollment is based on a two-year projection. That two-year projection included the COVID years and that a lot of my schools actually have enrollment that's above what has been projected for them, and they made an appeal based on their current projections, and they were told that, um, and they were rebuffed. So I want to know why that happened. And, where, and wh whether you're doing them based on projections that are based on the COVID years, or you're basing them on actual enrollment. Um, I, I would say probably it's both council member projections and actual enrollment. It depends upon whether you're talking about elementary, middle, or high school. The admissions processes are, are different. But look, we'd be happy to look at all that. If you've, got, if you've got schools with actual enrollment, actual enrollment, they have the kids that were actually enrolled for September yes. that yes. exceed the, pro the projection that we're using for budget, please let us know right away and we'll, we'll jump right on that. That okay. actual enrollment should absolutely trump any sort of projection. Um, that's good to know. I want to know how will the DOE adjust its allocations if Governor Hochul signs the bill lowering class sizes and thus requiring the DOE to have a larger number of teachers at each school? So I think we're still thinking about how we would have to adjust the, the, the budgets if uh, Governor Hochul signs that bill. Um, we are very concerned that this is an unfunded mandate, um, and we're very concerned about uh, the ability to be able to implement this. When did you know how much individual school galaxy allocations would be significantly lower than last year? Um, again, this was announced in February as part of the mayor's preliminary budget. And also, I've been told by my principals that because of supply chain issues and all kinds of other things, that they're being told that they have to spend money by March instead of usually having to spend it by April, which is causing 
a real interruption in their budgets. So I want to know, I, I'd like an explanation. So that is, that is an accurate, that's accurate. Um, and the reason why is per gap accounting rules, we have to ensure delivery of services and goods by June 30th. I have a team that actually works with vendors. So we're calling Apple, we're calling Lenovo, we're calling CDW, and we are trying to figure out whether they can actually make these delivery timelines. As you know, worldwide supply chains have been a disaster for the last couple of years. And so we had to advance the purchasing deadlines, unfortunately, this year to ensure delivery of these goods and services by June 30th. We hope that that's something that we can move back to the more normal timeline in the future, but right now because of the supply chain issues and because of the requirements that goods have to be delivered by June 30th, that's what we had to put in place. That would make, that would make a big difference. Now I want to just refer to page 9 in your PowerPoint. You said the budgeting, the budgeting method is called a weighted pupil funding model and pupil needs are weighted. I'm being told by the schools in my district that the weights vary and there's no rhyme or reason to them. So can you explain the weighting of the for the pupils? Yes, absolutely. The weights do vary. They vary based on the needs um, per weight. So we have five different categories of weights with multiple weights within those categories, and the weights are either larger or smaller depending on the cost of the service for the weight. So our largest weight, for example, is for a kindergarten ICT class. There's two teachers in that um, uh, classroom, and so that's why it is the highest weight, and it goes on from there. And how does that affect the budget? So. Um, that affects the amount that a school will receive for those services. At some, I would like to have more of an explanation of the weight and how that affects each of the schools, particularly in my district. And if I can, um, Chair, if I just want to ask, um, I, I just want to say one more thing, which is that I'm being told also that, especially in elementary school, that because of COVID, the younger students, they need, they need more attention because they don't remember what the school experience is like. Um, and as opposed to somebody who's maybe in fifth grade. And so they need more attention, they need more teachers to help them. And so I, I, I want to state that for the record that this budget doesn't allow that. So thank you. Thank you, Council Member. Um, I want to take the time out to um, acknowledge Council Member Nurse, Council Member Osei. Um, Council Member Wan, it's your turn. First, Deputy Chancellor, we have heard over and over again that the FAIR student funding formula is a 15-year-old law which DOE must abide by to justify right-sizing our schools. So despite standing firm behind your justification of abiding by the law, the DOE has failed to reform the FAIR student funding formula since you were legally bound to implement this by local law since January 2019. <laughs> that was your due date. And you've also failed to abide by the court order of campaign for fiscal equity versus state of New York to provide a sound basic education with smaller class sizes since 2007. I want to set the record straight. This is not, when you talk about the school class sizes cap, that is not an unfunded mandate. According to the law which passed in 2007, this is a pre-funded mandate because we were given $1.6 billion additional with foundational aid to abide by the court order, which they defined as having smaller class sizes to have a sound basic education. So the DOE should not be cherry picking what laws you want to hold uphold and which ones you want to slide by. So this makes me believe this is clearly a budgetary choice that you have made. We are being told to wait until November modifications for the $215 million deficit or the difference or the adjustment, whatever you want to call it, of the DOE budget, which is two thirds of a percent. So the truth is we actually don't even need a budget modification to have this re restored for us. So I don't buy that modification anymore. And with the 1.6 billion additional provided foundational aid that we have to abide by the court order, could you explain your logic to me to ensure that the excessive class sizes that we're going to see in our classrooms, especially for schools like mine, with severe low-income students, are going to make sure that we don't have that with teachers being accessed as a result of this funding cut? So uh, thank you, Council Member. I'll, I'll start, maybe uh, Lindsay can, can add in. Uh, I would respectfully uh, push back on the idea that this is pre-funded. Uh, also take issue with the uh, figure you used around foundation aid. Cool. The increased foundation aid, and there has been an increase, we're in year two of a hopefully a three-year uh, projection, uh, where the state 
this, the CFP decision, as, as we know, applied to the state, the state's obligations under the New York State Constitution, of course, as you say, to provide a sound basic education. They are finally, finally taking steps to fully fund, uh, but they haven't, they have not by any stretch satisfied that yet. Just, just to, I'm sorry, just to make, make one point if I could, and then, and then I'll, I'll, I'll uh, yield my time. Um, the only reason we are at 100% of fair student funding formula. The only reason that each school is getting 100% of that formula is because of the increased foundation aid plus some stimulus uh, that allowed us to get there. It's already in school budgets. So if we have to hire thousands of more teachers without additional funding to hire those teachers, then that's gonna require cuts elsewhere and frankly, I'm not sure where that would come from. Could you disclose the last two fiscal cycles of the charter school budgets? I know that this upcoming cycle has $3 billion. I don't have the last two figures off the top of my head. We can certainly provide that for you. Could you confirm or, or say that there is an increase in charter school budget this year? Do you know yeah. by how much? The charter school budget was increased this year, yeah. That's correct. I'm here to stand for public schools, and $214 million from $3 billion is not much. But I want to ask my last question on enrollment data and forecasting. Over 120,000 students have left our public school system. This is alarming to all of us here. What have you done to identify the trends in the cause of drop in enrollment? And is this information public? And these children from our neighborhoods across the grades that have disappeared, did you provide an exit survey? What are you doing as DOE to ensure that children are not just disappearing into thin air? It's a great question. Thank you, council member. And I would say uh, quickly that we have done some data analysis and some exit surveys, which I'm, we're happy to share all the data that we have on the, in the trends, uh, including the, uh, what we've heard from parents. But in my view, we have not done nearly enough to talk to the parents, both who are deciding to enroll students elsewhere or leaving our schools. So we have much more to do, but we're happy to share what we have. Could you give us an anecdote or a summary of what the top trends are? Because for me, when I look at my school data, which was provided to me after the vote, is that it shows me that the schools in the wealthiest parts of my district are fine. They're actually having an, ac they're having an abundance of student enrollment. Yet in the poorest areas, like Queensbridge and Ravenswood houses, where for those schools that serve my black and brown students are seeing a drop in enrollment. And they have seen hundreds of students disappear. Could you help me understand what's happening? Uh, difficult to, to do uh, quickly, happy to set up a briefing and, 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 and uh, uh, with, with you and any other members who are interested. Um, I will just say that we do see differences. What you're pointing out is, is absolutely squares with, with our data. We see differences by demographic, uh, certainly in terms of, in some demographics, you see more uh, families, for example, who are homeschooling kids. In some de demographics, you see more families moving to private schools. In some demographics, you see more families moving outside the city. I know that this has already been said by the advocates, but the fair student funding formula is going to continue to disempower our most vulnerable communities, and it is not okay that we have not reformed it despite the 2019 law that we have called for reform of fair student funding formula. Because if we, it was done on time, we would not be sitting in these chairs right now having this conversation. I yield my time, thank you. Thank you, Council Member. Council Member Aviles. Hi, can you hear me now? Great, thank you. Um, so I too, like many of my colleagues, am a public school parent um, who has spent many nights up till 3 a.m. trying to make cupcakes to fundraise for equipment that should have been in schools but was not. Um, it is clear that this budgeting process for the schools is supremely broken and doesn't line up with the needs and realities of schools. In particular, we see it hasn't been properly acknowledged that we are still in a pandemic. And while these cuts are related to enrollment numbers that we have seen been going down, I'm supremely curious around how equity was factored into any of these cuts. We knew these cuts were coming, as you mentioned earlier, in the preliminary budget. How did you factor equity into that calculus? 
And I would say in a couple of ways, council member, thank you for the, the, the question. If you look um, at our presentation on you know pages six and, and seven, uh, some of this is through things like 3K expansion, which are focused on uh, underserved communities, summarizing the same, for example, where we are pri prioritizing our students who live in temporary housing. So there's particular programming investments that we are making. Lindsay talked about the investments we're making for English language learners. So uh, equity showed up there. The, the formula, the fair student funding formula, which again, uh, you know, uh, we have said, we are looking forward to seeing how we can imp uh, improve it. It does direct greater funding, greater funding to students with disabilities, to English language learners, to students in poverty, to students who are behind academically. So being able to fund that 100%, while I'm not saying that means the, the work is over, that does, and I, I, I can tell you as a longtime veteran, <clears throat> the way schools used to be funded prior to FSF, if you think FSF doesn't do a good job, did a, uh, a far worse job at directing the funds towards uh, uh, chronically underserved kids. So there's a few ways in which we are looking, looking at equity, but uh, that job is definitely so, not finished. So m many of my conversations with the principals in my district, which has been um, significantly impacted, where we are still suffering the impacts of a pandemic in an immigrant community, where these cuts are not just um, accessing teachers, they're accessing parents, they're accessing exactly the type of staff that we need to support the crisis that we are in, particularly counselors and, and other staff members and programs to get academic recovery happening. Can we see a spreadsheet of uh, the, initial, the initial register projections that are done in December, the January appeals that are done thereafter by principals, and then the final projection determinations because the ongoing aggressive lowballing of projections is a constant problem, and particularly egregious given given how many students we have lost over these years. Uh, Council Member, I'm happy to provide that to you. I just want to make sure um, uh, getting you the right information you're talking about around enrollment. The, yes. Okay. Yes, we, we, we'd be happy to get that to you. Also, you mentioned that social workers and guidance counselors are funded through the federal stimulus. Uh, we know that the promises to add social workers were only given to schools um, that if schools added their own through separate funding, they were not given social workers. Can you tell me what plans are being made to maintain the continued staffing um, of social workers in schools given the needed resources and how stimulus funding is being depleted? Uh, thank you for that question. We are certainly going to be working with our city partners, including this body, to advocate for additional resources to support the mental health providers in our schools, social workers, guidance counselors, um, when stimulus funding runs out. I, I guess I'll just lastly add, since I know there are many other questions still, um, these these cuts are also impacting the provision of social uh, of of guidance counselors and social workers in schools as schools are now having, and I've mentioned to my colleagues before, and as you mentioned in your testimony, these are cumulative cuts. It is reductions in Title I, reductions in other streams. It is uh, a cumulative injury to our students and principals who are trying their best to, quite frankly, extract blood from a stone and make magic, which they have been doing in low-income communities for years, which is wholly unnecessary. Um, I guess with that, I yield my time. Thank you. Um, Council Member Genowitz. Am I out of time already? <laughs> um, good afternoon. Uh, I, I, my first question is about enrollment. Because um, in your testimony, you've said we've seen a drop in enrollment. But in so many of my schools, I just want to clarify the language, the, the projected enrollment has dropped. But these projections are very, very wrong. And just two examples, I have one high school in my district, you projected them at 56 students, they have 106 students they've accepted plus a wait list. Another school projected at 104, and they've sent out acceptance letters to 143 students. And this is, this is a pattern. This is happening at school after school. And the problem 
The problem is that schools are now making decisions about next year based on flawed numbers that you are giving them this year. And the reality is in a system where you want uh, parents to understand how great the programming is, um, you know, I've I've, I go to schools, they always show off their debate team, they show off their music class, they show off the arts, they show off their wellness classes, the, the, the restorative justice programs, yet when they receive budget like, budgets like this, which are the first things to go? It's those very programs that we know get our students through the pandemic, that got so many of us through the pandemic, that we actually care about, that the schools show off. And it provides a level of instability to just say that, oh, well, the teachers, to view the teachers as lines on a spreadsheet, because that is not the reality of, um, of that's not the experiences of parents and students. These are people who are part of a school community. And so, and so who are the, uh, I'll call them mathematicians, who are the mathematicians, the statisticians at the DOE who are doing these, uh, these projections and why are they so undercounting so many of our schools? Yeah, thank you, Council Member. And, and uh, look again, actual actual enrollment, as you're discussing, you know, should trump whatever projections we have. And and that's that's true, by the way. In, in the cases of the schools you're talking about, um, it's it's in June, uh, but you know that will happen right up until September and even up to uh, the the end of October. So please get me that information. Uh, who, in the answer to your question. These are, our, these are our enrollment folks. And again, they don't have crystal balls. They're looking at a bunch of data and doing their best to, to project. Um, sounds like in these cases, they, they got it wrong. So we, and and the, the positive news is we don't have to wait till September. We don't have to wait till October. These are adjustments that uh, Lindsay's office is making in June and July. Right, but respectfully, it sounds like they got a lot of the schools wrong and which and which I, I appreciate you saying, I'll get you the names of the schools, I appreciate that, but it's not about me and the connections I have to some schools and the connections the principal knows me, it's about a systemic issue of schools being undercounted and making decisions that are detrimental to the future of their schools and the future of the, of the lives of our children. And I'll, I'll just tell you, for, for 14 years in the classroom and for over a year as an elected official, it has always felt like the DOE was so out of touch with the realities that we face as parents and educators and elected officials with those in our community that we see people and the DOE sees lines on a spreadsheet, they see school A and school B. Um, I am still very hopeful that that will change during this administration uh, because the, the very things that you say that we agree upon that are gonna attract people to our schools are the first things to get cut. And, Dealing with the out of, how out of touch the DOE administration has been during my career as a teacher and an elected official, um, I, I am surprised that you are surprised that schools are changing IEPs based on budgets because that's the reality of school after school. And if you go to any school, any principal who's not afraid of losing their job or a teacher will tell you that they may be instructed to change students' IEPs to ICT because according to the fair student funding formula, the school gets like 7,000 something dollars for a kid in ICT, whereas in self-contained they may get $5,000. Or a kid in a resource room, I think it's like $2,000, right? So schools financially, based on the formula that you're using, are incentivized to push students in either into a more or less restrictive environment than that child needs. That, that, and that is the enormous pressure that our principals uh, are, are facing due to these budget cuts. And again, is this, during this hearing, this is the first time you're hearing that, that schools are changing IEPs? I think what Lindsay said is that shouldn't happen, uh, that, that should not happen. So, so, uh, uh, so, so, listen. This is a, a councilman, and, and and look, I, you know, you, you know, I respect and honor your years in the classroom, and your insight me, means a lot. Um, the, the, I hear what you're saying about incentives uh, based on funding. This is not unique to New York. This exists all over, you know, public schools all over the country. Um, what happens when you attempt to direct more funding? Obviously, but I'll just state it. When you attempt to direct more funding to the students who need that funding, 
like students uh, with IEPs or English language learners, you're going to create those incentives. So this is one of the things we, we, have to, uh, we have to look at to see how we're not creating the wrong incentives. At the same time, we're pushing the funding where it's really needed. Well, look, uh, this will be the last thing I say, Chair, and thank you, Chair Joseph and Brewer, is throughout my entire career, and especially during the pandemic, day after day, principals and teachers just had to figure it out. We were given less and less, and we just, we just figured it out. Um, and very often the DOE was a stumbling block. I think now what you're hearing is we would like the DOE to figure out how to fund our schools properly. Thank you, Council Member. Thank you, Council Member. Council Member Williams? Sorry, Council Member Narcisse. Good afternoon. Thank you, Chair Rita Joseph and um, Gail Brewer. Thank you, Chairs, for giving me the opportunity to be here. And um, I have a lot of questions. I am a mom of four. I'm not an educator. I am, I can say I'm an educator to some level, but not in the classroom. Um, as a mom of four, I see and I realize that I don't have millions of dollars to leave my children. All I can give them is the best quality education. And I have a few things because I've been going to all the graduation and seeing the faces and hoping that we can provide the best education to those children. Before I get to anything, I want to say, I want to ask you a question. Is the plan is to have, continue with public school or to private school? Council member, we are the New York City Public Schools, and that's who we, that's who we support, and that's who we will con continue to support. I certainly hope so, because we're supposed to be the role model. We're talking about New York City. We see what happened with um, Wave, I mean, Roe versus Wade today, but I'm expect us in New York City to be open up to make sure that we stand on what we believe, to make sure this is a land of immigrants, opportunity, whatever the Statue of Liberty stands for, that's what we have to provide. We have to provide quality education for our children here. I want to make sure the enrollment. What happened? Is that COVID that caused um, the decrease in enrollment? Do you have the data? Do you, I mean, do you keep accurate data? Yes, Council Member. Uh, COVID, the sort of two years of the pandemic, definitely accelerated the declines, but they really started several years before uh, before that. So the declines began to happen and then got more steep. Happy to share that uh, that information with you. All right, uh, but the charter school is thriving, by the way. Those eight, <laughs> um, I realize in here. Those educators will stay in our system and have the opportunity to find job in other schools that so enrollment increase, right? Increases. I love that. But one thing I'm gonna tell you I don't like, because it's still gonna be a problem. Our kids is not, the educators will not have a chance to build with those children that they know. So that's a problem for me. And I think it's a problem for most of us here. Um, we made an increase as a city council member, as city council members under the leadership of our great speaker, Adrian Adams, $700 um, million, but it's not enough. It's just a drop in the bucket. We understand that, but that's the first time we make that step, historic step that we took, right? Because we understand and we, sh we have the, our chair that's educated for so many years in school that keep us in check. So in so many parents, we want the best quality education, not only for our children, but for those that come so we can count on them for later on. So how our, our federal, I mean federal dollars are being allocated? Can it be transparent? Can we know where our money goes? Y yes, ma'am. Uh, we, we have some, I, I don't know if you were able to take a look, we're, we're happy to go back over it, uh, some detail about where the federal, fund, the federal stimulus funding went to. Uh, and we're happy to, to give you a briefing if that would be helpful to give you uh, more detail. If I would love that. Quality education, when we say quality education, when I'm looking at the classroom, you have 32 children per one teacher. That teacher have five classes when I multiply, because number don't lie. You have about 160 
um, tests, if they give a quiz or exam, you have 160. So how the teacher gonna go home and check all those children and then coming back to give positive reinforcement? It's almost impossible. So class size matter. So we're looking forward, if we wanna keep public school in New York City, to be bringing the equity we're talking about all the time, and especially in my district, we're talking about 46 districts, which I pre represent Canarsie, Flatlands area. We're in dying, need, I mean, dying needs of opportunity and programs in our school building. I have to force every penny that I have, I have to go at nighttime counting every cent to see how I can bring equity in the classroom, because I know most parents out there don't have anything to leave their children but education. So I'm looking forward to see how we can have that class size address and enrollment address and have full transparency in the dollar that we're contributing to education for our children. So thank you for your time and I'm looking forward for the best of New York City. Thank you. Th thank you very much, Council Member. Thank you, Council Member. Council Member Williams. Hello. Um, so I have been doing a lot of tours and I've pretty much visited almost all the schools in my district so I have a sense of what is missing and I want to say that I understand this is a new administration and you probably inherited a lot of this mess. Um, so the first thing I want to ask is about schools with deficits. I have a few schools um, that essentially owe debt and one school in particular, PS 118, 27% of their funding is cut. And so I just want to know, um, in addition to what everyone has been saying, schools that specifically already sort of owe the DOE, how are you accounting for those schools with the additional cuts? Those schools are not required to pay back the deficits they owe. Are you sure? Because I've met with principals and they all tell me that they're unable to hire different teachers, um, math tutors, art teachers, because their budget is restricted by previous, again, quote unquote, debt, if you will, to DOE. So I'm, we can follow up because it's a specific question, but to tell a school that told me literally two months ago that they can't hire a music teacher because of a debt, and then that, that specific school is getting cut additional 27% is alarming. Happy to look into that specific school. Okay, um, the next question I have is about the funding vacancies. Um, you mentioned it a lot, but can you explain exactly what type of positions would be available in a funding vacancy? Like, what does that look like? Yeah, so, the, you know, that could be certainly a teacher, and a, uh, as we know, uh, you know, there, there can be uh, different types of teachers, special education teachers, et cetera. Um, and so based on the enrollment, a school will be funded for a certain number of teaching positions, but also, um, you know, funding that can be used for nurses, social workers, et cetera, um, school aides, paraprofessionals, certainly. And those come from different funding streams, but without getting too complicated. So you will have um, the ability to hire for those positions if they're vacant. So may, you know, and that happens a couple of different ways. Maybe you gain students, so you got additional funding, and you, in order to accommodate those students and serve them, you have to make additional hiring, or you have um, some of your teachers or other staff who left, and so there are vacancies behind that. Again, you have to go and post that vacancy on a central system get applications, do interviews with your teachers, I'm saying you as a principal, with your, with, with your teachers, and then make the, make the selection. And so it, it could be any one of a number of titles. We're talking a lot about teachers because they're so critical, but that, that's true really. It's the same basic system with, with, with uh, all of our staff. So I know that positions have to be posted, but do you have a sense or an inventory on how many vacancies will be available because it is perceived that there is more or will be more excess teachers than funding vacancies available. Yeah, that should definitely, uh, council member, I, un I understand the concern. Mm -hmm. That should definitely not happen. I can't give you the number of vacancies yet because this is the process Lindsay's talking about. Principals right now, actually, as, as we speak and you know through the end of the month, are sitting with their budget people and and what we call scheduling the, the, their budget, meaning like they're, they're putting their budget into the system, including the vacancy. So we don't have that number yet, but it's, it's going to be, I would say, conservatively several times the number of excess teachers. Okay. And 
is your office directly working with principals to sort of reconcile this? Because one thing I noticed in visiting the principals is it's, it's like they're the CEO of their own school, right? Um, which means that either they have to proactively go seek the help, um, but I don't really see it being rolled back down. So I'm just wondering if your office, because of these cuts, are proactively working with schools to figure this out. So, so before Lindsay answers, because yes, there are specific budget people, there are HR people who are assigned to schools and principals. And a lot of times they have longstanding relationships. We actually, that was one of the things we didn't want to touch because of those relationships. But I want to say first, we don't think this is operating perfectly at all. Like, you know, this is something the chancellor has been very clear. We are looking top to bottom in every single office. And the ones that are serving principals, school, school staff, um, we, we want to make sure there are clear commitments to good service for them because it is not consistent. We have some great people doing that work, but it's not consistent. And the ones who are serving family and community, same thing, clear commitments to really good service. So, but, but Lindsay can talk about the, the, the support that is there. Um, thank you. Yeah, I, I couldn't have said it better. We do have teams that work very closely on a day-to-day -day basis with their principals. Um, and they work throughout the month of June and throughout the summer to ensure that they're programming their budgets and making those appeals that we've discussed previously. Okay. Thank you, chairs. And I look forward to working with you all to figure out how to address this in my district. Thank S you. Same here. Thank you very much, council member. Thank you, Council Member. Council Member Feliz. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, uh, Speaker Adams and Chairs Joseph and Brewer and all of my colleagues for this very important hearing. Let me start by emphasizing how disappointing and problematic these budget cuts are. I represent one of the neediest districts in the Bronx and the neediest regions in my district. The neediest schools are the ones receiving the biggest budget cuts. Um, just curious, has the Department of Education done an analysis on the impact that these cuts will have on the quality of education provided to our students? I can't say we've done a specific analysis, Council Member, uh, but you know, obviously we're aware that where their enrollment declines, uh, again, there are going to have to be some hard choices made. And to your knowledge, what will be the impact of these budget cuts? on the issue of quality of education for our students. I mean, it, it, it's, it's what you and, and your colleagues have been talking about. In schools where they have seen declines and, and the budget is reduced, they're, they're having to, you know, in some cases, excess teachers, redeploy teachers and, uh, and other staff, and th there will be programming changes. And again, th this is, I'm not here to tell you this is a good thing at all. This is not a good, this is not what we want. We want to reverse that. So we're talking in future years about increasing budgets and increasing enrollment. But uh, this, is, this is producing some hard choices across the city. Now that always happened, council member, in schools that lost enrollment. This is not a new concept. What's new is it's happening in more schools more deeply across the city. And yes, that is very unfortunate as the chancellor has been talking about since day one. Yeah, so there's been a decline in student enrollment. To your knowledge and based on the many conversations you've had, what would you say are the top five factors enrollment is down? I know you mentioned a few of them, including COVID. Um, what, would you, what would you say are the top five reasons? Yeah, and, and I'm, I'm gonna I definitely, I wanna answer your question, but I hope I can come back and answer it with much better data, because this is what we plan to do over the next six months to a year, yeah. is do much more talking to those families. Again, the ones who decide to leave, the ones who are s still here, but maybe thinking about whether they're gonna enroll their kid maybe in a parochial school, et cetera. Uh, but so based I on hope, what you know now, based well, on Based on what I know now, I'd, I'd say there, there are, um, uh, several factors. So some, again, beyond our control. Some families are moving out of the city altogether. I think a lot of that is due to, to the cost of living uh, that I know is something the council is very, very concerned about. Uh, some of it has to do with the um, choices that exist, particularly at the middle and high school level, and parents feeling like they don't have certainty that their child is going to be in a school that they have confidence in. And so that's an issue of scarcity that the, the chancellor has talked about. That comes up again and again. Sometimes it, it is about um, 
um, frankly, bad experiences that, that students have had and uh, parents not feeling that their student is either physically or emotionally safe. So the, the reasons are, are all over. Some of them are not school specific. Many of them are, and the, 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 the things that are school specific, that's what we got to address. So what are we going to do differently? Um, it seems like the neediest schools in the entire state you mentioned earlier are the ones receiving the largest budget cuts. What are we going to be doing differently so that we could start restoring that trust and we could also be providing that quality education that these students deserve and need? Yeah, and again, yeah, I mean, I think that that is the that is a sixty-four thousand dollar question, Council Member. I think that's exactly the right question. I would, you know, love at some point to hear your answer to that. What you know, and, and the answers of your colleagues. What what can we do that's going to be most effective uh, to restore that trust? But again, I think it comes back to you have to have leadership, which is selected because they are invested in listening and community engagement. You have to actually get out there and talk to people directly and through community organizations, and then you have to respond to that. So I'm sure you could tell me, council member, maybe you'll, you, you'd be generous to, to do that for us. You know, what are the top five things you're hearing from families that they're not getting now that they want to get from their public schools? And then within the resource constraints we have, the job mainly of principals and superintendents, but also us and, and the chancellor, is how do we provide that? Yeah. Has anything been done, though, to restore that trust? Have any conversations on any initiatives or plan uh, started? I, you know, again, you're probably better placed to answer that question, but I would say yes. I think we have begun to, begun to create trust. Part of that is just the fact that we've got a chancellor who is everywhere, who is out there at CCs. He's out there talking to town halls that you all uh, have set up. He's out there talking to elected officials. He's out there talking to parents. And what we do here again and again and again is they at least appreciate that he is there, he is listening, and we're trying to follow in that same vein. Uh, Chair Joseph, if I could just ask two final brief questions. Make it brief. Thank you so much. Providing a quality education to every child, but especially to the neediest, ones, the ones in the neediest neighborhoods. Do you think that is something that could be done effectively in the face of these budget cuts? Yes, I do. I think we can do much, much better even with constrained resources. Absolutely. We have to do better. We talked about a sound basic education. So that's what's in the Constitution. We have to do much better than a sound basic education. We should, we should have a world class, I think the Chair Joseph said this, a world class education. So yes, it's harder when you don't have all the resources and the funding you want. We have to be able to do it. And what effect is the budget cuts, uh, are the budget cuts going to have on class sizes? Uh, sorry, that was we, No, we don't, we don't know yet. We're, we're absolutely will share that data uh, as soon as we have it. We don't know yet. Um, but, you know, obviously that's something we're, we're really going to focus on. Yep. Thank you so much. Thank, thank you, Councilman. Thank you. Um, as an educator, I remember that they always say that data drives our instruction and data drives my policymaker as a council member. But today, as we sat and we listened to you, there was a lot of missing data. So I'm hoping and praying that the New York Public School Department, public schools, step up their game in obtaining data because that will also drive your decision. That five years ago, we were losing so many students. Why wasn't it tracked? Why didn't we do better to retain them, that we wouldn't be having this discussion here today? We have to do better. If we promise them a sound education, we must deliver that. Um, I just have a few questions for you. Um, oh, God. Okay. Um, just for the record, can you please tell us the total amount of federal um, COVID-19 stimulus funding that the DOE has currently allocated to use in um, FY23, um, FY24 and the total for FY25, um, and I believe earlier you said that, but um, to make sure that it's correct, I just want to make sure, for the record, the total amount of DOE federal COVID-19 stimulus fund and unspent as of today. Thank you, Chair. So the total amount of funding that the department has received across all fiscal years is 7.65 billion, and we've spent a little over three billion dollars of that funding. Um, and we can provide uh, the stimulus breakout across the fiscal years for you. Okay, thank you. Oh. Council Member Gale. So in 22 and 23 fiscal, the city's state funding increased by over 500 million from the previous year as part of the campaign for fiscal equity, as you know, the lawsuit. And we know 
based on what Governor Hochul has stated, that the city will see an additional increase in FY24. How much is DOE expecting an increased state funds in the next fiscal year? And is there any reason to expect that this increase will be significantly lower than the 500 million? And of course, the reason we're asking this is because we assume that there'll be a large increase in state funding, maybe as much as 500 million. And if we expect that Albany will provide all of these additional dollars for school budgets, why is DOE not able to provide the $215 million question to protect school budgets in fiscal 23? So thank you for the question, Chair Brewer. We um, do anticipate, as you said, the, the third and final year of the commitment to phase in the increase in foundation aid in fiscal year 24. Um, we have, as you point out, not yet received the full three-year phase in. I think in terms of what do we anticipate to see, um, it really depends, obviously, of course, on what is in, whether the state holds their commitment to, in the fiscal year 24 budget, and then also how our enrollment losses impact foundation aid. The foundation aid, um, which is the largest allocation to New York State schools, is also based on enrollment. And so we are concerned that enrollment declines in New York City will ultimately impact the amount of money that we receive from the state. Okay, but it's my opinion that if you continue to keep cutting this year, then the enrollment might go down for the reasons adding to the deputy chancellor's list as to why people are not going to send their school to their, their children here. You've got to have a teacher, and you've got to have a small class. I'm not saying that the governor's bill is going to pass a legislature. I'm not saying, but 32, 33 is too many. And you're combining classrooms right now because you don't have enough teachers. So I wish you would think a little bit differently about this issue. Also, you're going to be hiring 5,000 more teachers. Where is that money coming from? So people leave the system. It's attrition. There's attrition. People retire. People resign. And we have to backfill. And you know for sure it's going to be 5,000. No, we don't know that it's going to be 5,000. Okay. Those are historical numbers, and I think it'll be less this year, but we don't right. really know. You have to find $215 million. I know we talked earlier about the $1.1 billion and all the accruals. I don't know that all of those are going to come through. You can't find some money in that $1.1 billion. Then you add in some of the state money, and then you add in, I would happily find money in this federal money here. I know some of these programs, and you can make them less expensive. $250 million, please. I think we'd welcome your feedback about what things All right, I'll be glad. I'll go line by line. Thank you very much. We are really serious about this money. Thank you. Thank you, um, Council Member um, Shaker. Two minutes. Thank you, Chair Joseph. Uh, my, my question was just, uh, I think before your testimony was that there was a policy change when it came to excess teachers uh, where, uh, because what I'm trying to understand is why the, the teachers who are excess can't be kept in the schools um, and the money that Chair Brewer mentioned or others have mentioned be used to hire new teachers when there's a need for new teachers. So it seems like that was partly a policy decision that was made um, to, to put teachers in the ATR pool. And I'm wondering why exactly that change happened and why here teachers can't be kept in their positions. So um, thank you for the question. I think as I had previously testified, part of um, meeting uh, required reductions in previous administrations was the elimination of the central funding associated with the absent teacher reserve. We do not have a budget to support um, paying these people centrally. And so we need to make sure that those folks go to funded positions elsewhere in the system. And, and you're right, it's a, it was a policy change. I can tell you in, in, you know, in some past years, as the chair has, has talked about, there was funding. And so what, what that would mean is um, you'd have like an extra teacher that wasn't uh, budgeted for in your school who was paid for centrally. And if the world might be different if we still had that, that budget uh, line, but as Lindsay says, that was eliminated you know, in some, some recent year. And so what would stop the department now from reversing that policy change and for, for now keeping teachers in their positions? There is clearly a need for additional funding uh, or additional hires, sorry, uh, but at that moment in time, later in the school year when that comes up, to do it at that moment. What, what is stopping that reversal in policy? Because they're, they're still being paid. Their salaries continue, their benefits continue. So it makes no sense to me why they couldn't be kept in their positions and that policy reversed, that so, internal administrative policy reversed. Yeah, yeah uh, no, no, I, I, I understand the question. Um, 
I mean, literally what's preventing it is we, we, we would need additional funding to do what, what used to happen, again, which used to be there was a pot of money centrally, and if you were uh, in excess and you didn't get hired, it was, you know, you would just get deployed to a school, maybe stay in your school, and it would be paid for centrally. Now, the, the way you might think about it is you have 10 teachers in excess here because of enrollment declines, and then you have 10 vacancies here because of enrollment increases. That's part of our budget. That's in Lindsay's budget uh, to fund these 10 positions based on the students that are in those schools. If you don't move those 10 teachers who are in excess to the 10 vacancies and you just keep them there and then hire from the outside for those 10 vacancies, then you got to fund 10 additional uh, positions, which again, like in, a, in an ideal world, that would be great. We just don't have the budget for that this year. No further questions. I just urge the department to continue both of those, uh, to consider both of those solutions um, as a way to administratively and internally address this issue, as Chair Brewer mentioned, that we do need to address. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Mercedes, real quick. Yeah. Thank you, Chair. Um, you know, it's difficult for a teacher to teach a student that don't speak the language that they speak, right? So what metrics do you use to determine which school can have bilingual? That, that, that's, a, that's a great question. I mean, it, and, and I would love to come back again with our colleagues from Teaching and Learning who, can, who, who uh, oversee those programs, but it starts with student need. So if you have, as, as you do in, in your district council member, if you have a significant number of families that want to see bilingual programs, either because they're speaking a language other than English at home, uh, and they wanna make sure that their babies are, are learning both languages well and getting instruction, or because they just want their, their uh, uh, children to pick up another language, that's, that's when we will provide it, when the demand is there. I will say, just council, something I'm sure you're aware of, um, there are constraints because we have to find the bilingual teachers, and that's one of our shortage areas. We have a lot of areas of shortage for teachers. That's one of them. But this is, this is programming that we are very, very interested in expanding. From my understanding, I think you had a cap, like you have to have a certain amount of students in, in the building before you can have uh, bilingual in the building. I'm happy to check on it. I'm not, I'm not aware of that, but I, I will check on it for sure. All that. right. So that's why we're talking about equity, and I know we're going to keep public school, right? Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you so much to you both today. Um, we still need the follow-up from the 2023 fiscal response letter. So please, um, yeah, we're still waiting for the response for the fiscal 2023 executive budget follow-up letter, which is more than two weeks late. I was not aware of that, but I'm going to check are. on that immediately. And now you are, and I'll yes. be waiting. Th thank you, Chair. Thank you so much for, to both of you. Next panel the next panel coming up thank is you, um, Senator Robert Jackson and Controller Brad Lander and Sunita Subramanian from um, New York City Independent Budget Office. Budget office. Thank you. Welcome to you both. Um. RJ, you may start. Are we? I told her to call you RJ. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. So I was going to say good morning, but good afternoon. Good afternoon. Uh, chair Josephs, uh, I, and I'm happy to say uh, Gail Brewer, uh, the chair, and the council members that are here this afternoon. I was very happy in listening to all of the testimony, and especially since Speaker Adams was here most of the morning and through all of the hearing. Uh, I think that's so important uh, in the finality of what has to be done. 
but let me just thank you for having this oversight investigative hearing. And I'm not going to tell you about my background. Most of you know. If you don't, this, you can just Google me. But directly opposed by schools and union leadership, the city decided to remove millions across all schools due to declining student enrollment. It seems perversive way of penalizing our schools for having a healthier and more appropriate teacher-student ratio. We cannot incentivize keeping our schools overcrowded in exchange for funding. The funding formula for both foundation aid and fair student funding are imperfect and are by no means currently designed to address the deep student needs of this century. The formula is the floor or bare minimum of what the government needs to do to provide students with a sound basic education. Our students deserve more than the minimally required education, and it's our job collectively, both here and up in Albany and in the federal government, to give it to them, especially after more than two years of being in the pandemic. And students in school communities are in greater need every day as they face the consequences of impairing uh, learning during the pandemic, increased gun violence, declining mental health due to trauma, delay in speech, uh, special needs services, continuing food and house, housing insecurity. Eliminating funding because of declining enrollment may sound pragmatic, but in real time, will it, it is already taking place in devastating communities. You hear people talking about it all the time. These are current budget cuts to staff and school programs. In my state Senate district, community school district six, which is Carmen de la Rosa, district five, uh, and District 3 have seen depleted after-school programs, fewer summer rising seats, people are complaining all over the place, and schools with significant IEPs and low-income students seeing cuts as high as 25.6 percent. The mayor's administration is quoted as saying that the decrease is not a cut. Well, if you have all of this money and now you get a little bit more, it's a cut and it bleeds, let me just tell you. And principals and school leadership teams are going to have to reduce uh, what they're doing and talk about the issues of concern. So really, what the bottom line is, I sat through this entire hearing, and you know what needs to be done. Over half of the city council was in these hearings today, over half, including the speaker and the chair of the education and the chair of, of various committees. You're going to have to go to Mayor Adams and say these cuts must be uh, eliminated. No ands, its, or buts. And that's the voice of not only parents, but the voice of members of the City Council of New York. That's what has to be done. And I'm saying that loud and clear, so whatever news is going to report it, Mayor Adams, come and deal with the City Council and put these cuts back in place. Our students need it, especially now during this pandemic. Nothing, no one can tell me that you cannot find $215 million out of a $37.6 billion budget. That's just an education. And if he doesn't want to take it from there, then put some money in from somewhere else. That's what has to be done. And I'm just saying that loud and clear. I'm not ashamed to say it. I'm proud to stand up and fight for the children of New York City. And I, and I will take it to Albany, fighting not only for New York City, but for all of the children. So, chairs, let me thank you for your leadership. Don't be afraid. Stand up and fight back. The time is now. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Jackson. Now we're going to hear from our controller, Brad Lander. Thank you, Madam Chair. My testimony begins good afternoon, but I know it really doesn't feel like a good afternoon. I know today is a grim day to be a woman or a person of color or a public school parent, so I'm going to revise my testimony still. Thank you, Chair Joseph, Chair Brewer, and the members of the Council's Education and Oversight Committee. I appreciate the opportunity to testify today. Thanks also to all the parents and advocates who are out here raising the alarm bell. Uh, I'm going to try briefly to address four key questions that I think more information is and data is needed than what you got from the DOE today. So one, what is actually being cut from school budgets? Unfortunately, it is larger than you heard. Two, what's the status of remaining federal stimulus funding that could be used to fill those gaps on a short-term basis? Three, how should we think about the budget for the long term in light of enrollment decline and the end of stimulus funding? And then four, Chair Brewer, especially to your point, what additional information and transparency do we need from DOE to answer those questions? 
Um, as RJ and many of you have noted throughout the day, as our city emerges from the trauma of the pandemic, our schools desperately need the resources to provide every tool to our students to help them recover and grow out of this pandemic. And that means dedicated, talented, well-trained teachers, counselors, social workers, paraprofessionals that we're fortunate to have here in New York City, as well as programming in arts and science, small class sizes, mental health resources, and all the other essential supports that make our schools the engaging, nurturing, healing, learning spaces we know they can be. So first, what's actually being cut from school budgets? So as you did here, in the preliminary budget back in February, the administration projected there would be a net reduction of $215 million from individual school budgets based on declining and shifting enrollment. But to be more precise, they, they, you know, what they said at the time was uh, the application of the fair student funding formula would otherwise result in net reductions of $375 million, but they would offset it with $160 million in register relief. One other important point, they indicated in the preliminary budget that 83 million of that 215 would come out of fringe benefits and not directly from school budget. So if you're just looking at what was projected in February, it looked like a $132 million cut directly to schools. But if you do your best in the short time allowed to analyze the school budgets made available by DOE this month, you'll see far greater cuts. Calculating the net decline just in fair student funding for that core funding for schools, we now see school in school budgets a net reduction of $372 million, nearly three times the $132 million that they projected back in February. And that's a net number, uh, so it doesn't fully reflect the cuts to individual schools. FSF was originally imagined as a way to shift resources between schools if one shrinks and another grows. That happens still to some extent, but not as much as you might think. Based on enrollment increases, the DOE has provided fair student funding uh, increases to 354 schools. That's about 23%. But with broader enrollment declines, Fair student funding has primarily become a formula that cuts resources to schools. So many more schools, 77% of them, uh, by our calculations, 1,166 are receiving cuts from their FY22 to FY23 budgets for a total, if you just look at those 1,166 schools that are being cut, of $469 million. That's an average fair student funding formula cut of 402,456 across those schools, or on average, 8% of individual school budgets. Roughly 450 of them are getting cuts exceeding 10% of their budgets. Dozens are seeing cuts over 1 million, some, as RJ said, as high as a quarter. Obviously, that type of dramatic decrease is not something an individual school can absorb in one year without drastically impacting the essential services and supports that students receive. Like so many of you talked about today as I've been going to graduations, I've just been asking the principals before I give out the awards, how big's your cut and what are you having to cut? And I know, like all of you, what you hear back is just devastating. This morning, I was in a middle school in the Bronx where the principal said, I'm gonna have to excess three teachers and I'm losing my last art teacher. She said, I used to have five. I had band, chorus, drama, arts, and ceramics. This is the last one for that Bronx Middle School. Yesterday in Queens, a principal told me, um, she's got a great new teacher who set up a lab program that folks from around the district are starting to come and see. But of course, newer teachers are precisely the ones you have to access. So that lab program that they have that's attracting attention is going to be gone. Um, uh, two more notes here. First, it is true, as the mayor indicated, that city tax levy funding for the Department of Education overall increased this year by about 6%. Uh, of course, costs rise from year to year, and we saw that across all agencies. Fuel costs are up substantially this year. That doesn't change the fact that 1,166 schools are seeing on an average an 8% cut. Uh, and second, as advocates have pointed out, um, uh, if you look in Galaxy in total, $1.7 billion are being cut from our schools. Given limited transparency, and this is one of the problems, we can't really tell what those cuts are. We suspect that most of that is one-time stimulus allocations. 
um, which schools were told were not recurring, but you can't really tell from just looking at the individual budgets that are posted online. Still, you know, the, the, mo the basic fact relevant for this hearing, as we calculated, is this, and this is net of the hold harmless that the DOE budget director referred to. Uh, 1,166 schools are receiving cuts totaling $469 million to their core FY23 budgets. That's an average of $402,456, or 8% of those schools' budgets, and that's 77% 70 of the schools in the system. Question two, what do we know about the status of stimulus funding? Here we disagree less with, with what the administration said. As you, you know, they're receiving more than $7 billion in federal pandemic aid that you can spend over five fiscal years. Um, as far as we can tell based on the data, DOE has spent essentially $2.3 billion of that funding, could rise to $2.7 billion once all the accruals through June 30th are calculated, but that leaves at least, and then this, you know, actually they gave a higher number, it leaves at least $4.3 billion in federal stimulus funding left to spend over the next three fiscal years. We also tried to take a look at how much of what was budgeted for this year in federal funding uh, we think will go unspent because they budgeted a little bit over $3 billion. Um, as of June 20th, my office estimates that DOE had liquidated, had sort of spent and recorded just a little over $2 billion. Um, again, with those accruals, we think that number could grow to 2.3 or 2.4 billion, but we're still talking about at least $600 million that was budgeted to be spent in FY22 out of the stimulus dollars that will be rolled forward into future years. Um, and again, that means that there's at least in total $4.3 billion in federal stimulus funding left to spend. Now, as they said, um, as, the, as the first deputy chancellor said, those funds are budgeted for a wide range of important programs, summarizing 3K expansion, academic recovery, support for students with IEPs, gifted and talented programs, et cetera, et cetera. And much of that will go to schools, but, you know, um, Chair Brewer, as you made clear, this is a policy choice. The DOE is currently choosing to cut the average school budget of those 1,166 schools by the average of $402,000 while applying the remaining one-time federal stimulus funds to those other uses. And I believe, and I know most of you share this, and RJ just said it passionately, at this moment with our schools still reeling from the pandemic, that is the wrong choice. So I join you in urging the mayor to apply the rollover of stimulus dollars unspent in FY22 to hold core funding steady for schools next fall, offsetting the cut of 469 million, I'm sorry, it's larger than the 215, uh, would require about 20% of the $2.4 billion in federal stimulus funding budgeted for next year, that still leaves 80% to do a whole lot of other good things while not cutting the base budgets of our schools, which is where the teaching and learning really happens. Um, I'll be briefer on these last two points, how to think about budgeting for the long term in light of enrollment declines and the end of stimulus funding, because this is a real challenge. We are seeing enrollment declines, uh, federal COVID stimulus will not continue, um, and we face sizable out your budget gaps and the possibility of, a, of an economic downturn. So we do need to be thoughtful and responsible, but the right way to do that is with a broad public conversation informed by data and values, and far better to do when our individual schools aren't reeling from those steep cuts. That's exactly what the stimulus funding was meant to buy us, was the ability to make good long-term decisions, not reeling from harsh COVID budget cuts. Um, so first, as you heard, and, and uh, Councilmember Schulman really focused on this, um, the formula of projections, we, we need to see who shows up next September rather than to go with a projected set of declines. I heard the first deputy chancellor say, if you can show me, if you can prove to me that your enrollment for next fall is higher than our projections, but you can't prove that until next fall when the kids show up in the classroom. So hold them harmless now and then base decisions on who shows up in the fall rather than 
trend-based projections from two years of COVID enrollment. Uh, then second, I won't go too much further, but you heard about the need over and over to reevaluate the fair student funding formula. A per pupil spending model has benefits, but boy, it's gotta be updated to ensure equitable funding and prevent these harsh uh, cliffs you hit when you wind up accessing that fourth teacher and going from 23, 24, 25 kids in a classroom to 30, 31, 32 kids in a classroom, even if you have 5% fewer, stu uh, fewer students, excuse me. And then it's important to, remem to remember that while enrollment has been declining, the city and state tax revenue that provides the vast majority of school funding is not based on the number of students. So, you know, we saw increases this year in tax levy. It's completely unrelated to how many students are in the classroom. Reductions in enrollment could be an opportunity if we make a broad set of responsible budgeting decisions with the funding and space we already have for additional reductions in class size that we have so long desired. Um, and then finally, as, as you guys focused on, we just need so much additional information and greater budget transparency. While individual school budgets are available, they're not aggregated or tied to the greater DOE budget, making it difficult to tie Galaxy to the full budget as a whole. Um, you know, we tried to just use uh, the initial allocation summary by district for FY23, but if you go there right now to the DOE website, the links don't work. Um, uh, and then there's a whole lot of information we need for the stimulus spending. We're due in August or September for an updated spending plan, but we need real-time information on how that money's being spended if we're gonna make exactly the question, you know, if we think, if this council thinks, if this city thinks that reprogramming money to protect school budget cuts is a better use of that money, uh, well, there will be some choices about what not to spend it on, but you can't do that unless you're getting real-time information on what was underspent this year and therefore is likely to be underspent again next year and then a wiser way to uh, track that money. So many questions um, uh, that not just that you have, not just that we have, but that parents and teachers and principals all across the city are asking. Um, in our respond, uh, role as budget uh, watchdog, we'll continue to track DOE spending all across the, fun, uh, the summer leading up to school reopening this fall. Every time we get additional information, we'll put it out on our website. We'll provide it to the council. I appreciate your calling this hearing. Um, right now is the time when principals are making those critical decisions. They can't wait till the fall to make decisions about who to access, about whether they're losing their last arts program, about whether they're gonna have three fourth grades instead of four. This is the moment that they're doing it. Sending schools additional money now is what's necessary to make sure they can show up for every one of our students in the fall. Thank you so much for the opportunity to participate in this important discussion. I thank you both for your testimonies. Now I'd like to call on um, Sarita Sumerian Sub from um, IBA. Sarita, just bear with us one moment. Is Sarita Subramanian on Zoom available and ready to testify? Just, just give us one moment, please. Hi, can you hear me? You sound a little distant. No. Any better? Jan, how is it in chamber? Yeah, we can't hear you. Okay. Okay. Good afternoon, Chair. Starting Joseph. time. Okay, now we can hear. Good afternoon, Chair Joseph, Chair Brewer, and members of the City Council. My name is Sarita Subramanian. I am Assistant Director for Education at the New York City Independent Budget Office. 
Thank you for the opportunity to testify today. Uh, I will refer you to my written testimony as well as a budget brief we published in March for more details on the reduction in school budgets that will be phased in over the next two years and a summary of the forgiveness of budget reductions that took place over the last two school years due to the pandemic. Um, I will focus on a few key points from my testimony. Um, first um, is that um, factoring in both the uh, reduction and the federal relief, the net reduction in um, the headcount as of uh, the preliminary budget that was released was a reduction of 14, over 1,400 vacant positions in 2023 um, and 2,300 vacant positions in 2024 and then uh, 3,200 vacant positions in 2025 and beyond. Uh, theoretically, the vacancy reductions would reduce schools' ability to hire additional positions. In reality, schools may have already committed those funds, uh, previously, previously available funds for other uses. Um, as we've discussed, um, city officials have indicated that the reduction was calculated uh, based on the mid-year adjustments, and uh, just wanted to summarize some of the restorations that have happened. Um, so for the current school year, the restoration impacted 1,200 schools that would have received budget reductions, an increase of 37% from the last school year, and accounting for almost 80% of 1,500 city schools that are funded through fair student funding. Uh, enrollment of the schools funded through fair student funding declined by almost 50,000 students, about 6% from last school year to this school year. Uh, please note that our calculation of this decline does exclude 3K, a population that grew substantially this year, but whose funding is provided Sounds outside expired. of the fair student funding formula process. The impact of this reduction on schools budgets will depend on schools enrollment loss, but also not only schools enrollment loss, but also which type of students schools lost. For example, the DOE's uh, formula provides the largest per pupil funds for students in integrated co-teaching classrooms, classrooms with two teachers that serve students with disabilities alongside peers without disabilities. Based on next year's funding formula, each student in that type of classroom in grades one through 12 would bring an additional $7,300 to their school on top of the per pupil amount dedicated to their grade level. Although the Pearson formula was first introduced in the 2007-2008 school year, it has never been fully implemented without adjustments made to the formula to hold certain schools harmless for various reasons. If the plans to no longer hold schools harmless due to pandemic enrollment losses remain, the 2024-25 school year would be the first year in which the fair student funding formula is fully in place for all schools. However, reductions to school budgets while schools are still trying to address learning loss and other social emotional effects of the pandemic may put pressure on principals to make difficult decisions with fewer discretionary funds. Thank you again for the opportunity to testify and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you, there are no questions. Thank you for your testimony. I have a quick question. Oh, you have a quick very question. Very Go ahead, Council Burr. So it seems, first of all, thank you for all of your work, Sarita, on so many levels and um, consultation. So there's different numbers, obviously 215, 295, and the controller had a larger one. Um, and I think in all cases, we need more money. <laughs> so my question to you is, we, always, we had the discussion about the state money, we had the discussion about the unspent federal money, and of course, reallocation of the uh, federal money. Do you have any suggestions as to where that money should come from, no matter what the amount is? Yes, I'm sorry, I apologize. I had muted myself by accident. <clears throat> Can you just repeat the, the question one last time? Sure. Very quickly, there are different amounts as to what we need, 215, 295, the controller had another. The issue is we need more money. And so we have uh, state money that's available, perhaps. We have federal money because we don't think it's all spent and there's the rollover issue. And then, of course, just reallocation of some of the federal money. So do you have any suggestions as to where that funding should come from? 
Uh, I don't have any suggestions per se, but um, something that we are looking into is similar to what the controller mentioned. Um, in the federal funds, um, we also, uh, based on our tracker, we see that roughly 761 million is um, still unspent for 2022. Um, it's possible that that amount could could decrease as we get closer to the close. Um, but that is one um, thing that one and one area that we are monitoring. Um, also, um, you know, we're also still trying to get a better understanding of, you know, particularly for the 1.8 billion um, budgeted for 23, more details about the breakdown of the programs that are budgeted for that funding is something that we're looking into. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, next, we'll have a panel of students. Um, Neo Gums, Anari Coleman, Daniela Rodriguez, um, Rilaka Rodriguez and Kanisha Back Buckley from Urban Youth Collaborative. While the students are getting up, I'd like to let everyone on Zoom know that when you are called to testify, you will receive a message that says, accept unmute, and you'll have to accept that to be unmuted. Thank you. Turn on your mic. Thank Afternoon, you. everyone. My name is Neil Gums. My pronouns are he, him, and I'm a sophomore in high school in the Bronx and a youth leader with Sisters and Brothers United in the Urban Youth Collaborative. Today I'm here because it feels like young people's demands continue to be ignored. The entire budget session and previous bu budget session, young people like myself across the city have called for more investment in our care and to divest from criminalization of black and brown folk, yet year after year we continue to see huge investment in policing in our schools and the resources and positions that would actually provide social and emotional support. This year has been especially disheartening after Mayor Adams proposed the budget which cut millions of dollars to our schools. It's disheartening because our own city council members have also voted to accept these drastic cuts knowing that young people need access to educators, counselors, social workers as our communities continue to recover from major economic crisis because of the pandemic. Many of our youth need social and emotional support after nearly two years of remote learning and our teachers need the tools necessary to support us to catch up academically. Currently, NYC schools have a ratio of 100 to 400, wait, one to 400 guidance counselors to, to students. As a student who wants to ensure that they're getting support that they need to succeed, I can't imagine what our schools would feel like. Due to budget cuts, we'd have less access to guidance counselors. It's not fair that I have to worry about knowing that my time with my guidance counselor might be limited, limited yet my interactions with police will increase. Um, to add on to that as well, um, I've met my guidance counselor at least two times this year and none of them were to help support my education. I'd leave this question with you. How come when we ask for 75 million to hire restorative justice count coordinators in 500 high schools, 45 million to implement restorative justice practices, 75 million to hire 500 new school counselors, and 75 million, 75 million to hire 500 new social, new social, social, new school social workers to get us closer to the one to, to the one to 150 ratio of counselors, social workers to students. We continue to be told that there's no money, yet this near NYC has adop adopted a budget with the largest NYPD NYPD budget while cutting millions from our schools. Why is that it's okay for our schools to hire more school police, but not more educators, counselors, and social workers? NYC, NYC should be ashamed with this budget and should listen to um, school and students call for police-free schools. Thank you. Thank you. Next. Hello. My name is Kenisha Buckley, and I'm 17 years old, and my pronouns are she or hers. I'm a youth leader at the Urban Youth Collaborative, and I'm here today testifying at this hearing to express my fury and disappointment at the mayor and the city council's recently passed budget. Once again, you have failed to prioritize the needs of students like me in New York City, and instead prioritize our criminalization. 
I have been fighting for police-free schools since the eighth grade. I'm now a senior in high school and I'm tired. I'm tired of being targeted by school police. I'm tired of the fear. I'm tired of having to warn all the younger black students that we're gonna be treated differently simply because of the color of our skin. And I'm tired of the lack of mental health supports in our schools. And I'm also tired of seeing students like me wait weeks to see our guidance counselors. I'm especially tired that the New York City's elected leaders haven't listened to students like me. Well, I'm here today to make you listen. Mayor Adams and the city council, your budget is an injustice to students across the city. It is a slap in the face that your budget funds hundreds of vacant school compositions. NYC already funds more school police than guidance counselors, social workers, or restorative justice coordinators. And your budget not only continues this unjust pattern, but makes it worse. Your cuts to education budget will further harm schools' ability to invest in the staff and practices and actually keep us safe. It is outrageous that you cut millions of dollars from the education budget while funding policing at 400 million. Shame on you for making cuts to the education throughout the budget but passing the largest NYPD budget in history. Shame on you for portraying us as threats to our classmates and our community members. And shame on you for not doing the real work to create anti-racist, evidence-based and solutions to public safety. The students of New York City demand that you divest more than 400 million for school policing in the budget and invest it fully in our education and the support we need. Thank you. Thank you, next. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Daniela and I use she, her pronouns and I'm a youth leader at Make the Road New York and the Urban Youth Collaborative. I'm in 11th grade and go to school in Staten Island. I am here infuriated because last week, Mayor Adams and the City Council passed an unjust budget by funding police in our schools and communi communities instead of our care. Mayor Adams has a responsibility to make our schools better, not worse. For years, public schools have been underfunded and often youth voices are ignored. My school is a community school. This is important to me, important to me because community schools provide support to students and families. However, this year, the mayor has cut off school budgets across all New York City. My school is facing over $1 million in cuts. That is unacceptable. I've been struggling emotionally and I've felt silence in this fight because there are not enough social, emotional, and mental health resources for young people like myself. We don't have enough social workers to talk to about our problems and frustrations, frustrations inside our schools. While I am thankful for this budget, while I am thankful for this budget's recent investments, like five million for the mental health continuum, to help students get mental health services and the 14 million to restore community school funding. It is not enough for all the 1.1 million students in New York City. It infuriates me to see how m each year the city turns its back on us as they, sorry, as they keep passing a city budget that spends more than $400 million on police in school. That is a slap in the face to all students. One day this year, I wasn't feeling well and I was in the bathroom with a friend. The school police accused us of smoking weed when it was not true. They threatened to arrest us and made me feel intimidated. As a woman of color, I'm often scared of how police will treat me, and this incident scared me more. In New York City, black and Latin ex youth represent 91 of all arrests, despite being only 66% of the student population. It is time for student voices to be heard. Stop funding racist school, stop funding racist school policing and start funding our futures with a 101 billion budget recently passed. I know we have the money to fully fund our schools and remove police. Thank you. Thank you. Next person. Um, my name is Anari Coleman. My pronouns are she, her. I live in Staten Island and I am in the ninth grade and I am a youth, youth leader at Make the, Word New York, Make the Road New York and the Urban Youth Collaborative. I am here today because Mayor Adams and the City Council chose to fund hundreds of vacant school cop positions while cutting the education budget by millions. The length, the lengths our elected, I can't say that word, I'm sorry, are willing to go to criminalize us black and brown youth never fails to amaze us. But it is failing 1.1 million students across New York City expectations of safe and supportive schools. Schools are supposed to be welcoming. Police in schools do not, do not make us feel safe. Just by, having, just by having young people like myself go through metal detectors is the start of racist system criminalizing us. 
I'm tired of seeing how black and brown students are treated by cops inside of our schools and how our communities and in our communities. We are people too. Instead of investing in more restorative justice, instead of investing in more restorative justice counselors and social workers, we've been calling for. Mayor Adams and the city council have made millions of dollars of cuts in ed to education that will further harm schools' abilities to invest in these staff practices and practices that will actually keep us safe. Our futures are being cut as our paths who prison are being further developed. How can that be a budget New York City elected officials want to adopt? We have been extremely vocal about our demands and we, we need to relocate funds from our, po oh, I'm sorry, from pol policing students to actually student care. I am mad along with many of my peers because the, the city council and the mayor keeps failing us by passing another city budget that spends more than 400 million on police and schools. It is time for students' voices to be heard with 101 billion budget recently passed with a 101 end of matter. I know we, we have the money to fully fund our schools. Do not send students, no, do not send schools into this summer with uncertainty. Push Mayor Adams to fund our schools and not school police. Thank you. Thank you. Next. Good afternoon. My name is Suleyma Dominguez, and I'm a leader organizer at Make the Road New York. I will be reading on behalf of Brioca um, their testimony. They had to run <laughs> to work. Thank you. So her testimony starts, hello, good afternoon. Um, my name is Brielka, my pronouns are she, her. I live in Staten Island, I'm in 10th grade, and I I'm a youth leader at Make the Road New York and the Urban Youth Collaborative. It is unbelievable that New York uh, City elected leaders never find money to fully fund our education, but they always find money to fully fund the NYPD. Mayor Adams and the City Council choose to pass the one, one of the largest NYPD budgets while cutting the education budget by millions of dollars. On November 5th, 2021, I walk into school with the best energy and vibe. As I was entering my school, I realized suddenly I had to go through a uh, random scanning. That got me tense and scared because the police were there. I took all my keys and anything metal related. Then I proceeded to go to, through the uh, scanner. For some reason, I was pulled to the side without any explanation. I was scared. A school cop patted down my legs and around my body in front of everyone. I felt a hot wave on my face, and that was because of the embarrassment and anxiety. No student should go through, uh, no student should go through that when I, uh, no student should go through what I went through going into the place that is supposed to be safe. My school, my school is a community school. This is important to me because community schools provide support to students and families. I have access to vision exams, something that I wish all students across New York City will have access to. We need our city to double down on investments in education, not cut our school police budget, um, school budgets. Well, I'm thankful for the, uh, for the budget investing 14 million in community school across the city. I am all, I'm really angry that my school is losing over one million in funding this year with the recent cuts. That is the last thing students need right now. New York City needs to stop spending money on policing schools. Let me be clear, NYPD's budget did not remain essentially flat, as many council members are saying. The budget has the largest NYPD budget ever. For years, we have been extremely vocal about reallocating funding from policing students to social, emotional, and mental health support. There are more school uh, cops across New York City schools than social workers, guidance counselors, and uh, school nurses available for one million students. Every time students of color like myself walk, into, uh, walk inside a school building, have, we have go through metal detectors. We get treated as the problem, but we aren't the problem. Racist policies are the problem. Police never have and never will be the solution for our problems. The school shooting in Uvalde makes clear that no function of a school police is, uh, is not safety. Police, police are unable to prevent harm, nor they increase the overall safety of the schools. Using our own fear to fund police is manipulative. 
Now more than ever, we need everyone to listen to stand by us. The students of New York City demand to this body to push Mayor Adams to fund the school and not uh, school cups. Thank you. Thank you for your testimonies. Thank you so much. Thank you. Call the next panel, um, President Michael Mulgrew for the UFT, Greg Monte for the UFT, Renee Freeman, and Chanel Quintero. Good afternoon, and you may begin, Michael Mulgrew. Thank Good you. Good afternoon. Uh, thank you, uh, Chair Joseph, and of course, um, our wonderful other chair, and thank you for all the work that you've done throughout uh, for our schools, and I'm joined by my colleagues who will also be testifying. I think we all understand that what is going on here is that the Department of Education and the administration of the city of New York has decided to cut its schools at the very worst time you could possibly do it. We've heard all of the numbers, we've heard the Department of Ed's testimony, and we can poke holes in that all day long. But the, for us, the, the schools are facing something very simple. We have never had a strict adherence to a per-pupil funding formula, and that is what they have now done to the schools of New York City. Uh, at the very time, that formula was designed many, many years ago under the previous mayor, Michael Bloomberg, who never had a great love for public education to begin with. And they're using that strict adherence to the per pupil funding and saying they are right sizing our school system. This mayor and this chancellor both were very, very vocal when they came into office about the dismantling of the Department of Education and making sure that the school system for the first time fully starts to serve and support the students in the schools of New York City. And in their very first budget, they went backwards into an old funding formula that does not allow a school to supply the services it needs at the very time you're asking schools to do more than ever before. And if they, someone does not stop them from doing this, the students of this city will be greatly hurt and face even more damage as we get away from this pandemic. There is federal money. The parents, the teachers, the students of New York City advocated for federal money because we know what the pandemic and the damage it was doing. We also went to Albany, the same group, and fought for all of that money. All of that money came here to New York City for our students and schools, not to be left in a piggy bank that's going to be spent for something else later on. So it really comes down to, are we the parents, students, teachers going to stand with city council and say, this is not going to happen. You are going to backfill those cuts and you're going to come up with a real plan, a real three-year plan about how we're going to fund our schools properly and make sure our school system is doing what it needs to do, which is supporting and educating the children of New York City. Thank you very much. Thank you. Next person. Hi. Um, so on April 14th of this year, seven of my colleagues and I sat on a dais not too far from here and filled you in on what we teachers needed in order to make sure that we were giving the children of New York City everything they needed to succeed. You heard us speak of autonomy, curriculum, special education services, support staff, uh, and support for staff members. We also spoke about staffing in general and classroom sizes. All of these things require funding in order to happen especially after the return to learning post-arduous journey that we've just endured. City and state officials listened, looked us in the eye, and were mostly in agreement on solutions that we had proposed, things that were sustainable, actionable, and will have a direct positive impact on our students. None of this can be accomplished without adequate funding, let alone the cuts that you have approved. This cut is going to force schools to reduce the number of teachers they have increased have increased class sizes and remove or cut back on many of the things that support our students' well-being and enrichment. Furthermore, this gaping hole in funding is going to affect the way our students learn. 
We cannot and will not be able to continue to make up for lost time, close the gap, or even enhance the education of our students without funding to purchase curriculum, supplies, or fully fund after-school programs that so many of our families rely on. We cannot continue to cut corners within an already broken system and expect our children to be resilient. We cannot continue to cut corners and expect our children to surpass the learning expectations set forth by the same elected officials that have no problem pulling the rug out from underneath them. To this, I offer you our personalized example of what it means to cut in our school. Even with our normal school budget and funding for academic recovery, our school still managed not to have enough teachers to properly staff classrooms. Some of us, like myself, do the job of four salaried employees just to keep the school running. With these cuts, we are now looking at playing God and choosing which kids can join after school programs, which literally takes meals out of their mouths. We do not have enough money to purchase materials for a curriculum that we were mandated to select in order to instruct our children the way that they need to learn. We have to pick and choose what we can afford, not what they need. And to the mayor's motto of get stuff done, if you're a parent or you've ever encountered a child, you cannot just get stuff done with them. Thank you. Next person. Good afternoon. My name is Renee Freeman, and I am a paraprofessional at the Academy of Medical Technology. I would like to start by saying I wish the mayor was here so that I could look him in his eyes, so that I could say to him, I need you to listen to understand what it is that I am saying, not listen to respond to what I am saying. See, when you listen with understanding, we can have a conversation and we can come to a resolve. But when you listen just to respond, you come at us angry and not hearing what we said, but you're responding to the things you did not like. So I don't want him to do that. But what I will say, at my school, we suffered a 12% cut, which roughly amounts to $724,000. I am in an area in Far Rockaway where a large population of my students are low-income students. They do not have the things that many have. This cut can hurt tremendously. When we talk about SEL, which he said he wanted to help with, we have students who are suffering. Suicidal ideation is real. And in order to help these students, we need the guidance counselors, the social worker, the art programs, the music programs. Many times students won't talk about their situations, but they will draw a picture. They will write a rap. They will sing about it. Without the funding and teachers being excess, we cannot do it. Eric Adams made a statement where he when he was campaigning, said he loves New York City schools. Well, this is how you show it. You show it by pulling the rug from up under the children. You love the children, and this is how you show it. You show it by taking the money out of the schools and causing them to have larger class sizes. If you're in a classroom with one teacher, and not a, with a paraprofessional, and the teacher is writing on the blackboard, due to social emotional issues, Things happen. Teachers are unable to resolve those problems because they're only one person. We need our support staff and we need Eric Adams to restore the cuts. And remember, he himself has a, had a special need when he was in school. It was a teacher that helped him and he probably had a paraprofessional as well. Thank you, next person. Good afternoon, my name is Gregory Monti. I'm a special ed social studies teacher at FDR High School in Brooklyn, New York. And thank you for having us this afternoon. Uh, I'm here today because for the past 10 years, I have proudly joined other professionals who consistently answered the call to serve our students. Our schools at this point face a turning point to emerge from the pandemic stronger than before. But unfortunately, Mayor Adams is leading us down the wrong path with these budget cuts. I strongly urge the City Council to reverse Mayor Adams' unnecessary budget cuts that will profoundly undermine quality public education across this city. When COVID demanded the versatility of our school communities, we answered the call with our usual dedication. When the pandemic forced us to teach remotely, 
Despite shortages in technology for our students and the usual bureaucratic inertia, we answered the call again. When students needed counselors and social workers, during one of the most vulnerable periods in many of their lives, we answered the call. And when students needed paraprofessionals for educational and emotional support, we answered the call. When COVID exposed glaring inequalities our students face on a daily basis, we answered that call by securing $7 billion in federal and state funding, as well as a state mandate to cut class size. Today, $4.6 billion remains unspent. You can understand our shock then when we looked up from our laser-focused dedication to see Mayor Adams shortchanging our schools this September. Citywide, 303 out of 467 high schools will be cut a total of $141 million in fair student funding. In my borough of Brooklyn, 77 out of 131 high schools will have their budgets cut, totaling $43 million in fair student funding. Each school affected will lose an average of $556,000 or 12% of fair student funding. These cuts mean that teachers risk being accessed, new counselors and social workers cannot be hired, art and music teachers can be cut and their funding cut yet again, and class size will increase despite a New York State mandate to lower class size and despite New York City receiving the funding to make it happen. At this crucial turning point, for our entire school system, we can and must reverse these cuts, and I urge the City Council to answer their call. Thank you. Thank, thank you for your testimony. I'll call the next panel. Thank you all. The next panel is Shirley Altabal from Local 32 BJ, Leonie Henson, Class Size Matter, Michael Rance, Class Size Matter, Andrea Ortiz, New York Immigration Coalition, Clarissa Salas, Clarissa Cal Salas, Salas, sorry, Clarissa Salas, RJPS, Samantha Vargas, if I'm saying it's wrong, Smitha Vargas, Miss Samitha. From AQE, Samitha, are you here? Okay. While these people are getting set up. I want to say that the next two panels will be on Zoom, and I want to let people know in advance so that you'll be prepared. So the next panel will start with Randy Levine, Advocates for Children, Imam God, Girls for Gender Equity, Kadira Coles, Girls for Gender Equity, Kaviri Sengupta, Coalition for Asian American Children and Families, and Lori Podvesker, Include NYC. The panel after that will be Gregory Brender, Daycare Council of New York, Paulette Healy from the Citywide Council on Special Education, Lucas Healy, a District 75 student advocate, Camille Cassaretti, CEC 15, and Koya Huggins, the Parent Action Committee. And please remember when you're on Zoom that you will have to accept the message to be unmuted. Thank you. You may begin, thank you. Yeah, my testimony is rather detailed. Um, I'm not going to read it. I'm just going to summarize some of the most important points, which is we've known that there were going to be cuts to fair student funding since February. What we didn't know is how large the cuts would be to overall galaxy budgets. And we actually did the analysis um, on June 12th and June 13th with the help of Michael Rance and another assistant. We added them up individually from the uh, lookup tool on the DOE budget, and they did equal $1.7 billion as of June 13th. Uh, we found that 98% of schools uh, were losing funding, while only 29 out of 1,535 would gain funding. The average cut per school was 1.1 million, or 13.9%, and though the DOE may add funding over time, they have actually told schools that they cannot use that for staffing. The federal money cannot be used for additional staffing. Um, I really hope that the uh, council demands the actual budget cuts from schools. They obviously have them, and if they don't provide them, I urge you to use your subpoena power because this is the kind of transparency which you have the authority to demand and we as citizens do not. 
Um, there's, there's, you know, this, these are going to cause the largest class size increases since the Great Recession in 2007 and 2008. But unlike that time, we are flush with cash. Um, the city has a reserve fund of $8.3 billion, nearly $5 billion in unspent federal COVID relief, an expected surplus next year of more than a billion dollars, $1.3 billion extra from foundation aid, and um, uh, uh, Chair Brewer mentioned that we got this leaked budget document from the DOE showing that there was unspent $1.1 billion in funds that had been allocated to schools in fiscal year 2020 and 2021 that the DOE is asking schools to cancel because they couldn't be rolled over because they can be used for other purposes. Um, the controller's office has confirmed to me that that's in addition to the nearly $5 billion in unspent federal funds, the, these monies that are sitting right now in the DOE's budget. Um, Michael, you want to go on? Thank you. Great. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you and good afternoon, everyone. Uh, the mayor seems to be defending this budget by saying that he is still fully funding fair student funding. What has not been sufficiently discussed is that the fair student funding formula has never been either fair or sufficient. And this is especially so now, given the critical situation our schools are in after two and a half years of COVID. According to a survey sent to principals by the Fair Student Funding Task Force in 2019, nearly 80% of the principals identified large class sizes as a consequence of that formula. Uh, some principals have even said that the formula when fully funded, is aligned to class sizes of 28 or more. Uh, many parents, teachers, and principals agree that this year, for the first time, students were provided with the smaller classes and the individual attention that they needed to succeed. Um, and this is because the DOE released schools from the handcuffs of the SFF formula. That, together with the enrollment decline, has provided schools with a unique opportunity to provide the small classes that many administrators and teachers had known for years would offer New York City children better opportunities to learn and better opportunities for teachers to get to know each student well enough to support their academic growth. Now, Class Size Matters undertook an online survey and conducted individual interviews with parents, teachers, and principals about the conditions in their schools this past year. And many responded that despite the controversies over mask wearing, Omicron, and all the other disruptions, this year had been exceptionally meaningful because class sizes were small enough in many schools to provide students with the individual support and attention that they had long needed. So we urge the council to do everything that you can to ensure that these budget cuts are restored, especially after two plus years of the pandemic. Smaller class sizes are more critical than ever before to give the in-person support that New York cities require. Students need to make closer connections with their teachers and peers, and those connections can only exist in smaller classes. Thank you. Thank you, next. Nathan. Um, hello. You could, my you could bring it in front of you. Second. Second. Hi, my name is Smitha. I'm the New York City Campaign Coordinator for the Alliance for Qu Quality Education. As a result of our advocacy, the Campaign for Fiscal Equity was won, and as a result of the litigation, the Fair Student Funding Formula was developed. Um, you heard today, you know, the fair student funding formula, it, it, it was a good start, but we knew it wasn't perfect, and everyone talked about how it's not perfect today, and I just want to say, this is not, in, like Lainey said, this is not in new information, and it actually feels like a slap in the face to the adv advocacy groups like AQE and other equity groups who were in the, you know, a part of the initial task force. Uh, we developed these recommendations. None of this is new information. Um, and so, you know, instead we are told uh, recently by the chancellor that we're going to get yet another unfunded DOE task force, even though we explicitly asked for an independent funded commission. Uh, and, you know, this is something that we tried bringing to the council to the education leaders' uh, attention for months now, and we just heard crickets until the final hour. Um, this hearing is after the budget was voted. We were talking about the formula after the budget is voted. So. 
forgive me, but it feels, a lot of this feels very performative. Um, to add insult to injury, in order to further reduce costs, this administration has reduced the base allocation funding per student, which will amount, it will amount to a regressive cut, as we've heard. Um, so, you know, we have the money, and I want to say, you know, we clearly have the money. People have said today um, that we have the money, and even without the federal dollars, this council, so many of you endorsed our platform for police-free schools, for ending segregationist policies, like gifted and talented, yet this budget is directing almost half a billion dollars to school police. We are, instead of, instead of eliminating and phasing out gifted and talented, we are expanding on gifted and talented. And I just want to say, Chair Joseph, you know, just for the future, we hope that there will be transparency and engagement for stakeholders. Um, many advocates, this wasn't a transparent process. Gail Brewer, you know, Council Member, you went on the record saying this is out of all your years, decades and decades of being in office, this is the most transparent parent budget process you've ever, ever experienced. Uh, respectfully, that's the most ridiculous thing I've ever heard. This has not been transparent. Advocates have been shut out, iced out of this whole process, told by budget negotiation members that we can't stand with you, sorry. And then at the final hour, we are being called to stand with you. It's, that's not how you work with advocates. I j thank you. You're done? Next. Thank you. I'm Andrea Ortiz from the New York Immigration Coalition, a steering committee member of a citywide coalition known as New Yorkers for Racially Just Public Schools. We are here to demand that you stop the cuts to public school funding because all students deserve caring, culturally responsive, and healing schools. City officials must restore 1.7 billion in cuts. It's the only way that we will be able to provide the holistic services, programs, and resources all students need and deserve in the midst of the pandemic. The council must pass a new or amend the budget resolution before the 30th to restore all cuts. Let's face it, the public school cuts are unnecessary and cruel and will disproportionately affect historically underserved schools and communities. Cutting school budgets will, while simultaneously increasing police budgets suggests that policing black and brown bodies is more of a priority than investing in children. There's no excuse. We can use the $4 billion left in unspent federal funds. We have a state funding increase of $475 million, and we know that the city is not struggling because they brought in billions of dollars in additional tax revenue, uh, in added tax revenues. So it's disingenuous to blame the catastrophic cuts on federal funds drying up or a general lack of school aid funding or even have this hearing now and the transparency now after the vote. A child's well-being is a prerequisite to learning, but we know that even before the pandemic, most public schools weren't fully equipped to help immigrants, students facing trauma or economic hardship, because far too many schools have never been fully funded. And for decades, AQE, parents, students, educators, and advocates like us have fought to secure additional state funds, so we know we have a unique opportunity to fully fund our schools now. Yet this year's budget negotiations lack transparency, and we're unnecessarily rushed and ended in catastrophic cuts, but the city can fix it. We, um, even without the federal funding, I know we can restore the 1.7 billion in cuts with the available state aid or available city revenues. There's really no excuse. Thank you. Thank you. Max? Good afternoon. My name is Dr. Calera Salas Ramirez. I am part of many of these coalitions, but more importantly, I'm going to share with you my experience on the panel for educational policy as the Manhattan Borough President's PEP appointee. We did take some time to have some of these conversations with the Department of Education. However, this particular administration did not have their mayoral appointees in January. Therefore, our schedule in terms of having these conversations was pushed over for a month. Once we started having conversations about fair student funding and raised the concerns that were lifted by the task force two years ago, the Department of Education still didn't have the opportunity to educate the mayoral appointees on how problematic the fair student funding formula was. Therefore, we have another meeting where the vote does not pass for fair student funding formula. We end up getting the Department of Education to agree to a work group. Some of us wanted a funded commission, but we at least got them to agree to a work group that would have an expert financial analysis 
on what fair student funding can look like and how we can change these variables in order to fully fund our schools, but more importantly, focus on our most marginalized students. What they're not telling you is that students in specialized high schools and students in audition schools get a far greater weight in their funding than our black and brown students, than our immigrant students, than our English language learners, than our students with disabilities and our students with IEPs, and therefore we want to correct that. Yesterday, four of us voted no on the estimated budget. It was performative because we did not have the opportunity to engage our communities in these conversations in order to have an appropriate budget and work collectively with city council to fully fund our schools. Now is the time for you guys to step up for us and make sure that our schools are fully funded. Thank you. Okay, my understanding is that Shirley Aldebal from Local 32 BJ is on Zoom, so we're gonna call on Shirley to speak next on Zoom. Time will begin. Remember to accept the unmute message when it comes. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, my name is Shirley Aubin, and I'm representing the Chancellor's Parent Advisory Council, not, not DC 37. Um, we must address the systemic root causes such as economic disparity, uh, racial inequality, education inequities. Until we solve these problems, some things will remain the same or get worse. Some people are okay with this, but CPAC is not. We need to start valuing education and investing in our children like we should be. Without education, we don't have the careers, the professionals, white collars, blue collars, et cetera. The way we conduct business must change. How about letting Central carry the salaries of the New York City DOE employees? So schools don't worry about paying their teachers. The funds they have to spend is on directly on students. Teachers will, will not be excess because there's not enough salary in the school budget for them to stay. The budget and smaller class sizes go hand in hand. And all through the first six months, we were kept saying that education budgets will not touch our schools but here we are. Thank you for having this hearing. We have not seen a fully potential, the full potential of fully funded New York City public schools. Four billion was given by state legislature to help fund smaller class sizes. How we are spending that money? Who are we serving? The 1%, the 10%? Are we here for all New Yorkers? And when it comes to education and New York City public students and their families should be the center of focus. Who are we? focus. Mayor Adams appears to listen to New Yorkers who are inf influential and this usually translates to those who have money. With money comes power. But I have something to say. Knowledge is also power and our students deserve knowledge. We all deserve knowledge. This is how we're empowered. We want our students to have high quality education. We want elected officials to not forget about everyday New Yorkers. Can I finish, please? Yes, please finish. We are the fabric of this city. Our children are the future and vitality and prosperity of the great city. We should be investing more and not less on the item that we have the greatest impact on our children's education. History will be a reflection on how we treat and care for our citizens. When it comes to high quality education that is equitable and provides for its students all the services, resources, and opportunities that they deserve and need, what will history say about us? The more things change, the more things stay the same. Normally, intelligent and practical individuals take what works and improve on it, expand on that, not do a 180, turn us around and lead us back to ground zero. People might not want to hear this, but Charles Dickens, a tell of two cities, we're, was trying to start move from there, but we're heading back to the great disparity again, the haves and the haves not. When someone can't breathe, and reaches the point that they're turning blue. The consistent misrepresenting of data and facts, lack of transparency on how money is spent. Most of the money for education is not reaching our schools, our children and their families. It will turn to desperation, do anything to ensure that they can't breathe, to stop breathing. We are at a focal point here. Do we want, really want this to happen? Do we want the pressure cooker to explode? The time to talk has passed and the time for action is now. Put the money where your mouth is. It's time to put people in place who will listen and not placate 
and spew words that we want to hear. Hold each other accountable for the greater good. Elected individuals that align with what our children in education and for New York City. As educators, we need to stop making the same mistakes and expect different results. Why would families return to public schools with all these budget cuts besides the high cost of living? If you weren't on the PEP, please listen to the recording. Listen to your fellow New Yorkers, your constituents. Again, Chancellor Parent Advisory, thank you for the opportunity to speak. Thank you for your service to the city. Thank you. Okay, we're gonna stay on Zoom now for a while. The next panel will be Randy Levine, then Iman Gad, Kadira Coles, Kaviri Sangupta, and Lori Podvesker. And up after that will be Gregory Brender, Camille Casaretti, Koya Huggins, Paulette Healy, and Lucas Healy. Going to Randy. Thank you for the opportunity to testify. My name is Randy Levine, and I'm Policy Director at Advocates for Children of New York. When we testified before the City Council at the preliminary and executive budget hearings, we made clear that the city should reject the mayor's proposed cuts to education and should make key investments to better support the students we serve. While we are pleased that the adopted budget includes funding for several important education investments, such as the mental health continuum, immigrant family communication, shelter-based community coordinators, and early childhood education for children who are undocumented, we are deeply concerned that the budget continues to cut school budgets. Taking into account register relief, more than 400 schools serving a total of 185,000 students are seeing cuts of over 10% to their fair student funding allocation. At 189 of those schools, more than 85% of students are eligible for free or reduced price lunch. We regularly hear from families, including families of students with disabilities and English language learners, whose children are not getting the instruction they have a legal right to receive, much less the support they need to thrive. In fact, according to DOE data, as of November 2021, more than 31,000 students with disabilities were not fully receiving their mandated special education instruction. So we are very concerned about the impact of school budget cuts on all students, and especially the students with the greatest needs. These cuts come at a time when the city is grappling with the unprecedented educational disruption caused by the COVID-19 pandemic but also at a time when the DOE has received $7 billion in federal COVID-19 stimulus relief funding. While much of the funding was allocated to important programs and services, such as makeup special education services and school social workers, hundreds of millions of dollars were originally allocated to broad categories, such as programmatic support and operational support. Today's hearing still left us with many questions, and the council should examine where every dollar is going and identify how much funding is still available to prevent schools from having to make cuts. The city should also re-examine the fair student funding formula that is Time driving expired. the school budget cuts. As a member of the city's fair student funding task force under the previous administration, I know there are major questions about the equity and adequacy of this formula that need to be examined and addressed. We join our partners in calling for a funded independent commission that can assess ways to allocate school funding equitably and ensure schools have the resources they need to serve all students. Thank you. Thank you, Randy. Next, we'll go to Iman God, Girls for Gender Equity. Starting time. Hi, good afternoon all. Chair Joseph and Brewer and members and staff of the Committee on Education and Oversight and Investigations. My name is Iman Gad. I am a policy fellow at Girls for Gender Equity, and I'm, a, and I'm giving testimony on behalf of Quadira Coles, our Deputy Director of Policy. And I want you all to imagine a fully resourced school with classrooms full of well-trained staff, supplies, technology, and support that is available to help teachers inside and out of the classroom. A fully funded school with programs and activities that will provide students with skills and experiences that will benefit them in their adulthood. A school culture free of heavy-handed policing, surveillance, and policies that push out students and instead prioritizes supporting students' immediate needs and well-being through restorative counseling and mentorship in order to help them navigate their school's experiences and learn. These are all things students deserve, but the fiscal year 2023 school budget as it currently stands would not provide them these opportunities. At the top of this budget season, we have asked the city to prioritize healing-centered and police-free schools and invest in students' education through restorative services, 
programs and support for school staff by way of a substantial education budget. This will force schools to, across the city to, put, to cut important programs and lose staff at a time when the needs of young people have actually increased. Any amount of budget cuts to education has a tremendous impact on Black, Brown, queer, and disabled students who already face barriers to learning. It is unforgivable that at a time where students are still picking up the pieces from lost instruction time and structure during the pandemic, the city does not see value in investing in their future. Let's be clear. New York City schools have never received the full funding they deserve and need. Yet, officials claim to be concerned about students' educational outcomes. Instead of common sense allocations to things that will support students who have fallen behind academically, addressing mental health and emotional concerns, giving students the space and opportunity to be creative and busy, or support teachers and staff who need to make a living during an economic crisis, the city has instead decided that increasing the school policing budget, not replenishing vacant teacher positions, and moving funds Time away expired. from- can I finish, please? Is more important than helping students recover from the pandemic in a holistic and meaningful way. The impact of these budget cuts are dangerous to our students' future, and the lack of transparency makes it hard for our youth to believe in the city's ability to take care of them. We strongly urge the decision makers here to reallocate the proposed cuts back into the school budget, plus invest more funding to one, hire 2,000 New Yorkers to strengthen schools, two, invest 75 million to hire restorative justice coordinators in 500 schools, and 45 million to implement restorative justice practices, three, direct 350 million in new funding to grow school climate supports, and four, baseline 5 million to sustain the mental health continuum in initiative. And finally, move money away from youth policing, period. Thank you for the opportunity to testify. Okay. Thank you. Kadira Coles, please. Starting time. Is Kadira Coles in the Zoom? Okay, then we'll move on to Kaviri Sengupta, the Coalition for Asian American Children and Families. Starting time. Good afternoon, my name is Kaviri Sengupta and I am the Senior Policy Coordinator for Education at the Coalition for Asian American Children and Families. Thank you for the opportunity to testify. Alongside the New Yorkers for Racially Just Public Schools Coalition, CACF believes that all students, including AAPI students, deserve caring, culturally responsive, healing, and fully funded schools that inspire them, center their humanity, and provide them with an abundance of supporting and supportive and nurturing resources. Yet this budget does not move New York City public schools toward realizing this vision. It is not sufficient to meet students' needs and was passed despite this fact. Even while the city received the revenue re necessary to ensure schools did not face unnecessary cuts, cuts that are especially unconscionable as our students and school communities are still recovering from the impacts of COVID and need sustained investment, the city ultimately passed a budget that directed that funding elsewhere. As always, these, de these decisions that further entrench our system into operating under a model of scarcity disproportionately harm our most marginalized students. API students comprise 16.6% .6 of the New York City student population, attend over 95% of our public schools, make up almost one in four English language learners, and over 15,000 have an IEP. The share of API students in New York City public schools has grown during the pandemic. These students and families need more investment, not less. While we appreciate the investments made in some key priorities, including community schools, language access for limited English proficient families, and the mental health continuum, these pieces are not comprehensive or holistic wins, especially given the scale of cuts our schools are facing. We're also disappointed by the justification provided around losses in enrollment, as the city has not proactively invested in culturally responsive and language accessible approaches to improving access to our schools. Enrollment losses are not simply related to hesitancy or necessarily e easily rectifiable by winning families back. They're rooted in the real challenges for families, such as those with children with disabilities or older, or older English language learners, to access and receive proper services in public schools. The city, including the mayor, city council, and the DOE, must tackle systemic access issues holistically by continuing investment in our schools Time rather expired. than removing it. I finish. Although we agree that the fair student funding formula is flawed and must be updated as soon as possible to better reflect the weights that will meet the needs of our students, we also believe that during the budget process, City Council had a responsibility to ensure that enough funding was available to sustain each school in the city budget. Thus, we call on the City Council to do all it can to restore these cuts. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we have Lori Podvesker, and the next Zoom panel is Gregory Brender, 
Camille Casaretti, Koya Huggins, and then in person we'll have Paulette Healy and Lucas Healy. Starting time. If Lori, if you're in the chat, if not, we will move on to Gregory Brender. Moving on to Gregory Brender. Good afternoon. Thank you so much for the opportunity to testify. My name is Gregory Brender, and I'm here on behalf of the Daycare Council of New York. We are the membership organization of early childhood providers in New York City, and we wanted to just talk a bit today about uh, some of the ways the budget impacts early childhood and some of the continuing needs. Uh, first, we want to start with thanking the City Council for some of the key investments, including a $10 million investment to support child care for undocumented children, a $46 million investment to support increases towards salary parity for the early childhood staff, and a $60 million investment to support a COLA for the human services workforce, which will hopefully include uh, the early childhood workforce. Uh, we urge the council and the administration to go further because early childhood centers are still struggling to keep their doors open and to ensure that uh, children and families have access to high quality education. Uh, we urge the following the city to take the following steps. Uh, first, to suspend the pay for enrollment system whereby providers are um, docked when there are fluctuations in enrollment. Um, given the changes with the pandemic, enrollment has continued to fluctuate while costs have remained steady and in many cases increased, uh, leading to a fiscal issue facing uh, many providers. Uh, second, to complete the unfinished work of salary parity. Uh, we are grateful that the council and administration did put some funding into the FY23 budget for salary parity and particularly want to ensure that uh, future salaries include longevity increases, as well as address those staff members, including directors and support staff, uh, who are not part of the original 2019 agreement of the move towards pay, uh, salary parity. And finally, we urge the city to allow community-based providers uh, to use community-based enrollment to enroll families into the programs that they already have a connection with. Many families already have a strong connection with community-based organizations and are afraid to use the city's centralized enrollment system. Uh, thank you so much for this hearing and for the opportunity to testify. And we look forward to working with you on all these issues. Thank you, Gregory. Next, we're gonna call on Camille Casaretti. Camille, followed by Koya Huggins. Starting time. Okay, if Camille is not there, we'll go to Koya Huggins. Starting time. Hi, good, af Hi, good afternoon. My name is Koya Huggins, a part of the Parent Action Committee and a proud parent of eight children. And I'm here to speak about the impact the cut, the budget cut will have on my children and other children of my community. It was a great honor to be here so I can give my voice as a parent. We have benefited greatly from all of the initiatives that you guys have put together to help us, but we as parents also need more help. We also need more help so we can be better prepared to help our children in this, in this day and age. We need also more funding for the schools so the children can be more diverse and be more have more technology, more books, and everything that they need. It's not just about having the police. We are grateful for the staff. We are grateful, but we need more help from my community. And I'm so thankful to be here to give a voice on behalf of parents, give a, give a voice on behalf of children, young, teenagers, and everyone. I'm so thankful that if you could more consider us and give us more help. And thank you so much and have a blessed one for this time. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Koya. Now we're gonna to move to in-person Paulette Healy and Lucas Healy. And I'm gonna ask in-person witnesses to please pull the mic up close to you so we can hear you. Um, okay, so Lucas, you're going first. Hello, council members. My name is Lucas Healy and I'm a D75 student. I, I have autism and I will be starting high school in a D75 illusion programs where I'll be learning alongside general Dutch educations, ancient students for students with D75 special 
education supports. Um, for the first time in four years, I will be able to attempt, attempt a school in my own neighborhood. Neighbor, uh, neighborhood. When I started school in kindergarten, I was I was non, I was nonverbal. Oh, meeting. I had a lot to say, but I do not have the skills to have my thoughts. Thoughts oh, heard. Um, I am here today to testify. Mm -hmm. I in in front of city council because of my teachers and my various therapists. Yes. What the DOE is doing right now, how cutting, um, is cutting positions in our schools is a disservice to students like me. If I, if my leg was broken, and would you take me, and would you take my crotch away? Crutches, sorry, uh, crutches away. If I was starving, would you lock my food away? That would be ridiculous. <laughs> then don't disable students further by taking away our teachers. <laughs> I don't care what the blame falls. All of I, all I know, the students, all I know, the results of these cuts are schools are losing programs, service teachers, and for students like me, our, our potential will never be unlocked without them. Thank you. Um, as Lucas had said, I am his mother. <laughs> uh, my name is Paulette Healy. I'm a returning member of the Citywide Council on Special Education and a member of Parents for Responsive, Equitable, Safe Schools, Press NYC. Um, before I start, I just wanted to give a quick thank you to Council Member Nurse, Kaban, Richardson, Jordan, O'Shea, Barron, and my dear friend, Council Member Aviles, for knowing how unjust the proposed city budget was and voted no. We learned today that out of our 1,600 schools, 1,120 have experienced cuts, and that was information shared by Council Member Ressler, not by the DOE. So for that, I am grateful to you, Chair Joseph, for providing a platform in order for us to get that information. Let's make no mistake, the DOE is playing a shell game with our tax money. The first deputy chancellor showed immense disrespect to this council today, and the chancellor shucked his responsibility to this abysmal budget cuts back onto you, the city council, by saying at last night's PEP that the vote on the estimated operation budget was procedural and that it was already decided by you. And these cuts, no matter how the chancellor and mayor try to rebrand or manipulate it, are cuts. They harm, they hurt, and they, it's our children who will be suffering for it. Council Member Brewer, please use your authority as Oversight Committee Chair to investigate how the, 20, the $277 million for summer rising was divided because principals are struggling to staff the academic portion of the program on top of trying to spend golly how to run their schools based off of these wrong projections that the budgets are based on. Lastly, thank you, Mark Traeger, for being the only DOE rep to still be here to hear public comment because you value the voices of the parents and the teachers and the staff and the administrators that are affected immensely by these cuts. And just as an example of these cuts, I live in District 20 with my son. We are, as a district, we have 47 schools. We are experiencing $29 million in losses because of these cuts. I have one school that is being shut by 30%. They're losing 30% of their budget and they serve 766 members in their school. 97% of, 97 of them living under the poverty line. They are losing 16 teachers right now. So we need to reverse these cuts immediately and restore 
what is equitable to our schools. Thank you. Thank you. I'd like to go back to the Zoom. I'm told Camille Casaretti is there. Camille. Starting time. Everyone, thank you so much. Uh, good afternoon, Chair Joseph and Chair Brewer and committee members. Uh, my name is Camille Casaretti. I'm the president of District 15 Community Education Council in Brooklyn, where we represent over 35,000 students and their families in grades 3K to 12th grade. We are known as a district that works collaboratively and puts students first in our decision making and are greatly concerned that the mayor and the people leading the Department of Education are not doing what's best for children. Our children in schools need to be prioritized. Returning to pre-pandemic levels of funding is not the answer. I'm begging you, please prioritize education and give our children what they need. Um, the unused funds that are sitting there, reduced fair student funding, no plans for the almost $5 million in federal COVID, relief. None of this makes any sense. Um, our district received a spreadsheet that was inaccurate and did not reflect what was actually happening in our schools. Student head counts for next year were grossly underestimated, and we know this is true because our principals do a very thorough job with register projections. One of our schools has 47 incoming students already registered but was only given a budget for 30 of those children. Our district had cut down the deficit almost in half, and we are still being forced to excess staff. Our schools are putting in appeals that are being um, denied, and which is a time-consuming and frustrating and unnecessary process. It's creating an atmosphere of distrust and confusion. We are losing arts programs, clustered teachers, science teachers in our elementary schools and dual language programs, STEM labs and science lab programs are being destroyed with these cuts. Um, everything that makes the school special is going to be gone and professional development funding is being cut. Uh, classes are being forced to be at contractual capacity and using a formula that is completely ineffective. We have a school um, that needs three ESL teachers, and that is the only way that they can meet their students' mandated needs. But we're being told by our borough office that this school should only have one ESL teacher based on the number of students that they have. So there is no acknowledgement that the ELL students have different services. Some of them have pullout, push-in language surveys and NICETEL determines what the levels of need are for these students, but what the schools are being told is that they have to have their teachers based on just the number of ELL students that they have, which doesn't make any sense and does not allow for the school to actually meet the mandated services. At risk counseling is being cut. We have um, an enormous amount of of students living in temporary housing, which the only way in this new budget um, plan that they are going to get services that they need is for them to have an IEP. And of course, we don't want our schools giving children IEPs that do not need IEPs. So this is the environment that these budget cuts are creating. We're going to be losing our um, day time academic intervention services, the uh, reading coaches that we have and math coaches that we have are going to be cut. And we have children that are, in some cases, a year behind and really struggling to keep up. We need all of these supports. So um, you know, I, I also have a lot of concerns about IEP services being reduced, because if the register counts so low that means that our principal can you please wrap up have an please wrap up Camille. Sense. excuse me please wrap up your overtime oh yes certainly um you know i i'm just very worried about iep mandates being met because the principals can't budget appropriately based on what they're given and the 
register counts that are inaccurate. So um, I want to say thank you so much for holding this hearing, and we really hope that City Council is going to be able to help make significant changes with your support. So thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Somebody else? Thank you. The next panel, um, Chauncey Young, Herman Younger, Elton Dodson, Natasha Capers. Thank you for your testimony. Um, first, uh, Chair Joseph, uh, council members, thank you for holding this hearing. Um, I, I'm going to really throw out my uh, speech. Um, I was reviewing the speech that we gave in March um, in the first hearing um, and, and certainly wish that we had held this hearing again prior to the vote. Um, I, I, I wanted to say in the nearly 20 years that I've been uh, advocating uh, for educational justice, uh, this is one of the most difficult um, periods that I think we've ever experienced and just in terms of transparency. And um, Gail, you were my council member when I first moved to the city and you were the biggest advocate for education. Uh, every school uh, in, our, in your district you knew, you supported, um, and, and we always felt like you had our back. Um, this situation with this mayor and this chancellor, um, I know they are not transparent with council. It didn't feel like trans council was transparent with us as advocates and parents um, in this process. Um, you know, I, I applaud, uh, you know, Council Member Ressler and, and Council Member Christian and all the council members that took the strong stance to vote no. Um, I, I wish some of those words from our council members would have been um, here before the vote. Um, and I understand the system, how it works. Our, our, our speaker and how funding when you stand out and put your district on the line, but I just want to say that this has been a tragic situation for New York City schools and it's not too late for council and the mayor to sit down and work out something for the best of New York City schools and New York City's families. Thank you. Good afternoon, Chair Joseph and members of the committee. My name is Herman Younger and I am a community organizer with New Settlements Parent Action Committee serving the Bronx. I wanna start off by thanking the few council members uh, who remain here with us today to hear from the public. Chair Joseph, I recall fondly in a meeting with Dignity in Schools that you are an educator as recently as December of last year. I now reflect on that fact with the implications of what 215 million in budget cuts will do to public education. If you were an educator today, what could that do to you? For the countless other black and brown educators, for the countless black and brown students in need of quality public education, the hypocrisy of Mayor Adams and Chancellor Banks is astounding. They would like to celebrate the recently unveiled black studies curriculum while proposing to reduce the quality of education for black and brown lives that pave the way toward excellence. Yet, while this budget cuts almost $1 billion from the DOE, the $400 million school cop budget, a force that is run by the NYPD but is funded by the DOE, was protected from any cuts and in fact received an additional $13 million. The priorities of Eric Adam and David Banks are clear, to defund our public schools while filling them with police officers that target, harm, and arrest black, brown, and disabled students, further perpetuating the school-to-prison pipeline and school-to-deportation pipeline. Now let's get real. Under the mayor council government model, the council serves as a check against the mayor. 
Therefore, I'm going to respectfully ask that this city council not scapegoat the DOE or the mayor on this issue when it is in the power of the council to amend this budget. Shame on this disgrace, disgraceful administration and shame on any council member who does not vote to amend the catastrophic budget cuts to public education. History has its eyes on you. Thank you. Next person. Good evening. Good evening, my name is Elton Dodson. I'm the executive director of the Mural Justice Project, a dad to three kids that are in DOE or have graduated from it, also on the uh, SLT at PS 295. I wanna thank you for this hearing and for the difficult work that you're all doing. I feel like right now this is a little bit like uh, buying a car, driving off the lot, and then returning and asking for a different price. Uh, <laughs> but that's where we find ourselves today. Um, I'm going to deviate from the comments that uh, you have in front of you a bit in light of the PEP meeting, the PEP meeting last night. I want to go over to 50, to, uh, 2590G, which is the New York law that governs the PEPs and the CECs submissions of their total estimated budget. This process has, been, ha has not been followed for years. This is a process that has created a situation in which none of you were properly equipped to vote on that meeting that was called at the last minute for, for the budget. And why were you improperly equipped? Because the chancellor, and I'm not putting all of this on Chancellor Banks or on Mayor Adams, because this has happened long before them, the chancellor, as is always done, made an emergency declaration to suspend the 2590 process. Now what is the 2590 process? We should all know this. It's a process that requires essentially grassroots, community-based budget planning for our schools, something that we have not followed at all. The CECs in each district, along with their community superintendents, should be assessing their principals, assessing their teachers and staff and their students, and asking what do you need. That information, along with the similar assessment made by the PEP, is submitted to the chancellor who then submits it to the mayor ahead of the budget process and which all of you voted on last Monday. That was voted on last night by the PEP. The last time I checked last night was after you had adopted the budget. Explain to me how we are not in violation of state law under 2590, which is sub Q, of that budgetary process when you never received that estimated budget from the PEP or the CECs. You couldn't have. It was just passed last night under what Chancellor Banks referred to as a procedural vote. There are no procedural votes when they're talking about the future of our children. Thank you. I am Natasha Capers, mother of two public school students, one of which graduated high school just a few days ago, a parent who fought for the campaign for fiscal equity for a decade, a founding member of New Yorkers for Racially Just Public Schools, and the proud director of the New York City Coalition for Educational Justice. This is my 11th or 12th budget fight, and this is CJ's 16th. We as parents and organizers are not new to this budget fight or process. We are true to it. This is Mayor Banks' budget. This is Mayor, this is, sorry, this is Mayor Adams' budget. And the DOE has slashed their budget because their boss, Mayor Adams, has instructed them to do so. So CEJ is calling for the city council to pass a new or amended budget resolution before the 30th to restore all the cuts to do what is right for children, even when the DOE can't or won't. I got into organizing because my children, who are now 18 and 16 years old, who were in the first grade in pre-K, a school that I had attended as a child was on a closure list. I learned about the deep disinvestment, not just in their school, but in all black and brown schools across the city. I got involved, helped to save our school, and helped to make it a thriving community school. Seeing these budget cuts that are now coming to schools is heartbreaking in ways that are beyond words. The lessons that I, CEJ, and millions of families learned during the Bloomberg privatization ever still stand true today. Budget cuts never improves outcomes for students. Budget cuts never build caring, culturally responsive schools where highly qualified educators. 
Budget cuts like these are one of the many ways that white supremacy and systemic racism continue to show up in public education. For months, advocacy and organizing groups like CEJ and ARPJPS have been ringing the bell about these cuts, their effects on children, educators, schools, and we need the council to not just listen to us, but to work with us to fully fund and create the schools that deserve our children. The same groups who rang the bell during the Bloomberg era are the ones sounding the alarm right now, but our work, effort, words, tears have all fallen on deaf ears. We have seen this show game in the past under a very similar privatization mayor. We saw this during Bloomberg. The argument of lower enrollment is a recycled one. It is a lie. It is a lie. And it is one from Bloomberg, but with a new name. The old name was school utilization. And it was used to co-locate and close schools to open charters. Low enrollment is the new argument. And if we are not careful, it will be the cause of the new onslaught of closures in black and brown and low income schools across our city. Just know this, that if you are confused by the DOE and City Hall's numbers, that is by design. And it is a tool of white supremacy and systemic racism. Thank you so much for your testimony. Thank you. The next panel is Anna Maria Thomas, Jenna Weinberg, Bliss Broyard, and Lupe Hernandez. Good afternoon. You may proceed. Thank you. Good evening to all our uh, education committee members and this investigative hearing. I want to thank you for having this. I'm a 77-year-old elder, 39 years working in the New York City Department of Education, retired educator, and you've heard that much of what you're seeing today is not new. I have watched this since 2001. The New York City public schools budget in 2001, when Bloomberg became mayor of New York City, was tw $28 billion. What happened to this money? And why is there a continued effort to defund our New York City public schools? The continuous defunding of our New York public schools created public schools which lost important supportive services, such as school nurses and doctors who gave students dental and hearing examinations, school psychologists and social workers, guidance counselors, our prized school aides, librarians and school libraries, science laboratories, and the removal of subjects such as music, art, phonics where you learn to read, grammar where you learn to write, and penmanship where you can sign your name on a check. None of this is being taught in our schools today from, and, and taken out of the curriculum. The new so-called mathematics has all parents in a quandary because they cannot help their child with their homework. 
I implore the Education Committee to realize our children need all these services restored, along with the inclusion of computers issued to students starting in grades three. The digital world is taking over every aspect of communications. This continued defunding of our New York public schools is a grave injustice to our children. All our students deserve the best education from this greatest state in our nation, New York State. Thank you for this opportunity to present. Oh, and I did Thank not, you. did I say my name, Dr. Anna Maria Thomas? I am a lobbyist for the children. Thank you. Next person. Hello, my name is Lupe Hernandez. I am actually one of the borough president appointees, thank you, Gail, for the Communica Community Education Council for District 2. As a parent, I'm disappointed and alarmed by the cuts to the DOE that were approved in this 2023 budget. There have been various figures cited ranging from 215 million to $1.7 billion worth of cuts to the DOE. And while I'm troubled that so many elected officials seem unable to say with certainty the exact dollar amount they already voted to strip from public education, vaguely pointing to supposed federal funding that offsets the cuts. What I am certain of is that these cuts have a very real consequence at all of our schools and they are being felt in, a real, in real time. Principals across the city have received their budgets and have already had to make painful decisions to cut vital programs like arts education, sports programs, field trips, restorative justice, and even worse, to let go of staff, including teachers, guidance counselors, nurses, social workers, all of the people that have kept our children safe in a time of so much grief, loss, and uncertainty. Our most vulnerable students will be impacted the most. These students were barely getting the support that they are federally mandated to receive. Our children deserve so much more, as do the school staff who have literally put their lives on the line to care for our children during this prolonged COVID crisis. These cuts, the largest passed in many years, will devastate our schools, undo any progress that has been made in the past year to improve the mental health and wellness of our students and their academic success and it just plunged the entire system into chaos. Just as we are collectively beginning to find our footing after three uniquely challenging school years, the rug is being pulled out from under us and under our children. We are being told that this is simply because enrollment is down, yet many principals throughout the city say that the projected enrollment numbers were grossly underrepresented and far from the reality of the true students enrolled and that will remain in their school throughout the fall. We are being told not to worry and that something will be worked out before next school year. Why were their enrollment projections so low to begin with? The funds that are restored later in the school year do not help the schools retain the staff that they need to support all of their children, and they need those funds now. We need to know exactly how our schools will be fully funded and how and when their budgets will be restored. Staff changes have already been made. How will that be fixed before September? And when the reality of these cuts become more widely understood, no doubt that, will they, that will lead to parents deciding to pull their kids out of the public schools, deepening this supposed crisis in enrollment decline and leading to more budget cuts under the fair student funding formula, which we knew that formula was inadequate to begin with. And those weights need more funding. Students with disabilities need more weights added. It's not fair that students in specialized high schools and 
and screened middle schools are getting more funding, yet our most vulnerable students are not. Students in temporary housing don't get any additional weights. This budget as is, is detrimental to the ones that need the support more than ever. Please go back, amend this. We're working we can on make it, this Lupe. right. We're working on it. I have a question for you. Does the CEC, uh, to, have you gotten data? Have you gotten for either from the superintendent or DOE, or because you have a pretty sophisticated group of CEC members from every school? I mean, I'm just wondering if you've been yes. collecting that. We do. We, well, we received through the Galaxy spreadsheet. I've gotten more information from parent advocates than I have from the DOE. So, and the, so the information you have is not from the DOE, the data, it's from the advocates. It's, it's from the Galaxy, and, and it does match with the principles that I've spoken to, which is disproportionately, it, it, it is very different than what the projected enrollment is showing. I know even my son's principal has said, we know we're going to have, the DOE is going to owe our school money. The problem with that is my son's autistic. He needed a para. When they didn't include that in the June budget, he didn't get that para till February. Right. Okay. By then, it's too late. Okay. These kids need the support come first day of school, September 8th. We need these kids. The paras need to be there for the kids. The social workers need no, I'm to just, be there. I know, but I'm just focused on data. Cause, yep. Okay. So you haven't, the, nobody has given you school by school data from DOE except through the Galaxy? Through the Galaxy. Okay, yeah. thank you. Thank you. Yes, go ahead. Thank you. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. <laughs> I almost didn't make it, but, but five and a half hours later, I am here because my middle school students asked me to come. And they asked me to come here today to be their voice to tell you a few things. Amelia says, quote, do not cut our after school programs. They're the spaces where we get to be our happiest selves, end quote. Ailey says, these experiences help me step out of my comfort zone, end quote. Jonan says, art is such an important part of our lives. It brings together a group of people who might otherwise not know each other to build an amazing community. End quote. Zosha says, I would not be who I am today without theater. End quote. This week, instead of focusing on end of the year pizza parties, field days, and graduations, our students and alumni recorded video testimonials, made artwork pleading with the DOE, wrote letters to the mayor, and organized a walkout in defense of the teachers and programs that have shaped them. My name is Jenna Weinberg, and I'm a theater teacher at MSA 39 in Kensington. I'm a Brooklyn native, and I am a proud product of the New York City public school system. This year, our students overcame so much to finally experience their first standing ovation in a packed auditorium, or to take home a championship with their basketball, volleyball, and soccer teams after the two years of isolation during COVID. If these budget cuts happen, our students will be robbed again of these formative experiences. Late stage funding for sports is useless if our coach, George, leaves our school in an effort to save a colleague's job. There can't be a musical even if a grant shows up in February if our school has already let go of our music or our theater teacher. For many students, these experiences are what actually motivate them to come to school to push through their academic hurdles, and to overcome personal obstacles. They foster a true sense of belonging because our kids have a place to shine and be celebrated for who they are, and they do not take it for granted. It is absolutely worth fighting for. Even if everything stays the same and nothing changes and the tide does not turn, it is my job as an educator and a role model to stand up for the world we want to see, instead of just accepting the world as it is. I'm here today modeling that for my students. I know my community is watching, 
and we're asking the mayor and the city council to take action, to align yourselves in solidarity with students and families and teachers and stop this budget from moving forward as is. Please listen to the public who has all spoken up so beautifully and articulately today and to the educators who've been showing up every day. Thank you. Thank you so much. May I just make one, uh, we're looking at suggestions and I heard from the DOE that three billion dollars is being spent for our charter schools. I don't pay taxes for charter schools. And I don't think anyone in this city pays for charter schools which do not uh, have the same regulations as the public schools do. They are not public schools and our tax dollars should not be going to charter schools. Maybe we can use that $3 billion for the cuts that we are having in our public schools. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you all. Thank you. All right, the next panels will all be on Zoom. And I'm going to call the next panel from Teachers Unite. We have Bella Week, Lara Gibbs, Charlotte Pope, Madeline Borelli, and then we also have Marissa Manzanares. And the panel after that, so you can get ready, is Marilyn Mendoza from Make the Road, New York, Mark Gonzalez from PS 199 PTA, Greg Mihalovich from the American Heart Association, Emily Hellstrom, the PTA president of PS 343, and Nicole Giacco. So, Member of people on Zoom to accept the unmute message when it is sent to you. We'll begin with Bella Week. Start in time. Okay, if Bella Week is <clears throat> not available, we'll go to Lara Gibbs. Start in time. Not present, Charlotte Pope. <coughs> Start in time. Um, Madeline Borelli. Starting time. Marissa Manzanares. Starting time. Okay, we'll move to the next panel. Marilyn Mendoza. Starting time. Okay, Mark Gonzalez. Starting time. Hi, good afternoon. Uh, thank you, Chair Joseph, my, my council member, Chair Brewer. Thank you so much. My name is Mark Gonzalez. I'm a parent of two students with disabilities. I'm also PS 199's PTA president and a CEC3 member living in District 6. We heard the data today. It's not $215 million in cuts to the DOE. It's $1.7 billion to the schools in the Galaxy system. That's why we're here today. $215 million should have been able to be, to be absorbed with all the one-time spending that happened with federal funds in FY22. Instead, the DOE decided to go after our students. The DOE made actual cuts to all students with adjustments to the fair student funding formula. We've heard the trauma from school leaders as they are facing these DOE mandates and not getting the support from the DOE. I'll give you an example, PS 199M. We had a budget cut of two and a quarter million dollars in Galaxy or 30% when we factor out grants compared to FY22. District 3 had cuts totaling more than $33 million, or about 19%. District 6, for, Gail, uh, for Council Member Brewer, had $30 million in cuts. We heard from Mayor, Ad Mayor Adams, though, these cuts were just due to enrollment declines, but that's not what the data showed. When you looked line item by line item in Galaxy, we saw differences. For example, at PS199, the parent coordinator position was cut by 12%. We have to have a parent coordinator, that's the law. 
So we got to take money out of the classroom to fully fund the parent coordinator. And that did not just happen at 199. It happened all over. So where did this money go? That's what we need you as council members to find out. Why are we bloating the bureaucracy in the DOE with superintendent staffs going from five on average to 40 or 50? Why are superintendents budgets going from under $100,000 to in the millions of dollars? Why are we wasting money outside the classroom and not funding our students? We need the council to rectify these wrongs. You have the power to stop these cuts. That is why we trusted you, and that's why we elected you. I thank you for your time and your support. Thank you, Mark. I'm told that Marilyn Mendoza from Make the Road is in the Zoom. Marilyn? Starting time. Hi, good afternoon, um, Chairs Joseph and Brewer, members of the respective committees. My name is Marilyn Mendoza, and I am the Education Justice Organizer at Make the Road New York. Thank you for the opportunity to testify on the impact the adopted FY 2023 DOE budget will have on youth and immigrants and working class communities of color. Make the Road New York is a nonprofit community based membership organization with over 25,000 low income members dedicated to building the power of immigrants and working class communities to achieve dignity and justice through organizing policy innovation and transformative education and survival services. Our education justice project fights to improve public schools for students and their families. As the education justice organizer, I work with parents every day to tackle the problem of overcrowded schools, secure the resources our students need, and ensure our parents and students have a larger say in their education, regardless of any language barriers. In the past week, I have received emails, messages, and phone calls from dozens of parents that asking what can be done to reverse the decision by Mayor Adams to cut $250 million from DOE's budget. Parents whose children attend schools like PS14 in Corona, Queens, are facing cuts in the hundreds of thousands of dollars. They know that these cuts are not just numbers on a balance sheet, these cuts will result in increased class sizes and cuts to arts programming and other vital services and supports our communities have fought for and won. Um, they know this because for dec decades, their schools have borne the brunt of systemic underfunding, which has already resulted in classrooms bursting at the seams, making it difficult for students to get the instructional time they need. Time expired. You can finish your statement. Uh, thank you. How can we cut the DOE budget at this moment on the heels of the pandemic that has wreaked havoc on our communities? All the while our schools have um, more police officers and guidance counselors and billions of dollars are in unspent federal relief remains untapped. We need our city to double down on investments and in education, not cut our schools budgets. Um, I'd also like to add that a lot of our parents who are Spanish speaking joined the live stream and they were disappointed that there was no interpretation services offered for the live stream. Um, there can't be any transparency or council or DOE cannot claim that it is being, um, that it's including parents' voices if you don't include non-English speakers in decision-making. Thank you. Thank you, Marilyn. The next panel is Greg Mihalovich from the American Heart Association, followed by Emily Hellstrom, PTA president of PS343, and Nicole Giacco. The following panel is Michael Athey, Mylin Nguyen Novotny, Robin Bowers, Jennifer Doherty, and Ian G. Whitman. Greg Mihalovich, you're up. Starting time. Okay, if Greg is not here, then we'll go to Emily Hellstrom. Emily? Starting time. And 
Apparently, Emily's not here, so we'll go to Nicole Giacco. Nicole. Start in time. Hi, um, my name's Nicole Giacco. I have uh, two children, one in elementary school and one in high school. Uh, everyone that I have heard, because um, I've had to come on and off of the hearing, has, has been so knowledgeable and spoke so eloquently. And um, I'll be brief because I think a lot of what I already had to say has been said. Um, for me, the highlights have been the fact that uh, my son goes to a, a school in Murray Hill, an elementary school that has, um, is, is, has a uh, family shelter in its own. So we do have a population of students in temporary housing. Um, in addition, we have a lot of students who are children of families that work at the United Nations. Um, both of those populations of students um, come and go all year long. When I, for, my daughter first went to the school, which was 10 years ago, she started, the school was overcrowded. We had the fair student um, funding formula. It didn't work then. It was overcrowded. So you would think that, oh, we would have so much money. It didn't work then. We had um, to the, the PTA at the time had money to um, hire teaching assistants because the class sizes were too large. Um, we had to supplement still professional development. We, we still had to do um, all of these things in order to get um, whatever services the school needed to provide to those students. And now we are in the, a different situation where there is low enrollment at the school now. It has declined over the last couple of years. It, it has not doesn't, I doubt it's going to decline as much as it is projected to, to decline by September. We already got one new student this month. Um, so this formula still doesn't work for us. So I know that there has already been task forces and um, opinions uh, given to the city council um, and everyone else about fair student funding formula. Please, please do something about this. P please look at this now. Please restore these funds. Thank you for your testimony, Nicole. Um, next, we will call on Michael Athey, followed by Mylan Nguyen Novotny, Robin Bowers, Jennifer Doherty, and Ian G. Whitman. Michael. Start in time. Thank you, Chairpersons Joseph and Brewer, for providing this opportunity. My name is Athi. I retired in February after 18 years with the DOE, five as a teacher at Hillcrest High School, one distinguished grad named Banks, and 13 years as principal of Bayside High School with two distinguished grads, both named Adams. Current principals cannot testify as they are under a DOE gag order and peer retribution. I have submitted written testimony, which details areas of budgeting that require immediate attention. I would correct some of what you heard from Mr. Weisberg and Ms. Oates, but that would take a lot more than two minutes. I will agree with the first deputy that the DOE has to get a lot better at listening. God knows I've tried. We do not need another task force, working group, or other effort to analyze and restructure how the DOE funds schools. Such efforts have been undertaken in the past and have uniformly led to nothing. Either the results are tabled or become stale, or the proposal to form such a group is made disingenuously as a diversion, as this happened in May 2022 and was repeated again last night and again today. The DOE must be compelled to administer its FSF as intended and to correct some specific budgeting practices. That's it. Speaker Adams is correct. The current situation is due to DOE decisions. It is vital to understand that the misapplication of FSF and its effects were and remain due to decisions by the DOE budget office and are not attributable to any external forces, including the council. The DOE left to its own devices will enact only the minimal cosmetic adjustments possible in order to return to business as usual. The pre-taps under, underpinning FSF are valid, equitable, and worth retaining. They empower families' choices of schools. Here are highlights. Despite what you've heard, projections are a one-way conversation from Tweed to the principal, with Tweed exercising power without knowledge. This is the source of many of this year's complaints. There is no policy for year-end surpluses or deficits. It, it should be consistent. Costs for teachers on a citywide average are used to calculate funding, but much higher individual building averages are used to debit schools. That is a shell Time game. expired. Uh, may I finish? 
A student-centered approach to appointments of the DOE budget is needed with funds needed at the school level designated first and remaining funds allocated to central. The info shared by Ms. Oates regarding non-school expenses needs closer examination. Despite what you've just heard, not all schools are funded at 100% fair student funding. There remains a three-class funding system, which indicates favoritism and must be replaced by funding based on the demographics and weights system-wide. The capricious awarding of portfolio funding is also brought to light when we see millions of dollars going to schools that do not meet qualifications. The DOE should be compelled to finally publish criteria it uses to determine portfolio funded projects to incentivize these funding sources to other schools to meet such high level criteria. In summary, again, I express my thanks to the chairpersons for creating this opportunity to express concerns. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony, Michael. I'm gonna ask, ask people for their patience. We have a lot of people signed up in, who are not in the Zoom and we still have to call everyone's name just in case. Next up would be Mylin Nguyen Novotny, followed by Robin Bowers, Jennifer Doherty, and Ian G. Whitman. Mylin? Starting time. Seeing no one, we'll go to Robin Bowers. Starting time. We'll move on to Jennifer Doherty. Starting time. And Ian Whitman. Starting time. Okay, then we'll move on to the next panel. I'll announce the next two panels. I have Farad Despeña, Karina Rahal, Liana Willoughby, Mark Engel, and Rachel Paguaga. The following panel after that is Yulia Schneiderman, Carrie Farley, Christine Ramirez, Karina Garcia, and Stephen Lampert. Calling now on Farad Despeña. Starting time. Okay, we'll go to Karina Rahal. Starting time. How about Liana Willoughby? Starting time. Mark Engel? Starting time. And Rachel Paguaga? Starting time. Okay, we'll move to the next panel, which is Yulia Schneiderman, Carrie Farley, Christine Ramirez, Karina Garcia, Stephen Lampert. The one after that will be Aya Natalia Karpinska, Diana Barros, Jessica Luck, Megan Scott, and Michelle Sai. So we're going with Yulia Schneiderman. Starting time. Okay, how about Carrie Farley? Starting time. Christina Ramirez. Starting time. Karina Garcia. Hello. Oh, is that Christine? Yes, this is Christine. Okay, Christine. Starting time. Go ahead. Hello, Council. Um, my name is Christine Ramirez. I'm a parent a leader with the Parent Action Committee. I am a parent association president at PS35 in District 9 in the Bronx, as well as also being a part of the student leadership team. I went to John F. Kennedy High School. It was a school that felt unsafe and unwelcome by its many metal detectors and policing in the school. The students ran wild, not obeying to the police and their orders. The police were there to protect our school, but instead they just stood around only moving to their convenience. Metal detectors never serve their purpose, purpose, which is why many students still bring weapons in our schools. The over-policing was a stress to my mother as she felt like she was taking me to a prison every single morning. Just the long road down made me feel sad about the future that I had. This is why I felt like a prisoner to the school system rather than a student, student with a willingness, a deep willingness to learn. This affected my self-esteem as a person, and I started to withdraw from any school activities. 
I felt like I wasn't a baby anymore. I felt like I didn't need to be told what to do. All I wanted was guidance from the very school that was teaching me and from the police that who were there to protect me. I now have two American children, one eight-year-old and a 10-year-old in District 9 in the Bronx. And I have to one day bear witness that my children are going through the same unjust system I had to endure, endure in my school. I can't see this policing in my kids' school as a solution rather than a problem. What I would like to see is in the budget is better trained social workers and guidance counselors, and I do not want people who would rather write a Time ACS expired. report. Can I finish? Um, ACS report instead of really listening and helping these kids. I also want want um, training at, for school principals and staff, but I don't want police in our schools. So please, our kids need our voice and support for a better future. This budget needs to change and the cuts need to stop. We need better help for our kids. Cutting schools budgets is not going to cut it. The schools need help. As you can see, the school I represent is PS35 in the Bronx um, District 9, which needs a new gym and a cafeteria. Why isn't there, a, there help happening for my school and other schools alike? Now, the city wants to cut everything good for our kids that helps them learn and strive as one day they will become leaders of this city and nation. And now the city wants to add more to the budget like police. This is an outrage as a parent and a person. We need better help for these kids. How is the city trying to hire police if the schools aren't right either? It's backwards and rhetoric. So what now? What we gonna leave all the work to the police, but none to the schools to protect our kids, to help and uh, protect our kids? So please stop these cuts and start implementing real programs and help for these do um the, these schools, children and their families that suffer greatly with these decisions that the, that the city has made. Please let's not leave a child behind because of our failures to look at the bigger picture. Stop the cuts. Thank you. Thank you, Christine. I'm told that Carrie Farley is in the Zoom, so Carrie, and I will slow down to give you time. Thank you. Starting time. Carrie, I see you in the Zoom. You need to accept the unmute request. Okay, we'll have to come back to you. So next we'll call on Karina Garcia. Is Karina is there? Starting time. Looks like she's not there, so we'll go to Stephen Lampert. Stephen. Starting time. Uh, hi, is this coming through okay? Great. Um, good evening. Uh, my name is Stephen Lampert. I'm a parent of a kindergartner at PS87 in the Upper West Side. And tonight I prepared a written statement that I'd like to share with you all today. Uh, my son's name is James. He's five years old and today was his last day of kindergarten. James's K-104 teachers are Robin and Susie. And because James is in a mixed classroom of kids with different needs, uh, James has four additional teachers for a class of 20 children. And uh, just today, uh, James's class uh, released their butterflies in the PS87 schoolyard, and it was everything kindergarten should be for a kid like James. Uh, just a little over a year ago, uh, we moved here from Michigan, and we chose our apartment um, without ever seeing it uh, because of the school, because every children, uh, child's parent we talked to told us what an amazing school PS87 was. And after just one year at PSA 7, I can assure you that this school is much more than that. Um, James's school is the heart of our neighborhood. It's what makes this place our corner of the city. It makes it what makes it home. Uh, but with this budget, James's school, um, the heart of our neighborhood, our, our home really, uh, is under attack. With this budget, James's school, the place where he feels 
safe and loved and special and and free to just just be a kid uh, is slated to lose a little over nine hundred thousand dollars. Now, in this city, nine hundred thousand dollars may not sound like a lot of money. Um, in a place where investment bankers get bonuses that are bigger than that, and you can't get a one bedroom in Manhattan for nine hundred thousand dollars, you know, maybe it isn't. Uh, but for my son, my little five year old, it's a lot because uh, that nine hundred thousand dollars means that five teaches teachers at uh, PS eighty seven are going to lose their jobs, and three of them alone are first grade teachers. Time expired. Please continue. Okay. Thank you. It means that uh, his class size is going to increase from 20 kids right now to about 32. And I want to let that number 32 sink in for a second because I want to explain to you what it really means in real terms for my son. That number 32 means that when he's scared, he's probably not going to get a hug. When he's struggling, he probably won't get what he needs. And when he really is proud and wants encouragement, he's probably not going to get it. And that's because his teachers, his kind, loving, brilliant teachers are just going to be too stretched then to give him what he needs and deserves. And that's what that number 32 really means to James. And I'm not going to lecture you about class sizes and statistics or reference, you know, what economists say, because you know what, that's their job. My job, my first job, and the only job I have that really matters is to take care of my son, to give him the love and support he needs to, to grow and thrive and to be a child. Um, but I've kind of realized something, especially over the last couple of years with COVID, I can't do this job by myself. Um, none of us can, like we need each other, we need our schools. So I'm begging you, please release the unallocated federal stimulus money, fix the budgets for the end of June and put in place the resources to ensure this doesn't happen again. Because we parents, we can't do this on our own. We need our schools and my little guy, James, he really needs his school too. So thank you. Thank you, Steve. I'm Gail Brewer, I know PS 87 for about I don't know, 30 years, it's a great school, and we're certainly gonna work. I spoke to your principal today, so I have all the data for PS87. Thank you very much for your leadership. Thank you. Uh, we're gonna try once again with Carrie Farley, give her a moment to accept the unmute, and I wanna let you know the next panel will be Aya Natalia Karpinska, Diana Barros, Jessica Luck, Megan Scott and Michelle Sai. Carrie Farley, are you there? Can you accept the unmute? Starting time. Okay, we'll move on to the next panel. Aya Natalia Karpinska. Starting time. Okay, seeing none. Diana Barrows. Starting time. Okay, Jessica Luck. Starting time. How about Megan Scott? Starting time. Hi, good evening, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you, Megan. Okay, thank you so much. Um, <laughs> the duties of the day took me away from where I was originally sitting, so forgive me while I get my statement up on my phone. Thank you for your patience, and thank you as well to Thank you to the speaker, the chair, Joseph, and council members for convening this hearing. Thank you to the educators here today, and especially the amazing and inspiring students who spoke. I came here for the same reason I attended the PEP meeting last night, and the same reason I had planned to be at the rally this afternoon. To express my outrage at how the educators, families, and children in the New York City Department of Education are being treated. At the PEP meeting last night, Chancellor Banks interjected to tell us, the public, that we don't understand, quote unquote, there are no DOE budget cuts, rather it is right-sizing in order to wean schools off of money they received during the pandemic. 
Chancellor Banks and Mayor Adams, neither of whom are here, but nonetheless, I would like to assure you that we do understand. We understand that you do not value the public school system. You do not value the work of DOE educators, related service providers, DC 37 staff, and administrators. Most of all, you do not value public school children of the city of New York. As the parent of two public elementary school students, one of whom is a special education student with autism, I can tell you, your message is received loud and clear. This administration stands for the continued and criminal underfunding of public schools and the covert push towards privatization and the rise of charter schools. Here is what I would like you to understand. Parents of students with disabilities are tired of fighting for crumbs, even under the quote unquote generous budget of the last two years. This year, my autistic child went for over six months without occupational therapy because her school was short of providers. Here is the conundrum we face as parents. Do we make a stink? Time expired. Have an uproar. Thank you. I'll, you may I'll continue. Get continue. Thank you for that. Um, here's the conundrum we face as parents. Do we make a stink at the school level to get our child on the existing provider schedules, knowing that would mean another student equally deserving would go without? My child finally was put on the schedule, um, but she still owed makeup services, which were not able to be provided during the special education recovery after school as they, none were available, nor is it clear that they will really be provided this summer. Here is the meat of what I would like to say and what the current budget will mean for my autistic child's school, which is quote unquote lucky to be losing only $600,000. No staff for academic intervention services, reduced school aid hours, loss of a technology teacher or librarian, and loss of an ASD nest cluster teacher who provides support to autistic, excuse me, autistic students during recess, lunch, and specials, which are particularly stressful times for many students with autism. I'll skip to put a face on what losing an ASD cluster teacher would mean to those inside the nest program. Um, might not be understood outside it, but it is a crucial position and one that specifically affects my own child and our family. Um, I don't think it's possible for me to share my screen, but if I could, I would share a picture of Ms. Lakata, who is the nest cluster teacher who has been with my child for um, four years at this point. Uh, she, I nominated her and she was accepted as a teacher appreciation week for UFT on their website and social media. I nominated her because she has changed the life of my child and my entire family. I don't think you understand unless you have loved and parented someone with autism or another disability how much it means to have a school with staff who care about and connect with your child. Teachers, school aides, and related service providers are not fungible, replaceable cogs in a machine. They are individuals who know their school populations and have formed important bonds with all the children they work with. For all children, not just those with autism, those bonds are what keep them coming back to school, feeling safe in school, and belonging to a community. The last thing, truly last thing, I want to the City Council and Mayor Adams to understand New York City parents and families will not forget how you treat our children. We will remember and we will vote accordingly. Those with the power to do so fix this. Stand up for the children of the city. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Megan. Next up, we have Michelle Sai, followed by the next panel, Bella Sarugo, Daniel Robertson, Lauren Claven, and Catherine D. Zengotita. So Michelle, you're up. Starting time. Okay, we'll move on to the next panel. Bella Sarugo, you're up next. Starting time. myself okay there we go hi um is it is it uh, i can't see on my screen if the doe members are still present are they there's a representative here from the department of education and who might that be i can't see it on my screen and i'd like to know who's present when i say something it's mark traeger so the other DOE representatives decided to leave. And I think that's shameful. And I think their behavior is shameful. And I think it's shameful that they try to um, endear themselves by saying that they are parents earlier today. Because I'm sure they are not parents of kids in our in the New York public school system. And if they can sleep at night making this disgusting draconian budget that is, in a word, 
inhumane. Then they don't deserve their jobs. And I hope this committee really isn't just doing this for political effect and that they will really press to restore our budgets. In fact, I was starting to advocate for my school to have a bigger budget. My son goes to middle school in District 2 and it's been very troubled. It's a zoned uh, school, which means that it's unscreened. There is a, uh, there is a vast range of needs and socioeconomic students and racial diversity and that school has been underfunded and understaffed anyway and it wasn't until it came into the news that there was violence there and problems that they were able to get an extra counselor this year someone who's been wonderful for this school that counselor has been cut another social worker has been cut 13 staff members all together time cut. expired and it is not okay. The school cannot function this way. The school serves a diverse community and they have lost $3 million, 43% of their budget. I've been hearing much lower numbers and I really hope this committee understands that you're destroying families and children's lives by not advocating for them and changing this decision about this budget. There is money available. This has been, this has been obvious throughout these hearings. Thank you for 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 hearing us thank you for your testimony bella the next person is daniel robertson starting time okay we'll move on to lauren clavin lauren you're up starting time Good evening. Um, I appreciate knowing that Mark Traeger is in the room. I, I can't see who, if any, council members are still there. Mark, I wish you uh, still sat in that council. Um, my name is Lauren. I'm a parent in Queens and an organizer for equity and justice in our schools. And I want to explain what it's been like as an education advocate during this uniquely opaque budget cycle. Advocates have known for months for months that this budget was a disaster. We've tried to let our council members know that during the budget negotiation process, mostly being ignored. Uh, my own council member refused to meet with any of the parent leaders that, that tried. Um, I'm, I'm gonna be generous and not name names today. Um, I've personally sat in meetings with several council members um, during the, this uh, negotiation process and I've heard you promise to stand up for our youth. And yet, with the exception of Council Members O'Shea, Barron, Nurse, Aviles, Richardson, Jordan, and Caban, every single one of you voted to defund our public schools. That was a choice, and you need to take responsibility for that. Our hearts were collectively broken when we saw the photos of all of you smiling and celebrating passing this disaster of a budget two weeks early, apparently, it seems, before you had sufficient information to make an informed decision. We've rallied on the steps of Tweed, we've called our council members, and last night we attended the PEP, where we had to listen to the chancellor admit that these cuts were bad, that the fair student funding formula needs reform, but ultimately uh, he denied responsibility and passed the blame onto the city council. So today we sat in this hearing for hours listening to the council say, no, um, it's really the DOE who's responsible for this mess. So I just wanna tell you, as a parent, um, and parents, by the way, are voters. We don't care who you claim is at fault here. And frankly, it's not a great look for all of you to keep passing the buck or to Time say you didn't expired. know that these cuts were happening. So to those in the council who say they're genuinely surprised by these cuts and are actually telling the truth, well, welcome to the Department of Education under mayoral control. I wish you would have listened to us. I wish you would have shown some of this outrage and energy during the negotiation process. I hope you're listening today. I hope that you listened to the students that spent their precious afternoon here with you today, sharing their heartbreak and their rage. And I want you to know that it's not too late to reject this budget. You submitted incomplete work, 
but you have time to revise it and turn it in before our children and school staff suffer needlessly. Thank you. Thank you, Lauren. Next, we have Catherine D. Zangotita, followed by, we were supposed to have an in-person panel after that, and I know they're not here, but I will call their names in case they are on the Zoom. Betsy Tam Green, Dermot Myrie. And then we'll go back to Zoom. Ron Britt, uh, Shirley Aubin, I know, already testified. Cody Lindquist and Tanitra Partvit. So I'm gonna ask again, Catherine D. Zangotita. Starting time. Okay, I see nothing. So I will again call Betsy Tam Green. Starting time. Okay, we'll move to Dermot Myrie. Starting time. Okay, we'll go to Ron Britt. Ron. S starting time. Six, good afternoon. I am a public school parent of four, ages seven to 17. I'm an active PTA member, active Title I member, active SLT member. I'm a resident in Southeast Queens in School District 29, which is a predominantly black student population. And I'm a Southeast Queens public school graduate myself. Uh, my two oldest kids, high schoolers, go to school in Queens North, D26, Cardozo and Bayside, and one just graduated. Um, I just wanna lead off by talking directly to city council members uh, for the ones who remain and, uh, and just you know, say that you know, there comes a time when we have to take a position that's not safe, not political, not popular, uh, but we have to do what our conscience tells us is right. And so I implore you, um, our city council members, to do the right thing and hold the DOE accountable to properly fund our school budgets and not leave it as it is, uh, which strips millions in funding away from our public schools and our children when they obviously need it most. Uh, only a small handful of you voted not to pass the budget, um, citing the massive DOE cuts. Um, you may have been swayed or persuaded at that time that the cuts were solely due to enrollment declines or, uh, but, you know, as we know, that is severely flawed and many schools have already requested adjustments um, to DOE Central's register projection, which uh, many principals say are wrong and low. Uh, I'm in school district 29 in Southeast Queens where I live and, pardon me. And the school district is represented, uh, at least my district is represented by four council members, Selvina Brooks Powers, Natasha Williams, Lee and Gennaro, who all have schools um, in, in uh, District 29 schools in their city council district, uh, particularly Councilwoman Brooks Powers having a bulk. Um, some of the local public schools near me, uh, and near my home, they're devastated with significant and drastic cuts. Many of my neighborhood I'm schools- I'm expired. Uh, many of my neighborhood schools I'm wrapping up are, are facing budget cuts, um, not only compared to uh, 2022, but compared to pre-pandemic 2019, which was before the schools were even fully funded with fair student funding, um, and, and, and their budgets are even lower than that. Um, I'll leave you with one final thing, that the time is right to always do, to always do what is right. It's a quote from MLK. And lastly, um, for everyone that is still listening, um, please go vote. Um, you know, look up um, these candidates, look up uh, uh, the politician's stance on their voting record on educational matters and see if they align with yours and your families. And if they do align and work hard to get them, uh, keep them in office or get them in office. And if they don't align, then vote them out. So once again, please go cash a ballot for people that'll do the right thing for our children and not agree with the massive cuts to our public school budget. Thank you so much for this time. I really appreciate it. Thank you, Ron. Uh, I see Shirley Aubin on the list, but Shirley, you already testified, so I'm gonna skip over you. The next we have Cody Lindquist, followed by Tanitra Partvit, Partvit, and then the next panel will be uh, well, Mark Gonzalez, you're listed again, but you've already testified, so we're going to skip you. Tanisha Grant, Maria Villalobos, and Cherie Gibson. So, Cody Lindquist, are you, uh, are you there? I don't see you in the Zoom, so I'll call Tanitra Partavi. Tanitra. Do 
Again, I don't see you in the Zoom. Uh, so we'll go to the next panel. Tanisha Grant, Parents Supporting Parents, New York. Not seeing you, so I'll go to Maria Bia Lobos. Okay, I believe Maria is not in the Zoom, but Cherie Gibson, I believe, is in the Zoom. Cherie? Yes, I'm here. Start in time. Good evening, Chair Joseph, Chair Brewer and remaining members of the City Council. My name is Sheree Gibson. I'm a Queens parent leader, currently representing Title I parents and families at the school, citywide and state levels. <clears throat> In these roles, last fall, I resoundingly heard from building leaders across the city and the state how resourced their schools were, how many had never experienced having so much funding before or not being in a, def in a deficit at the start of the year, how relieved they were to not have to stress about how to make their budgets cover all their needs, having the funding they needed to bring children who were lagging or behind on level, having the funding they needed to support the healing of children traumatized by the impact of COVID. Naively, I thought they'd enjoyed this resourced feeling for two more years. Little did I know our new mayor and chancellor would ignore the moment and prioritize a rainy day cushion and the NYPD over our children. As an advocate member of the 2019 Fair Student Funding Task Force, our unpublished report and what we've been advocating for since then is a change to an outdated, convoluted, opaque formula that did not equitably fund schools or address the needs of some of our most vulnerable student population. Just two months ago, the advocates and the work we did were being dismissed once again as we asked the PEP, the Chancellor, and you, Chair Joseph, to stop allowing the formula to be used as the scapegoat reason why we cannot fully fund our schools fairly and equitably. Now, after you voted to approve the mayor's budget, which always had school budget cuts in it, you hear from principals, teachers, school staff, parents, and the students themselves that these cuts are real, deep, harmful, human and very, very unnecessary. The mayor campaigned on and started his new administration Time expired. promising to reduce the bloat by streamlining the DOE and assuring voters no cut would touch schools. I think you've heard enough that schools are being touched mightily hard. We understand the reality of lower enrollments, but there are so many avenues not explored that could mitigate impact or even solve for this. Many council members suggested several today. I have been trying to understand why my council members and you council members voted for this budget, being such staunch advocates for public education and our children. Based on what I've heard, you wanted to trust what the mayor and the DOO is telling you about enrollment numbers and the need for this cut. I will be confused, annoyed for you, as all the briefings, reports, breakdowns, and data they, they offer today is what you should have had before your vote. Maybe the outcome would be different. So I ask you now to take action by resolving that DOE should reinstate the cut funds and make adjustments to the budget. We have time. When it's about our kids, we always make time. I ask again on behalf of the advocates of the Fair Student Funding Task Force for the City Council to commit to launching and funding a staff independent commission to review the fair student funding formula and make specific recommendations for equitably funding our schools. I ask that you hold DOE to working on solutions to declining enrollment numbers besides cuts. Hold them accountable for putting resources behind marketing of schools, their successful programs, and public education. Parent leaders like me have been telling them that for a long time now and even offered to help them develop the strategy. How families experience New York City DOE as a system is key to improving the system. Help build back our trust by not letting these cuts stand. Thank you. Thank you, Cherie, for your testimony. I'm gonna read the names on the next two uh, Zoom panels, and um, I apologize in advance if I butcher your name. Giselle Hearn, 
Hazen Azad, Tracy Gray, Melissa Elaine Sanchez. The panel after that, Ellen McHugh, Lupe Hernandez, I believe testified in person, um, Samuel Avery Poole, Kaolan Madden, and Bliss Brayard. So we'll start with Giselle Hearn, if she's here. Starting time. Okay, move on to uh, Tazin Azad. Starting time. How about Tracy Gray? Starting time. And then we have Melissa Elaine Sanchez. Starting time. Okay, no one on that panel seems to be here. We appreciate your patience as we go through this list. Next up, I'm gonna read the next two panels. We have Ellen McHugh, Lupe Hernandez, Samuel Avery Poole, Kaolan Madden, Bliss Broyard. The panel after that is Melanie Flaum, Nilifar Mia, Jason Green, Stacy Cusino, and Ashley Barrios Rashid. Giselle, Giselle Hearn. Starting time. Okay, how about Tazen Azad? Okay, we'll move on to Tracy Gray. Melissa Elaine Sanchez. Okay, we'll move to the next panel. Ellen McHugh, you're not in the Zoom. Lupe Hernandez, you testified earlier in person. So how about Samuel Avery Poole? Starting time. Okay, I believe Kaolan, if I'm messing up your name, I apologize. Madden, you're up next. Starting uh, time. Uh, hello. Uh, I'm a parent of two children at a Title I public school in District 22 in Brooklyn. My oldest daughter is a special education student going into fourth grade, and my youngest will be starting pre-K. My daughter's Title I school is losing $1.5 million, about 15% of its budget. Beloved new teachers will have to be accessed. The progress they've made in shaping our school community will be lost. Our school celebrated dual logic, uh, language program, which the DOA is happy to point to as an example of language access and culturally responsive and sustaining education is being stripped of resources. Struggling low-income families in our community will be scrambling to find to fund school supplies that were once provided by the DOE. And it is clear that schools in our district are being pressured to ration special education services. I shouldn't have to worry that when I fight for the services my child needs, I might be taking away needed services from one of her classmates. Families shouldn't be out here fighting over the crumbs that you left us. If you thought public school was like the Hunger Games before, next year is gonna be even worse. The pandemic threw our city's institutions into crisis and showed us both how crucial sustained support and development of publication is, education is, and how inadequate our city's support for public schools has been. To pretend that reducing schools' budgets to the barest austerity levels is appropriate or necessary due to declining enrollment is hypocritical and disingenuous. To claim that slashing school budgets now is cushioning us because future budgets which will be worse is absurd, especially when billions of dollars of federal funding remain unspent and unaccounted for. Far from a corrective responding to under-enrollment, the current budget and funding formula are calculated to undermine NYC public schools. This is an attack on public schools. As schools struggle to meet students' and families' needs, more students will flee NYC public schools for charter schools. Time expired. Alternative. As the students who do not have alternatives will suffer. 
I'm disappointed that the city council voted to approve the mayor's budget, knowing the budget will result in these cuts to school funding. Thank you to the one council member who's here. And no one else. Mr. Madden, could you please say your name for the record for us? And actually, there are three council members here. Oh, well, thank you to those three and no one else. Keelan Madden. Thank you, Mr. Madden. Um, next, we have Bliss Brayard, followed by the last two panels, Melanie Flaum, Nil Nilifar Mia, Jason Green, Stacy Cusino, Ashley Barros Rashid, and then Koya Huggins already testified. So Melissa Keaton, and we'll try again with Carrie Farley. Is Bliss Broyard available? Okay, not seeing Bliss. Honestly, there's, um, we, please bear with us. Um, we're not seeing these people in the Zoom, but we do have to call them for the record. Melanie Flaum. Okay, Nilifar Mia. How about Jason Green? Stacy Cusino? Ashley Barros Rashid? Okay, the last two I have. Melissa Keaton, if you're there, please unmute. And Carrie Farley, you're the last person we have listed and we see you in the Zoom. Are you able to unmute at this time to testify? Carrie Farley. Okay, I don't know if she's not at her computer, but Carrie is not accepting the unmute request. So I am going to just ask if we have inadvertently missed anyone on the Zoom who wishes to testify, please use the raise hand function, which is at the bottom of the Zoom page. If you use that raise hand function, we will call on you. Okay, um, Melissa Keaton, Melissa Keaton, did, are you there? Are you able to unmute? I'm being told that Melissa Keaton is here in the Zoom. Yes. Okay. Hello, Melissa? Can you hear me? Yes, we hear you. Starting Go ahead. Time. Um, my daughter wanted to go first. Go ahead. Hello, my name is Melanie, and I'm nine years old. Today, I want to talk about the budget. When I found out a remote option is only for ninth graders, I felt left out. The schools are losing programs and teachers. I'm worried about going to school in person. I haven't been in school since 2020. Kids need help with their problems, so they need social workers and therapy. My school called ACS on my parents because I was doing work at home. I didn't feel happy when they were coming to my house. My parents were doing what was best to keep me safe. I have to take two trains to get to school, and that's a lot. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Can you repeat your name, or can you, Melissa, repeat her name on the record for us? My name is Melanie, and I'm nine years old, and I'm in the fourth grade. Thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> Melissa, are you going to testify? Yes. Um, so schools are already struggling and they will lose even more money. Although we don't have access to the data or the students leaving New York City schools, clearly less money and larger classes 
will therefore decrease resources and staff are most certainly a factor for parents making the decision to leave the public school system. Children are our future leaders and caregivers and we should be doing everything to invest in them. As council member Schulman said, our children only get one chance at a good education. Our children have suffered unmanageable trauma that very few people have been through. They are scared, afraid, and traumatized. It was fine for my daughter to be at home for a year and a half, and I work with her as practically an assistant teacher. Then suddenly the DOE, you know, said everyone back in the building. And as the CFO Oates said, they front loaded and maximized without a hybrid option and no support for students or families, but especially for those who are grieving were provided. Many members, council members today asked about the decline in enrollment and were these families reached out to. And I can attest that as one of those family members who has not returned to the school building, um, as a family member who has lost a family, who have lost my dad to COVID, we are still hesitant to return to the school. And with these budget cuts, what can we expect when we send our daughter back into these school buildings? Larger class sizes, lack of support, resources, it's, it's just it's just too much. It's too much. And I thank you all for still being here. Time expired. Advocating. Thank you. Thank you so much for your testimony. Again, if we have inadvertently missed anyone who wants to testify on the Zoom, please use the Zoom raise hand function now. Seeing none, that concludes the Zoom testimony. Chair Joseph, I'll turn to you. Thank you. Thank you, colleagues, for sticking it up with me, Councilmember Shaker, Councilmember Brewer. Um, thank you for all those who testified today, and we take it all into heart. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Traeger. Thank you, Mark. Hearing is adjourned.